Hello, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Welcome to sunny and warm Phoenix. <laughs> no, hot is more accurate, actually. <laughs> Um, thank you for your patience with last night. You know, that was a record. Never once have I not come down because of being sick. That is the first time, even in Andorra, when I had, Hello, I everybody. Was, I had like pneumonia type thing and I was coughing so hard that I pulled a, a, ripped a muscle in my side. The doctor taped me up and I was down there still coughing through it, but I managed to do it. So I just want, especially anybody that's new coming, I just want you to know it's not regular for me to not show up because I wasn't feeling well. So I, I don't like try to, you know, dance people around like that. It is regular, however, when guardian time happens, which is most of the time anymore. <laughs> So, you were probably informed last night that we have been told we are on what is called security clearance, which means 9 o'clock this morning I started to get the first graphs for this presentation. <laughs> right. So, we will be on evening schedule, which will run from 8 in the evening after your dinner, which is at 6.30, I guess they have the dinner arranged, until 2 in the morning, tonight and Sunday night. So I just want you to know that in advance so you can sleep in the day if you need to. This isn't something that I set personally or as sets. It's something that the beloveds in insist on, actually, because they can only give transmissions during certain periods of time. And they explained something else. They've explained before about what's called the magnetotail effect, where it's actually easier to bring frequency in when we're on the evening evening, uh, when, when we're in evening hours, when it is dark, because of the effect of the magnetotail in, you know, in the outer atmosphere, the, the stretch actually allows holes to be poked in the frequency fence net on the planet. They explained something else last night about it that um, I didn't even think of, which made perfect sense. They also said it weakens the net, which means psychotronic attacks that might be launched at large groups that, you know, from, from other forces um, are reduced in strength during the night hours. So they're considering the nighttime hours at this point a safety protocol. And for large gatherings, they said from now forth, they will always run that way for safety reasons, which we'll probably find out Sunday more why we need to use those safety protocols at this point. Um, so I just wanted to let you know what the schedule is doing. And uh, let me catch my breath for a second. <laughs> Hey, okay. So this this um, little gathering here this morning or afternoon or whatever it is, morning slash afternoon, is it's still morning? Yes. <laughs> okay. Is uh, is the orientation I was planning on giving last night when I just couldn't make it? Couldn't make it means, and I'm going to explain this just a little bit to you in case any of you have any of these symptoms because they are activations related, but a lot of times we'll get stronger effects because we're anchoring it first and we kind of serve as the buffer field so it doesn't hit group shield when activations are coming through. They're just activations that are taking place within the crystal spiral networks on the, on, in the grids right now. But they seem to be affecting from like the armpit level down to the hip bone level and all through the internal organs in that area, like stomach upset, intestinal upset. Even if you get, and, and you can, you know, you can tell the difference between this, this activation and just a regular upset tummy. If you get this weird sensation of the actual skin on the body hurts, where if, like, um, if your shirt rubs against your skin, it's actually so sensitive that that even hurts. So if, if you notice any symptoms like that, don't get scared. It will pass. And just be gentle with yourself. And if you have to lay down, do so, which is what I had to do most of last evening and this morning. Um, it is part of the activations. It's clearings involving uh, chakras two, three, and four primarily. And it's right on time because what we're going to be covering in this workshop, which is about, again, sacred sexuality, the next block, is we are going to be exploring more about the chakra system, about the auric field levels, and what that has to do with the kundalini energies, the sexual energies, the spiritual energies. And we're going to see a bit more about what distortions are presently held due to the genetic mutation and the atmospheric mutation, what distortions are held in the chakras, and how we can begin to release them. The information that was given in Denver, which was also <laughs> given on site, basically, I didn't know what I was teaching except what was on the list um, until we got there, uh, that prepared us for this next step. People who weren't at Denver, that's all right. Last night you began to get the, the early activations that go with it so you can pick up 
today where we you know where 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 we are going so whether you were at Denver or not that's all right in the Denver workshop we explored first of all the link of the creation sequence from the first particle down to light body structure down to the Rishite spiral and the chakra system so and then take, anchoring that down into what's called the Umshadi and we've heard that word before but in Denver we found out what precisely it referred to which is the Edonic seed atom and that is the the core structure of the Edonic body or the part of your own anatomy in light body that exists within what are called the Eden middle domains and that's where we're aiming as far as getting out of the outer domains when starfire occurs in this universal system we will be able to ride the starfire in to the Edens so we learned about the Umshadi Edonic seed atom and its location where it interfaces with our physical bodies here and sure enough it interfaces right in private parts and we did show a couple of explicit graphs I was blushing while I was making these graphs they're showing me the graphs I'm going, I've got to put these up on the board <laughs> <laughs> I know we're going to have to say anybody under 16 can't be there, you know, <laughs> you know, without permission of a parent. <laughs> uh, we're probably going to have a few more of those by the end of this weekend because it's important to be able to see. It, it, we can describe certain points that come out as certain verbally described areas of your anatomy. However, to see, to, to see the whole image of how they fit together is much clearer and you just get the idea. So if you see graphs, particularly if any but he's a little bit sensitive to kind of like sexual stuff. It is not pornographic. It is not meant to be. But it is meant to show you the natural spiritual connections into the physical body, into sexuality. It's the same connections through which babies are born. So it is very holy sexuality uh, in more ways than one. Um, <laughs> that slipped. <laughs> That, that one slipped. <laughs> Oops. You lived in England too long. I think so. <laughs> yeah. Oh, by the way, I did introduce myself in case anybody here is new. <laughs> I, I'm Ashana Dean, actually Asia, and they call everybody calls me Ash. So if you don't know me, that's who I am. <laughs> right. Anyway, back to holy parts and things. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm Yazel, right? The holy as. Yes. Yes. <laughs> anyway. Don't misunderstand. I'm just connecting whole with my introduction. Okay. Yeah, just to maintain yes. continuity. Yes. Yes. I know. I know one thing that came through in the Denver workshop sorry, sorry. in relation. In relation to the Um Shadi, was um, the the Christic office or orifice, <laughs> right? which is located down there between your legs. And we'll get into that anatomy again and take it another step further, where we begin to look at how could we we just looked at in Denver the beginnings of the personal anatomy in relation to that, not combining it with other persons or anything like that. We just explored your relationship to sexuality and to God's source. So it was like you, spirit, and sex, basically. This one is going to bring in a bit of what that means in relation to male and female and the combining of those energies. And we get to see a little bit more in depth about what is this thing that seems to run the planet basically a little bit too much. What are the distortions and why are they there? They cause conflicts between genders. They cause conflicts within people about genders. And there are a lot of different things. If we understand that we are carrying an energetic distortion within our chakra systems that is affecting the chemicals that are produced in the body structures, including the pheromones and how many of them, how much of them are there, when they cycle, all of those things. We can start to realize that it's not all our fault on the 3D level as far as men and women having the issues that they do revolving around sex. It is not that men are just like oversexed, you know, beings that, you know, will leap on anything that walks by and it's not that women are frigid or vice versa. There are all sorts of things happening in the body that is not natural because of the distortions in the DNA template and the chakra system and the light body structure. As we begin to first of all understand that anatomy, the light body structure and how it plugs in to the sexual reality, we can also start getting, getting a handle on our own sexual expression. First of all, we can let go of guilt filters. 
Just forget it. Whatever they taught you, wherever, when you were a kid, was probably so filled with guilt and paranoia about your own private parts that even if you got to the point where you rebelled and went in the opposite direction, there's still an imprint of guilt. If you were, say, raised very, very um, you know, strict in a, in a way that you know, sexuality is considered bad and evil and all those kind of things, if you have that program, you may have actually gone in the other way to try to balance it, where you went very sexual and actually moved a lot of your, your chakra energies into the sexual expression in, or in rebellion. But if you're rebelling against something, it is still controlling you. You are not directing it, it is controlling you. So whether you're in rebellion to whether you're having lots of sex because you were told you can't, or whether you're having no sex because you're told you're supposed to, because that's a, a female problem. Uh, it's not just females, but a lot of females get that one, where because society tells us it's our job to, you know, get married, have babies, and you know, our duty as wives is to be basically the available one for sexual release. And a lot of times, women end up feeling like um, they're just uh, prostitutes stuck with the same John when they're married. <laughs> yeah, not me. I'm lucky. He's very sweet. <laughs> Now, <laughs> and they don't even get paid, right? <laughs> Just room and board. <laughs> remember, remember the women. But I am the same John. <laughs> yes, you are. Remember the one about women finding sex through love and men finding love through sex? Yeah. Yeah, I'll go there if my brain, want, if my brain gets there. But if not, yours can. I'll just be the same time. Okay, you can be the same time. <laughs> Not, not all women feel that way, especially if they're married to somebody that's sensitive and kind and looks at them as a human being as a, at first, as opposed to being a piece of meat first. You know? But there are some old programs that we have been taught that a lot of times our parents and our grandparents just accepted as part of life, that if you were a woman, and this is very strong in certain fundamental Christian belief systems where, you know, it's kind of funny because Christians think that, you know, that it's very repressive um, what, what Islam expects of women. But they don't even look at what's happening. In, it's the same thing that has been happening in Christianity as well. We're taught, females are taught they're subservient to men. They're taught there are certain things that are their duties and that's it and they're not allowed to do other things. And sexuality has been so convoluted into control dogmas that have been come up since Atlantis, which includes all of the religions that have been twisted on this planet, that all of these things are, are actually directing our energy through our crystal body structure, through the teleosphere structures as errant programs that govern how the chakras function and govern how the chemicals will interact with each other as, as, as electricity and different types of before it gets to manifestation substances make that transition down into what we call atomic structure here and start to become chemical bonds and start to become substances that are identified in the body as chemicals. There are distortions that occur there. So some of the urges that we get are specifically distorted urges that are created from distorted chemicals that are created from distortions in the light body structure and DNA template before it even gets into the manifest form. What we're going to be working on with this particular workshop, and it's fun because it's like I'm glad somebody's talking about it because they didn't tell me. I'm, like, I'm finding out now too <laughs> because they all, all I knew was it was called Elemental Healing, Gender Benders, Shock Raz, and <laughs> Rochelet Reunion. And there was like a little blurb about it and that was out and most of you probably have that off the internet. That's all I knew too coming down here today. And I was this morning I was going, would you please give me an idea of what we're talking about? <laughs> Just a clue. And I started to get a couple of little graphs and it seems like it's on a roll now, which means I'll be in transmission after I leave here. But we are going to be looking at the distortions, first of all, of what's it, what it's supposed to look like, what the chakra system is supposed to be doing in relation to sexuality. And then we will see what the distortions are and how that is causing literal electromagnetic and chemical issues between male and female as far as combining, also between people and their own relationship to their sexuality. We'll also touch base again on what was, re what was released in, um, in Denver about the natural forms of sexual expression. There are basically three sexes, ire, mane, and manu, which means male, female, and androgynous. And there are four perfectly natural, holy sexual orientations, and that is heterosexual, homosexual, um, bisexual, and asexual.
Asexual means really, really not interested, right? Like just really not. And you can have combinations of all of those where you might be, say, a uh, heterosexual with uh, an asexual leaning. And if you happen to marry a heterosexual with um, a, uh, um, say, a, a strong mani energy, uh, a strong um, mani energy, um, working through their systems, you will end up with one person with a very low sex drive that's perfectly normal, and the other person with what appears to be comparatively a very high sex drive, which is perfectly normal for them. So it's not that one person is wrong. A lot of problems happen between couples, be they male and female, or male and male, or female and female, about the sexual issue, because people have different biorhythms and they have different core structures in relation to that framework of what natural codings for sexuality and polarity distribution are there. If people get together and they can recognize this, that just because, like, uh, say, let's, like, instead of just using the usual model, I'll reverse it, let's say you have a wife who has a very, very high sex drive, right? But you have a husband who has a very low sex drive, but the husband loves the wife very, very much and enjoys being with her that way when that urge is there for him. But the wife, because she expresses in a different way, feels almost like she's, she's not loved, like he really doesn't want her because she, he's not sending to her the same level of sexual energy that she's trying to send to him. And he may feel bombarded with it, like she just can't be satisfied. And that can be vice versa. Most often it is vice versa in your traditional model, as far as it's usually the male that ha is craving more sexuality and the female that is like, it's like 20, number 20 on the list of to-do, that kind of thing. <laughs> There are ways to heal these. First of all, understanding that you each have a right to have the orientation you do. And if it's severe, if it is a severe difference where you really have one person in a couple that really, really is more closer to asexual than, and really like you say sex drive and they kind of go, yeah, I've heard of those, you know? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do they have them for rent? You know, I mean, I'd love to have one, you know what I mean? Because those people end up usually having to accommodate, which can be okay if you're all right with that. You know, it's perfectly fine to say, well, you know, it's kind of neat that you have this biology that actually gets this, this drive thing that I just can't imagine what that feels like. But that's okay. I mean, hey, I'm game. I don't, you know, I'm going to put any hang-ups aside. It's not dirty or whatever. Because sometimes you'll actually feel like an asexual if you have a bunch of blocks, a bunch of mental body ideas that are actually affecting the, your emotional body and repressing you. If you were raised that sex is bad and it's wrong and it's disgusting and it's unholy and unspiritual, you're going to have a big set of resistance factors that will create chemical repression in the body of what might be a natural sex drive. So you might feel like you're an asexual and actually find out after you let that be okay, you might actually find out, oh, you know, really it was because I, I'm, if you look at what you feel about sexuality, someday we will do this probably in the Virginia Beach workshop where you might do a little questionnaire, just ask yourself questions about your ideas and your beliefs about sex. Where all, you don't tell them to us, but you would be able to really identify some of the issues that you didn't realize you were carrying. There's a big uh, angry woman thing that happens that comes out particularly in accommodating and passive women where there's a hidden angry woman in there that you don't even know is there. Oh, I found that one. It took me ages. I was just so, like, I was really kind and accommodating to everybody as far as like just in general in my life and sexuality. Well, I never thought about it, didn't feel anything toward it, but it was like an obligation thing that when you're in a relationship, you kind of like owe it to your, you know, all these programs I had, right? right? <laughs> didn't realize what they were doing where it totally repressed, where I'd almost, it, in my earlier days, especially when I first walked in, it'd be like having to grip my teeth and project onto the ceiling to deal with the act, right? There's a lot of people. Now that was a little bit worse than your average person because of the walk-in, the conscious walk-in, right? Just getting used to having this body in the first place, right? But a lot of people that have suffered abuse in childhood have that same reaction where it's like, you know, literally they learn to astral project because of the act of sex and having such a revulsion to it that they catapult themselves out of their body 
And when it's done, they come back in and try to pretend it wasn't there, right? In order to maintain relationships. Because in this society, it's very, very boxed in. Even in American society that is quite liberal compared to most places, we're still very boxed in as far as what is okay sexually. And if you want to have a family and you want to have even just a, a person to share your life with, there's all these unspoken expectations that go with it. And it's those unspoken expectations that often have everybody crash and burn, where everybody goes into a relationship hoping this is going to be the one and all sorts of stuff starts to happen. And it just falls apart. And the more that happens, the more you get negative filters about the whole process. And there, all of these things, if we can understand that these are symptoms of a greater problem, and the greater problem is actually the distortion in the sexual energies and the chemicals in our own bodies, and we can do something as individuals to, first of all, make peace with ourselves sexually. Because you, if you are not at peace with yourself sexually in your own sexual relationship with yourself, whatever it may be, be it a strong sex drive or no sex drive or anywhere in between, if you're not at peace with it, you're going to bring that not peace to whatever relationship you engage. And you can only bring to a relationship what you have right there. Any hopes and dreams of the perfect thing come back to what you can bring to it as well as what your partner can bring to it. So part of what we are doing and what the beloveds are teaching us to do is learn about what's called elemental command. And elemental command is a very large subject. It could be taught completely separate from sexuality as well, but sexuality is a very good place to begin teaching elemental command because what you are dealing with, with the sex drive and the sexual energy, is the elemental force. Elemental force is um, it, it's a, a large field of consciousness, even to the point where if you wanted to think of every hydrogen atom in the cosmos that exists, right? Let's say that even though they're separate from each other, and in different locations, space-time locations, what if every hydrogen atom in the whole universe was actually united in consciousness through an invisible framework, the unified field, and was actually an entity, an elemental, a conscious force with intelligence and, um, let's say, will or desire. Now, if you take a system such as a planetary system that has all sorts of elements on it, all sorts of molecules of things, and if you realize those molecules are like little members of a big family that is an entity that is conscious, there is an original plan within which, a Christic plan, within which those molecules were created, within which those elements were created. And if you have a planetary field like this one that has distortions that are caused from black hole technologies from the ancient past, where you have a tilted axis, of the, you know, the, the Earth's axis is tilted, that is not natural, it should be at the same axis of the solar axis, which it is not. The ecliptic is not a natural phenomena. When you have that, you have a distortion in the light body structure of the planet, which means you will have distortion also in the elemental consciousness fields associated with the planet. So, what we often experience as wacky drives in our bodies, where sometimes it's just that horny feeling where it just it builds and builds and builds and builds, gotta release it somewhere. Or that completely, I haven't had a sexual ripple ever feeling. Because you can have either extreme and anywhere in between. And it's, you, you, and, and you know, you can't, you need to, everybody needs to stop picking on each other for, well, you're frigid. Well, you're just like out of control. You know, you, you just lose all of that because everybody has the right to their own orientation and it is natural and everybody has a distortion in the natural also. Don't worry about each other's distortions. Worry about your own, okay? And the distortions are now, you may have a natural high sex drive, and that's okay. That's not necessarily a distortion. Now, if you all of a sudden find yourself can't resisting, you know, little boys under the age of four, uh, chances are you have some elemental issues happening, okay? And you do have the ability to take control of this instead of being controlled by it. All right. If you are in a relationship with somebody and you're committed and you're finding that theirs is much lower than yours and you'd like to be doing things a lot more often and that's not happening, um, you can choose. You, but it, you, you can choose what you will do. You can address the issue and, and respect the other's Christic space and say, "What can we do about this together?" And if you can't, you know, you might find the wife say, well, let's have an open marriage. You go do what you want and leave me alone. <laughs> I'll be glad to stay. I mean, sometimes that works. Sometimes that's okay. But what is not okay is to use it as an excuse to go and do anti-Christian things, which means 
sneaking behind people's back. Because if you are lying to a spouse that you've committed to because you don't want to hurt them, no, actually you don't want to hurt you, right? Because if they found out, they'd hit the roof and they'd leave you and possibly take half or all of your bank account with them. Now, it's not always about that. Sometimes you really genuinely don't want to hurt them. And sometimes you actually did let certain parts of your body lead you someplace and later you kind of go, oh, what did I do, right? Once in a while, it's all right to say, okay, I am never going to let myself do that again. And I won't say anything this time, but I do know that when we cross over, this will be, they will know, because they already do know on a spiritual level. Don't ever think you can cheat on someone and not have them actually know. Because if their 3D self doesn't know, <laughs> their spiritual self does. And the more in touch they get with their spiritual self, they will start to feel it, even if they can't put their finger on exactly what it was. Honesty is the best policy when you're having intimate relationships. If you're having a, a, a short one that you know you're just going out because you'd like to have some fun, because sexuality can be fun. Some people actually just like enjoy that and it can be nice. As long as the person you're going to share it with agrees with that and doesn't have another idea, it's okay if you go out and like, you know, uh, pick up a friend and do the stuff to keep your field protected that we'll talk about <laughs> through the workshop. Um, and they know that this is just, you know, a bit of fling for fun. Now, I would suggest not entangling yourself with things that involve marital contracts on other sides, because what you do is just entangle yourself in karma. And it, it, it influences you and will affect you and can drive you bananas. But sexuality itself is a holy expression. <laughs> it's, a, it's a sacred expression of source, you're, you're the part of you that is directly connected to source, the energies that are the kundalini energies that are the sexual energies are the same currents that we use in healing. They're the same currents our light bodies are made out of. They are the same parts of the cosmic, the, the holy cosmic universe. They are units of the consciousness of source. So sex isn't bad, but there's been a whole bunch of regulation put around sexuality for various reasons, sometimes for protection. Because in, since the times of Atlantis on this planet, there have, has been a progressive raiding of the biological races here, starting with the angelic human races in the creation of what were called the Leviathan Force with the tribes of Levi. And they, that was a point where there was a progressive attempt, a conscious attempt by extraterrestrials, fallen angelic extraterrestrials, to orchestrate a process called transposition of race identity, where they could actually inbreed so much of their own gene code, it would dilute the natural gene code of the angelic human. And that has, that has been done here, severely. It, it's very similar to what was done when, um, when during the, what are they called, the conquests? When, they ra when, the, when the Spanish raided... Um, yeah, yeah, the conquistadors. Yeah, and, and they went in with the Incas, and they literally, they, I don't believe there is a, a, a pure Inca line left. They are all, I forget what the name is, but they, they know themselves as a half breed race. Because one of the in, things that were done on purpose were to get the females pregnant and to, to dilute the natural line that was there and superimpose their line on it. So sexuality has been a tool of abuse on this planet for a very long time, particularly since the Atlantean dramas. We, our, our bodies here, are, are the products of, of those raids on what was originally our natural dream code. And there have been times where there were teachings that tried to, uh, on the good sense, tried to limit our expression with that. Like, there were certain things where, like, don't marry outside of this particular tribe. It, they weren't meant to be saying that tribe is bad, but they were attempts to try to bioregenerate back into its natural structure what, uh, you know, a gene code that was progressively getting diluted to the point where it would have become extinct as what it had originally been. But there were also times in those same type of tactics of, you know, don't, don't intermarry with that group or that group, where they were actually used for abusing purposes because there were certain groups that would actually enhance and help bioregenerate certain groups that were being controlled and if they did interbreed they'd start to get free from their controllers. So certain controls of sexuality have been part of our cultures for a very very long time. Some of it's been protective, some of it has been, most of it has been manipulative. And if we can realize that this is something that hits home very much with, it, with everyone, we all have a sex drive, either a zero or a million percent or anywhere in between. But 
but you do have energy running through your body and you do have chemical translation of that energy. If people try to tune out sexuality too much, it just gets moved to a different spot and it gets blocked. It creates energy blockages in the system. It can create bipolar imbalances in the brain chemicals if it's allowed to be repressed too often. It can also cause cancers in the body within the organs of uh, both male and female. Prostate cancer and um, uh, uh, cervical cancer are two examples of uh, conditions that can, there's also other things that can cause them, but they can arise from a severe repression of the sexual energies. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you haven't used them. It means you're repressing a natural expression of them. If you're, say, a guy that's just, you know, does not connect with the heart and just runs around and follows your organ everywhere. Um, <laughs> well, some guys do, you know, I've heard. I've not met one, but, you know. <laughs> that is another form of repression because you're repressing the natural circulation of energy through the highest chakras where you would start to bring in first in the second chakra, you'd bring in like emotional connection and then you might bring in like intellectual connection with chakra three in the mental body, then you might bring in a, a bigger connection through the astral field and work your way up the chakra system. Natural sexuality is supposed to engage the entire chakra system. We are sharing with each other through the chakra system, not just have all the other chakras tilted off center so they can't line up when you're together and only the bottom one can. Now we, we talked a little bit in Denver about this harvesting process that occurs and I will cover this again because I, I will kind of pick up where we left off in Denver and I will cover a bit of what this Um Shadi um, seed atom looks like that's connected to our private parts and we'll also go back over the concepts of the ta tachyon cycles and what a tachyon cycle is as far as key generation because the Um Shadi cycles it creates sparks which form kilons, which form keys, harmonic keys. And it are these harmonic keys, which are geleasic radiation quantums that have been harvested off human sexuality and not just human sexuality on this planet. Anything that engages in two gender sexuality has been harvested for raw radiation that is generated through the um, natural sparking of certain parts of the body, one of them being the Um Shadi seed atom. So we'll look at that again so we understand that when we are engaging sexuality, even when we are just engaging experience, experiencing sexual sensation in one body, our own body, we are experiencing the process directly of key generation. We talk about the 1728 Edan keys that you need to activate in the body in order to get through gates to get into the Edan middle domains. These are the same kind of keys. There are various keys. The sexual, um, the, the sexual spaces create what are called the Ruta keys and we're going to learn more about that and I'm looking forward to that because I don't know any more about that either but we will explore what what this key generation is about because sometimes what we find is attractions that take place through what science might tell us is the the pheromone interface we call them fairy moons right pheromone interface is actually the, the consciousness of your, your bio fields, your body consciousness itself, connected to your spiritual consciousness, has an impetus for growth. Now, if, say, you are on a path where you have certain key potentials, key manufacturing potentials, because of your specific encryption in your own bio fields, you will be attracted to someone who has a comparable set that you need next and they need next. So you'll actually find sometimes just temporary relationships. Temporary can be one night to like, you know, five years and then, you know, it's time to shift. We outgrow each other and there's just not that charge there anymore. That charge has to do, and sometimes it's negative and sometimes it's positive as far as um, purpose, but that charge that builds between people's fields has to do with their DNA templates and their light body structure and what is next in their own, what, what um, aparthi they are next activating in their own gene code structure. And they will actually, that creates chemical realities in the body that come out through the hormones and the pheromones and you will be drawn to, you, ha you feel a field charge with people who have something compatible to that. So the charge that you find 
between people has to do with compatibilities, even if they're just temporary, in the activation levels that you are taking place, that are taking place in each of your DNA. There are times when you can enhance each other's growth consciously by choosing to participate in sacred sexuality, consciously using the chakras to be able to build this. And it can be a very lovely experience. That most, most of those, are, when we get into the journeys and things that couples can share, will be in the Virginia Beach one. First, you need to know about couples and how that works and how to do certain things in your own body before you worry about um, Kama Sutra, et cetera. Right? <clears throat> Right? It's not going to be called Karma Sutra either. I wonder what they'll call it, because it probably is a name. <laughs> but we're going to, through this workshop, we're, we're going to be given information. And in what order, I'm not sure. I have to go up after this is over and go on to the graphs. And they're showing me graphs, and I don't know where they fit yet, which is always fun. But by tonight, I will have the first part of the presentation, and we will begin to explore these things. Because we'd like to take you from just understanding the innocence that Denver was about. And if you, haven't, if you weren't in Denver, I, I'd say suggest do you know when, when they're out I don't know if they're out yet they're just, they're just out okay it is worth getting them just to see where we started because I am not going to start on part of Kai one again and bring it all the way down through the creation structure I will highlight parts of that in this workshop so we can get on to this workshop not just give the other one over but it is worth filling in the blanks if, if you you know if you don't know exactly especially if you're kind of new to the work if you don't know certain things that I talk about here it's because they were covered in the Denver workshop but what I hope to do in, in this presentation, I'm sure the Beloveds have their own hopes too, their intentions. Their intentions are usually bigger than my little 3D intentions. My intentions are, I really just want to facilitate people getting the next bit of information that you know, might be what they need, and the Beloveds are much more aware of what people need than I am, so I don't even try to assume. But I know that if I were coming to a workshop about sacred sexuality, there are certain questions I would have. There are certain reasons why I would, my 3D self came. And I'm hoping that we can cover some of those things in a way that answer some of your questions or give you a, a bit of a base of strength in relation to your own sexual energies and also in relation to your relationships where if nothing else when you leave this workshop I hope that you you'll be in a space where you really give yourself a bit of time in your life to just stand back for a minute and think about your relationships that doesn't mean you're thinking about getting rid of them but it doesn't mean you're not thinking about getting rid of them think about the relationships you're in in relationship to the new information that you learned about what sexuality is, about what it means to honor yourself if you expect anyone else to honor you. Because a lot of people just feel such a hole inside. It might have been from parenthood. It might have been you know, lack of good parenting. It might have been because of karmic stuff from other lifetimes where they just seek love and they'll do anything to hold a relationship, just to, to be loved and honored. And when you are coming from a space like that, you are actually asking to be victimized. You are, you are victimizing yourself because you are actually denying yourself love. You need to get love vertically through your connection to source first. You need to look in the mirror and say, I love me. And maybe nobody ever did. Maybe I was brutalized as a child. Maybe I was told I was worthless and disgusting and whatever. But you know what? That was their opinion and consider the source. <laughs> Who the hell were they? Right? All right. They were parents. They tried. Right? Great. And maybe they were good sometimes and just bad once in a while, but boy, that really could destroy you for five years, you know? <laughs> yeah. Forgive your parents for whatever it is they did or didn't do. Forgive yourself for whatever it is you did or didn't do. And one of the things we need to learn to do if we're going to own our sexuality, become the director of our elemental force within our own bodies, is to, first of all, look in the mirror and say, whatever it is, the first thing is, I will love me, and I will treat me with respect. No less respect than I would treat anyone else, my child, my mother, the person I love. Because a lot of people will respect the heck out of the person they're attached to, right? Oh, they love them to bits, they'll do anything for them, you know, that kind of thing. But they don't even look at their own needs. If you ask some people, well, what do you want to do? You'll get a... Well, 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 Joe would really want me to do this, or, or my, my kids need me to do that. No, 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 that's not what he asked. What do you want to do? There are so many people, both male and female, who have not even taken time because they're so busy trying to make everybody else happy, because at the core of that is trying to be loved, right? Because they feel a hole inside, and they're not acknowledging the hole, so they're trying to get it outside. But just to say, what do I want? I'm allowed to ask. God's source wants me to ask, too, because I am a piece of God's source. 
When you deny yourself, you are denying a piece of God's source, a unit of the consciousness of God. When you deny another, you are doing the same as well. But most of us have had a program in these societies that we have been raised in where we are taught it is noble and honorable to serve everybody else, but it is not to serve yourself. Now, there's also a counter reaction to that. Some people get so sick of that where they just say, well, forget it. I'm just going to serve myself and do what I damn well please, and I'm going to stomp all over everybody in the process and not even think about it. That's not right either. There is a balance between giving, just like there is an outflow from source and then a backflow from manifestation that allows the next outflow from source to come. There is a natural balance of giving and receiving. But if you deny yourself, you are blocking that natural balance. So there's a whole set of relationship things that have been lost in translation here on this planet. There were times, the whole, the whole gender structures we've been given as far as what men are raised and it's almost like a subconscious program now to expect that women are supposed to be, um, they're erroneous. All right? They were programmed in order to dominate females because females carried certain codes that could actually free men from some of the codes that were, they were being manipulated through the fallen angelics from. So females were a dangerous force on this planet because they carried codes that could undo the harness in the male biology. And if you took a male and female together, they could free each other, and then they could birth children that were free. And that was a big threat. So if you're attached to any specific set of rules that guys are supposed to do and girls are supposed to do, you know, guys take out the garbage, girls do the dishes, da 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 whatever. <laughs> Let it go and realize first and foremost you are spiritual beings having a physical experience and when you take your masks and your costumes off those things don't apply anymore and they shouldn't apply here. If one person cooks better and likes to cook, let that one cook. <laughs> and you might actually eat because if I were cooking we'd eat about every four days. <laughs> Right, but if another person does laundry really well, and the other one could care less, right? other than having it clean, right? It's because I'm not very good at pushing buttons. Oh yeah, it's like over your head, right? Uh huh. Yeah, so I've heard. Yeah. <laughs> So there's these gender models that are really worth at this point in time and evolution throwing out the window because if you ever do get yourself through a stargate, you're going to have to throw them out anyway. Because <laughs> when you go to a Christian society, if we get through the gates to Eartha, which is the first stop for Starfire, you will find a Christian society structure and you, you will look like a diseased being <laughs> if you try, try to throw this kind of expectations on anybody there. You know, you will also be understood in a kind and gentle way as a diseased being that's healing. Right? If you happen to pop up in a space and you're naked and that freaks you out, right? Because sometimes, well, it depends. I mean, they say cottons will get through gates, but I think that was an Anunnaki thing. And honestly, I don't think they will either. Right? So it's a good time to get comfortable with your body now. Because if you happen to actually be taking it with you through gates this time when we get to Earth, we all might pop up naked. So get used to the idea now and don't worry about it, <laughs> right? It doesn't mean you can't get something to put on then, right? But just it should, it should be a non-issue, right? I remember one thing that was really bizarre when um, one, of, one of my children, when, when it was very small, um, my, my son, he was a very small little boy, you know, had, had him in a diaper. He was like, I think he was like six months old or something. And we were visiting um, this, friend, this friend of one of my family, and I had no idea they were like really fundamental or something, right? Well, they had a little kiddie pool out, right? And little girls, they had two little girls, and they were maybe six and seven. I mean, come on, six and seven, don't they even have dolls that at least let you know something's there that's different? Well. <laughs> I, the, the baby needed a diaper change, and I just kind of like took him over a little, you know, in a discreet, but aside from the pool. But the little girls happened to be right there. They, but they weren't even looking, right? The mother hit the roof. I'm being, I, I, I'm, it's pornographic. I'm, I'm, I'm corrupting her little girls. I'm just kind of, no, 
everyone. It's just a little baby. You know what I mean? It's a little baby body. What is your problem? You know, I feel bad for your little girls, especially when they get married and find out. That's going to be scary because they're not little anymore. <laughs> right? So you may, you may know families or your own family may have been like that about sexuality. I mean, I was certainly not raised in an openly sexual family. I mean, we, we hardly even liked hugged or kissed, fully clothed or anything, right? Very kind of like hands off. And once in a great while, my grandmother would like almost cringe and make sure nobody was looking, give me a hug and a little pat on the head, you know? And that was affection, right? But um, they, there, are, there are ideas that we hold that we have so many ideas bombarded at us at this point between your very conservative things that we have. What they're doing is taking sexual acts and completely severing them from their spiritual context. And you hear guys and girls groaning and humping and doing all sorts of noisy stuff and playing with plastics and all sorts of different things that you really don't need if you know how to use your energy systems. They are looking for a high, a rush, a charge that you will not ever find that way alone. But the porn industry makes lots and lots of money, right? It's all about money. It's all about exploiting people who don't know what to do with their own sexuality. And there is a release that you can share sexually with a partner when you're both educated properly in the fact that sexuality is always sacred and you can abuse that or you can work with it the proper way. But what the perversions that we see in our cultures of sexuality are coming from are actually an innocent, an innocent desire is being preyed on by certain industries and those who run them. The innocent desire is to experience a sense of chemical transcendence that the body is capable of holding, particularly when male and female, or sometimes female and female, or sometimes male and male, get together and combine their energy fields. But they are just doing the outside. They're going through the motions, abusing the heck out of physical parts sometimes. I mean, it's amazing these people can walk again when you look at some of the horrid stuff they do to each other. <laughs> they get a momentary bang, and then it's all over and they need the next rush. They need the next fix because it didn't take them where they want to go. What they're looking for is a freedom. What they're looking for is a healing. And they're not going to get it that way. And there's an innocent desire when you feel that. When people that like, you know, watch porn and that kind of stuff, it, it's, it's rousing something in them. They know there's a thing there. And they want to do something with it. But all they see is, okay, so that's how you do it. So you got to go find a girl or a guy that's willing to do that, you know, that kind of stuff. And then you try that, and then you find out that doesn't work. To the point where people are getting so nuts about it that they're standing on chairs masturbating and killing themselves just to get the rush. All right? This is like... <laughs> seriously. <laughs> it's on the news sometimes. It is. Hey, it's a, it's a sacred sex workshop. I'm not going to... I'm not going to tiptoe around it. made him blush. That's good news. It's like I watch the news, you know. <laughs> no, no, no. Like, you mean is you watch I don't the, watch the porn you, channel though. You watch the nudes, right? No. Yes. I don't watch the nudes. You don't just said that. No, I said I watch the news. Any W S any W S news, it's news. News. Anyway, I am not against, by the way, um, appreciating human bodies in when you see like say, paintings of nudes and stuff. There can be beautiful paintings of nudes. It's about what is actually happening. One of the things that I, I find where I, I, I really try to, anything that I could say, I hate that, I try to bring myself back and say, okay, calm down now. It's a little bit strong, isn't it? <laughs> when I see certain types of pornography, I just immediately, like, right? It's because, particularly like the, the stuff on TVs or videos and things, when you see what is happening in the biofields of these people, you have these poor guys and girls who couldn't make it as regular actresses and they wanted to like kind of, you know, be famous and that kind of stuff and like, you know, okay, they could enjoy sex and turn it on when they needed to. So they compromised themselves and said, I, I can't do any better. And they decided it was, you know, a way that they could make money. They engage in these pretend sexual hooplas where they're, you know, they, they learn how to moan, they learn how to make it look like they're really into it, to the point where they actually get numb, where it doesn't mean anything anymore anyway. I mean, you know, you do it, it's, you know, when it has no meaning and you do it too many times with no meaning, 
it, you really, really lose the ability to feel a meaning with it. But when you see what is happening in the astral field of these actors and actresses, is frightening sometimes. You will see things you never thought existed in the astral. You'll see everything from invasions of what look like bugs coming into the chakras and running through the bodies, yeah, to big collectives of things that look like, um, they kind of look like dinosaurs and humans stuck together. Yeah, they call them incubi and succubi. Yeah. There are all sorts of things that feed off of these situations. And it's not the people that get involved with pornography are bad. They're good meaning people. They're trying to find their way in life. They're trying to figure out what it means and it looked like an option, an alternative. Same thing with people that go into prostitution, be they male or female. You know, it's if somebody told them a long time ago that their sexuality was sacred and it was about them and God together and that it was okay to have orgasms, and orgasms could be fun, they should be ergasms. Er, with the higher light, right? <laughs> right? That it's natural and holy. But there's ways to do that right, and don't ever share it where it's not being respected. First you need to respect your own sexuality, and then you'll draw to you more people that will respect it as well. But people aren't taught that here. They're taught, it's the oldest profession in the world, you know, just like wing it out there for, for cash. Yeah, that, you, there will be a way, if people realized that there is a way, they might not be able to make as much money as fast, but what does it matter if you're doing what's right with your own biosystems? If you're online with your own direct connection to source, you can, you can say, I can respect the sacredness of my body and share it where it is being respected in a respectful way. And that doesn't mean I just have to use the missionary position with the lights off either, right? You can have a nice time with someone who is there spiritually with you as well. But to sell that, to, to feel that you, are so, you, you have nothing else to, to give, that you have to sell the most, the, the one, you could call it a possession, that is the one possession that's the closest thing between you and God is your body. To have to sell that because you feel so frightened and alone and desperate here is a very scary place to be. If people who have gone into that place realize they can make their connection to Source and Source will lead them to a better way. Source will lead you to divine right livelihood. You will lead yourself by getting out of your own way, by realizing Source wants you to have a way where you can walk with pride and dignity, where you can share sacred sexuality, but in beautiful ways, not where you feel you have to compromise it to pay the rent. And people who assist other people in that process, say if you have, because prostitution goes both ways, there's male and female prostitutes, and there are male and female Johns. I wouldn't say you're hurting directly someone by going and having those services, and if it is a conscious agreement between you, it's like you can mind your own business and say, okay, well you're choosing to do this, you might want to say, you know, you really don't have to, but be careful and say that. Doesn't mean I just I asked him I'm going to marry you, <laughs> right? It just means you could turn them on to a higher way of having their own sexuality, so they could find a link to source. But you still, when you assist in those industries, you are still contributing to the defamation of a sacred act, and no matter how harmless it may seem. And in basic 3D ways, it can be harmless. It doesn't change the fact that spiritually, you are still contrib contributing to the downfall of a sacred activity. And when you look around you on this planet, and you realize how that is, what was once, do you realize people used to prepare for a week before, before in the like early Atlantean days when it was still peaceful and things were running Christian, they'd prepare for a week. They'd prepare their bodies. They'd go through certain fastings. They would, you know, do the scented oil stuff. They would have their energy systems in perfect attunement before they would come together. And not just for procreation. Not just it was not just because it was time to make a baby, but it was time to make a beautiful energy gift to the planet. Because every time two fields come together, or even one goes off all by itself, it gives an energy gift, be it a good one or not, to the planetary fields and to the tribal shield, the entire group of people that you are connected to, your entire race. You are affecting them. What has happened here and what we look at as the defamation of a sacred act, where the spirituality has been taken out of it, where anything can attach itself to anybody's chakras and run through the system and be put into the earth. Our sexuality has been used to take over this planet and to feed the black hole system 
m mechanics enough. We have been harvested for our sexual energy. So it's time for some of us, if we're planning to go to systems where that just doesn't happen, we need to get our heads around what sacred sex really is. It isn't about abstinence, because sex is bad. It isn't about all sorts of things we've been told it's about. So by the end of this workshop, I hope we have a little bit more of just some personal stuff that you can say, hey, yeah, you know, <sighs> that feels better you know, than what I came in with, that the ideas I came in with. Just knowing that it is perfectly normal to be heterosexual, homosexual, bisexual, or asexual can be a huge relief to a lot of people. Who, there's a lot of people who are actually have the, um, the light body structure of what would be, say, a, a homosexual orientation, and that's fine. But they try for the first you know, 50 years of their life trying to be heterosexual because they can't deal with the stigma that they're going to be brutalized with if they actually honor their own orientation. Because our society brutalizes anybody that doesn't fit into the male-female gender combination. And there's a big reason that that was almost across the board on the planet. Because if you want to make babies, little soldier head counts, things you can body snatch and run around as your army when the time comes and you happen to be an ET force, you want men and women coming together to make babies that you can attach to and then inhabit. And that's what's been done here all along. And that's why so many religions teach that homosexuality is wrong and dirty. It's not that it's wrong and dirty. It's that you can't make babies directly that way. It's also the reason why birth control and abortion are looked at as horrible and sinful. Why? Because the head count's not coming. And if you're looking for energy units because you can't generate your own and you're an ET force trying to take over a planet, you will use whatever forms on that planet are capable of generating energy for you, stealing energy from source for you and you will steal it from them. That is, what's been, that is what's been going on here. In terms of the issues of things like abortions, there are rules that apply, rules of physics. It is not always the wrong thing, but it is once soul integration has occurred. There's a 33 to 56 day window after the conception before the soul can integrate. That means you are not creating a spiritual violation within that period if you happen to have an abortion after that period of time. It means you've created a violation of physics, basically. It means there will be karma in the sense not that God's going to be mad at you, but it means that another soul has downstepped into that pattern. You took the pattern away, that soul is now stuck in your biofield with you. It means you will have to birth it out somewhere, either this life or another. All right? So... There are rules that do apply spiritually and metaphysically to the issues of procreation and um, you know, abortion versus non-abortion. But you are not killing anything but conscious cells, not a new identity incoming, not a contract that has been fully done you know, where you are going to kill a soul by having an abortion within the 33 to 56 day window. You are not. What you are going to do is remove the vessel that a soul was considering coming in to. And sometimes that is holy because sometimes you are tricked or forced into relationships where you end up conceiving when you did not want to. And sometimes that was forced by certain ones who want to birth dark things through you in what you would call a human female, I mean a human fetus body. Not all babies start out holy. And this is one thing that will probably get me in a lot of trouble if that gets out. Some babies start out as the product of ET manipulation where they brought two gene codes together in order to create a third because they want to incarnate into and inhabit that gene code. Now, there are protection things. If that happens to be an indigo that that is done to, and it's always, they always try to trick indigos into those type of relationships, particularly when they first come into adolescence, because they have the most valuable code harvest and if you can get an indigo you know, girl pregnant with the codes that will allow, say, a dark avatar to come in from the other side, yeah, they scored a victory. However, there are certain groups of indigos that literally hang out and wait for that to happen because it's, it's so common that we indigos are set up that way that there will be, even if it wasn't planning on incarnating, where there's like a, 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 kind of like a SWAT team. Uh-oh, got a fetus over there. Indigo-coated fetus. Who wants to incarnate? All right, I'll do it. Right? And they will go. 
they will come in and, tr and intercept and do their best to protect the mother and to come in as an indigo soul to stop the other dark one from coming in and taking that body. Because the, the dark one doesn't care what it does to the mother and it'll birth out, sometimes it'll kill the mother during the birth, sometimes it won't. Sometimes the mother wishes it did because it'll terrorize it for the next 40 years, right? <laughs> Not all children that are born are as holy and pure as we would like to think. And that's one of the hardest things when we get into issues of procreation that we have to look at. Because then you kind of go, do I really want to look at my own kids? Oh my God. <laughs> right? I didn't do any of that consciously. Oh, I'm sure they're good. I love them to bits. The thing is, you can love a fallen one too. <laughs> you know, you can. There, there's lovable things in every being. And sometimes, it, it depends on how much fallen. Because sometimes, if you did end up with one that, let's say, got in, and the fallen soul got in, but the indigo came in after, so it's an overshadow, but it's not running the body, it's given that fallen one protection, and you can actually offer it a kind of host by being its parent and being there for it, where it can escape from those, the bigger collectives, who sent it in as kind of like a kamikaze to go after you know, coding, where it's still being manipulated. So it doesn't mean you don't love your children, but it does explain some of the wacky things that used to happen in the old days, when certain things were seen and they just drowned it on sight. I mean, you know, infanticide, there were reasons for it. That doesn't mean it's a good thing to do. No, and in this society, you've got to be nuts to even think about it. <laughs> Don't go there. Handle it on a spiritual level. But in the old days, where old wives' tales and things, a lot of that, where there were, there were still certain groups who could see. They could see the astral field. They knew when something came in that wasn't supposed to be there. They could look in an infant's eyes and see if it was a, a, like the Damien type like in the movie or if it was you know, a good or godly soul. So the old wives' tales and things that led to some really wacky behavior in the past, it doesn't justify the behavior because there are better ways to handle those things. You don't just go kill the baby. That's not good to do, right? But there are things. If you can tell that's a problem, you can start making soul contracts with your own strength in Christ to assist that child and that body to heal and to get that particular force out of it. You may find that a child has an accident and just goes. Sometimes what you, when parents lose a child, a child, even one that they love very much, it was because there was a body snatch attempt going on and the one that was supposed to be there just knew it was going to lose and knew if it did that the other one would really, really harm the parent. So they actually will shut the body down and leave or arrange for an accident. So there's all sorts of things when we start to understand our sexual energy that it leads to understanding not just sex and how to have fun, but it, it leads to understanding procreation, babies, um, all those controversial issues over what you do with babies, what you don't do with babies, are babies good or not babies good? You know, if I'm a woman, am I supposed to have a baby? Am I incomplete because I didn't? Well, only if somebody's trying to use you as a breeder. Right? So there's so many things that sex is attached to, and sex and spirit go hand in hand. So I hope by the end of this workshop, we can make some more peace with these things. We can realize that we can look at our children in a loving and different way, and if there has been field interference, it doesn't mean throw them out. <laughs> You know? Hell no. It means you realize, all right, this is what my job as parent is here. Aha. Uh -huh. That's why I went to metaphysical workshops, right? I had to learn how to do this stuff. Okay. And then you learn to do contracts with other guardian races that can assist from higher levels as well and with the child's natural own Christic level. So there's all sorts of things you can do and there's all sorts of healing. Another thing that you will find when you discover some of the secrets of sexuality, like in combined certain ways when the chakras and the light bodies combine in certain ways during sacred sex that's done consciously you can actually reach transcendent states together and if you reach those transcendent states you will get a first-hand experience of um, what happens when let's say if, it, if a body dies right if you left your body and it died or if you, if you took it with you you will f there is a certain space of clarity and and crispness and aliveness that you can you, you can enter. It's the beginning of the Saudi states. And you will realize that, that can be reached sexually, it can be reached by yourself sexually, it can be reached without sex, but you also realize something, that when a being dies, that is the first state they actually pass through. So you, all, you will get a feeling that if you've had you know, spouses or, or children who have died, that, you, that you, know, you just have this hole where you miss them because they are just obviously not here anymore. 
and you weren't done. You know, you have that, but we weren't done feeling, right? You can find this space, and sometimes sexuality will actually be the way that you actually first experience it, or sometimes it'll be a class that teaches you how to go into sati state, because you can do it either way. But you will realize there is a space where they are alive, and you will, if you put out a call, you can actually feel them, where they are, who they are now. So you don't need to call up the guy that like is on TV that he talks to dead people, right? <laughs> You watch this guy's field, it's a roar. <laughs> like a Grand Central Station, take a number. <laughs> you can do this yourself. You can contact your dead loved ones. It's the same energy, the sexual energy, the creative energy. Procreation is the same thing as procreating elsewhere, which is what happens in death, where you leave one space and go to another. So there's all sorts of things that are connected to the issue of sexuality. Sexuality is always sacred, but it's not always used that way when it's used in ignorance. And that's what is running rampant on this planet. When we learn between what we learn in this workshop and then what we learn in the final one, which ought to be really interesting from what they said there, that's where we learn how to do <laughs> cosmic journey to dare and share. Ooh. <laughs> We're looking forward to that text. We don't have those in yet. We really like to know what this is about. But that's the Virginia Beach one. So this one, we're going to learn to do a couple things. We're going to learn, as I was talking about, the things uh, r involving gender and involving the chakras a bit more and what the distortions are and how we're going to begin to heal the chakras, which will allow us, like the core of the chakras. We've worked with healing chakras before on certain levels, but we didn't have the availability to go to the core seals and the core encryptions in the program in the chakras. We have the ability to do that now with the combined um, frequencies of what are called the lights of aurora. Now that is something we introduced briefly in Shasta. We'll talk a little bit more Sunday probably about the lights of aurora and what energy field that is, where it is located. It is a link between the earth energies and the earth uh, energies, which we'll cover a little bit more if you don't know the difference between the two, if you happen to be new. And in running the aurora energies, we will be able to do what is called uh, Rashale Chakra Talia healing, which will be the, the Kathara 5 level, um, at the beginning of the Kathara 5 level frequencies that we are going to learn to run. It's an expedited healing program that because of the drama and what is taking place on this planet and in this, this universal Vecca, uh, we are being given again more information early. So we are going to see about healing the chakras and about how to run this energy. And I, I, I've gotten little, little, little clips of what this might be about, but I've seen the fingertip chakras go where you get the flame fingers happening. Yeah, there's little vortices that run in the tips of all of the fingers. But they haven't taught us to use those yet because our axiotonal lines, and like when you see the axiotonal lines in the body diagram in the Carthara One manual, they are as they're standing now, which means they are twisted. They're not supposed to be in that numerical order. Where I, I'm hoping by the end of this workshop we will find out what precisely is the numerical order that the axiotonal lines are supposed to be. And what we are going to do is begin the process using the Um Shadi, which has the power, the, the, the Um Shadi uh, Edonic Seed Adam has the power to bring in and link with the Aurora Force enough where we can straighten out the axiotonal lines that are running through the body. Then we'll have the availability of more of the healing currents, the ones that run through the fingertips more fully. And the ones that run, it, this will probably upgrade the entire, um, uh, the, the lotus points and all of that. It will create healings in part, parts of those that are distorted. We've been using parts that you could, it's almost like taking a, a, a detour because the main lines were messed up and the techniques we've been taught, even with the, the lotus touch and all of that, have been doing detours. All right, around trying to use what's available and get it back to combine the way it's supposed to. We're going to now go into the final level of healing, really, which is getting the chakras and the axiotonal and meridian systems back to where they're supposed to be in the bodies. And until that happens, the experience that everybody that's going you know, wacky with pornography and stuff, trying to get that high that there's a <clears throat> they're looking for, they know it's there, they can sense it's there. Ancient cellular memory knows it's there. You won't ever, ever find that until you have these systems in the body straightened out because then you can combine them in a way that will create transcendent space where it was, it was supposed to be natural to be able to move your consciousness up and down or in and out the dimensional spectrum, you know, to go into high consciousness and, you know, where you're not just focused down in here and then to come back again to share that with other people. So this is the beginning in the, the Rashale, um, uh Chakra Talia healing. We will begin the process of clearing the final level, which is the closest 
us to the surface level. We started with Cathara 1, which is way deep down in the Cathara centers, right? And finally, we're working our way back up to what will be, you know, we did the crystal body around us this way. We, we got all the things that had to be fixed first under, you know, where they're operating more closely to how they're supposed to be operating. And now it's time to go for the chakra system and the axiotonalize that run through the body and the vortices that move through not just the fingertips, but also through certain areas of your private parts. And when we get those things done, our bodies will be progressively enabled where they would be able to make the transit through a gate, either alone or with someone, where you could, even if you didn't want to go through a gate ever, you could still stay in your body here and learn how to share it in very in progressively higher and more fulfilling ways during sexual expression. Because there are ways where you can actually kind of like merge together and float up as a bubble and experience as a third entity that the two of you blended actually create. And that's an amazing space. And it, it, it's hard to hold in the body, but you can do that. And without being compromised, without like anybody taking on the other or anything. But if you try to enter those spaces without knowing how to run your system and without straightening out the chakras and what needs to be straightened out, you can indeed end up with somebody blending and like absorbing you and actually controlling you from the astral because they know, say, sex magic, dark sex magic. These techniques have been used for since ancient times to prey on people where they use sometimes people like you know do it in a pentagram on their basement floor you know that kind of thing and they actually prey on women and they're actually collecting them it's as if they're like little they're, they're souls that they stole and they stuck in little genie bottles that they can control as, as if some, some I've, I've met, I met a man once and he, it was funny he was in the UFO uh, movement thing and he was you know, had like films and fancy all sorts of stuff about UFOs and you know quite a name I won't name any names but he had on his his uh, basement floor me and a bunch of friends had come down because he was going to show us these videos of these ships that he actually had on video which he did and he takes us down to the basement area and there's this big pentagram on the floor and he goes, oh yeah, by the way, yeah, that, that, that's my sacred sex space, you know? <laughs> You're going like, <laughs> You're totally weirded out with this guy because you could just feel it. He had his girlfriend with him or like girlfriend number seven, whatever she was, but the girl just, I mean, literally walked around like a, like a drone. He just controlled her and it was completely through the astral and through the chakras. She probably had no idea what hit her. You know, she was just like, oh, he seems like a nice guy, <laughs> and got involved with him, and bang. She was literally having her whole biofields controlled by him, and she had no will at all. She was like completely, you know, you could pick up her arm, she was like this. You know, and if you said, walk across the room, she could get up and walk across the room. And it was freaky to see it that blatantly in motion. There are actually large covens and things of people who do this, and that doesn't necessarily mean it's associated with Wicca. There are other kinds of Illuminati covens that have nothing to do with Wicca. Some of them are satanic, that kind of stuff. They use sexual energy, and they use it to try to open portals, to combine it. They'll do orgies and things to actually try to combine the energy to get enough radiation thrust where they can blow open portals that they happen to know exist and those kind of things. So there are ways that the natural beautiful sexual energies that are in indigenous to the human form and to the planet have been really really abused and still are being, being abused on this planet. And when you learn that there there is a right way to engage this, that it's holy, it's fine, and there is a way that gets you into trouble, you can make intelligent decisions. So it's time to really, I believe, get just clear a lot of our teleospheres of old, um, twisted memory programs that go way back to Atlantis. They hold the stored memory of different karmic imprints we have from our 1728 or more incarnations in other space-time things. They will actually affect us too. Our energy systems are connected. So you may you know, be part of raids that took place where the Nibiruans came in and captured a whole bunch of females and dragged them off to Nibiru and forced them, you know, raped them and got them pregnant and forced them to be breeders until they breathe them to death. And so there's a lot of imprints that are behind the ones you have from this lifetime. As we work, now it could take us probably a million years to lift off each layer of those distortions. It might take you 500 just to get through the ones from your immediate lifetime, right? As far as sexual issues or ideas that are, you know, where I have a nasty bunch of energy around this and it feels terrible and it's affecting how, how free you can be or not with your natural Christian sexual energy. When we work with the, the Rashalai uh, Chakra Talia healing, 
this is going to blow through a lot of that really quickly. In other words, we don't have to go through each layer and like psychoanalyze each layer to death because there's not time to do it at this point. You know, we, once we get through Gates and get to Earth after Starfire on this planet, then we can like sit back and you know sort through the pieces of the mess that was there if we want to. But the healing technologies they're giving us now will allow us to clear these karmic layers because they're like filters. They're like um, layers of, of thick glass with twisted, distorted demon patterns all over them that direct the chemicals and the elementals in the body and create nasty feelings in the body and unnatural chemical reactions and attractions within the body. So we can, we're going to be given the beginnings of the technologies that will allow us to do telia healing directly, which is healing the programs that are held within the telia sphere of the crystal body. And that requires a lot of frequency to do that. So in this workshop, that's some of the things that we're going to be covering. What order? I have no idea. But <laughs> we will start at 8. I think I went over my hour, didn't I? Uh, not badly. No? Only 20 over. Oh, that's not bad. Only 20 minutes over. That's good. All right, because I was going to do just an hour. I was just going to do an hour orientation just basically to say hi, but I went on a roll. So that's good. Now we both have an idea of what we're going to be teaching later. Um, I'll let you go now because we're going to, uh, I have to go back up and do graphs and as has to go back up and do stuff and for tonight's presentation. So we will see you tonight. And again, it's going to be between 8 and 2 in the morning. I'm sorry that the hours are that, but at least you have warning now. So if you need to sleep, do it you know, when you have time in the daytime. And just realize, too, that, it, that I, I didn't realize it before, but they did point out specifically that the evening hours are the safest, particularly for large group activations, because the psychotronic ability of the net that surrounds Earth, that's in the atmosphere, that's run by the black hole technologies, is at its weakest during that period. So night times, that's why you might find yourself like awake at night and you can think clearer. Some people just get that naturally. That's because of the magnetic tail and the magneto tail of the around the Earth of its magnetosphere. So be glad for that. And I'm going to say uh, hello and goodbye for now until this evening. Do you have anything else you want to say? Bye. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Thanks, Julie. Uh, the first one, of course, everybody knows the song of Lyra. So with that, we're going to build a blanket of Christos frequency all around us on our Maharic shield. That's the first step. Then we're going to do the Song of Orion, which the Song of Orion is activating the monad and activating all our hova body bodies. So that would be the, the second step. Then when we do the magic songs, uh, that means that we, uh, we bring down all the primal currents into our DNA template, and we're naming ourselves as all divine parts. So remember the, the magic songs, what they are? So... We're going to do that, yeah. yeah. With the Mani, Yuri, Manu, and Sarah. Then we're going to do the Rishi invocation, which is, of course, the invocation of you, the uh, 13, 14, and 15 uh, ball of light self. And after that, uh, I was, the se sacred, uh, secret song is actually the Ramaha, the Ramaha sequence. And the Ramaha sequence is, is very interesting because you're connecting the Ra, which is D14, with the Ma, which is D12. So you're actually connecting your Maharata, your Krista self, to your Rishi. So this is like another level. Like we're going, you know, even higher and deeper into uh, the passageway. Then after that, uh, the, the 14 is, of course, it's a golden polaric current, right? D14. And after that, it's just underneath would be the the Christos level. And uh, uh, then we're going to do the tribal shield. Uh, so that will activate the fire letters. And when you activate your fire letters, that help your DNA strands to breed. And uh, uh, radial body, then when you breed your, your strands, you merge your radial body. And you cannot ascend if you don't merge your radial body. Okay, so that's like the, the other step. Then we do the high Vicar codes because the high Vicar codes, as we all know, are the keys to unlock all the uh, locks between all the, the densities and between the dimensions. So we need to unlock those doors with the uh, high vector codes. After that, we'll claim ourselves with the Umsha, Umsha, Umshadai, which is actually claiming ourselves as the first, uh, uh, first cause of light, first pillar. How do you say that? The first, yeah, help me somebody. The first, the, the, First cause pillar of light. Thank you. I always get that wrong. The first cause pillar of light. So we do the Imshadai. Uh, I just do it three times. 
And after that, we did a song of Kamala Hati because that's open the doorway. We're opening the doorway, <laughs> literally. And we finished with the song of Rama because we want to really, uh, you know, empower and open the Rama passage because the Rama passage is probably what uh, is going to take us to the last step, which is, you know, nowadays Eartha and could be different <laughs> in the near future. <laughs> but for now, that's what it is. So are we okay with all this? Do we understand what we're doing? All right, great. So um, I, will, I don't have all the, 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 the lyrics, but we probably know most of them, but I, I do have most of them, so we'll, um, we'll change them. Okay. So who I wants to? Here. Yeah. Um, there's just, I just need to be near the, sli the slides, so let's see. <laughs> because I'm going to change them. Shall I put the song of Lara, or everybody knows it? Is, are you okay with the song of Lara? Yeah. Lara, Lara? Okay. Shall we go? All right, one, two, three. Maharata Kumbai Vectus. In evoca uniblium by vecti. Maha by vecti unore un amor. He say unte satra shahera. But I tell you, ma. Ashalom ta esha in ta doe. Om shalayure akum tan akum tan. Om shalayure akum tan akum tan. Om shalayure akum tan. Everybody knows it, but just in case, we need people up here. Okay, we're going to do it uh, once or three times, do you think? Three times? Three, three, three times. times. Three times. Okay. <laughs> We have a large room. Anybody wants to get up and move with the flow, please do so. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> okay, the magic songs. Here in Shara Dike Sheta Amira Panachi, Manu Ekreda Kuki, Mahayana Treyari, Maneka Ihakura, Haramaya Manaki, Uma Etreina Ekasha. Ire shara di keshe ta amira pranachi manu ekreda kuki ma ayana treya ri mane ka ihahura haramaya manaki uma etre ina e ekasha Ire shara di keshe ta amira pranachi manu ekreda kuki ma ayana treya ri Mane ka ihahura haramaya manaki uma etre ina e yekasha 
Ire shara di kesheta amira prana chit manu e kreda kuki ma ayana treya ri mane ka iha hura hara maya mana ki uma etre ina e kasha. Ire shara di kesheta amira prana chit manu e kreda kuki ma ayana treya ri mane ka iha hura hara maya mana ki. Uma etre ina e e kasha. Ire shara di kesheta amira prana chi. Manu e kreda kuki ma ayana treya ri. Mane ka i hakura hara maya mana ki. Uma etre ina e e kasha. Ire shara di kesheta amira prana chi. Manu e kreda kuki ma ayana treya ri. Mane ka i hakura hara maya mana ki uma etre ina e e kasha. Ire shara di kesheta amira prana chi manu e kreda kuki ma ayana treya ri. Mane ka i hakura hara maya mana ki uma etre ina e e kasha. Ire shara di kesheta amira prana chi. Manu e kreda kuki ma ayana treya ri. Mane ka i hakura hara maya mana ki uma etre ina e e kasha. Ire shara di kesheta amira prana chi. Manu e kreda kuki ma ayana treya ri. Mane ka i hakura hara maya mana ki. Uma etre ina e e kasha. Ire shara di kesheta amira prana chi. Manu e kreda kuki ma ayana treya ri. Mane ka i hakura hara maya mana ki. Uma etre ina e e kasha. Ire shara di kesheta amira prana chi. Manu e kreda kuki ma ayana treya ri. Mane ka i hakura hara maya mana ki.
inhale clockwise. Exhale counterclockwise. Sorry, counterclockwise. Exhale counterclockwise. Let's practice that. Counterclockwise in, clockwise out. Counterclockwise in, clockwise out. Really heat up with that. Let's do twelve. Oh, she's got <laughs> We're sharing. Maharata Mueva Kirashe Hasha Kusha Deza Dabrueja Raeka Uma etreina e ekasha Maharata mueva kirashe hasha Kusha de zada druesha ra eka Uma etreina e ekasha Maharata mueva kirashe hasha Kusha de zada bruesha ra eka Uma etreina e ekasha Maharata mueva kirashe hasha Kusha de zada bruesha ra eka Uma etreina e ekasha Maharata Mueva Kirashe Hasha Kusha de Zada Brueja Ra Eka Uma Etreina E Kasha And now we'll do the other one. <clears throat> Maharata Mueva Kirashe Hasha Kusha de Zada Brueja Ra Eka Maetreina e ekasha Maharata mueva kirashe hasha Kusha de zada brueja ra eka Umaetreina e ekasha Maharata mueva kirashe hasha Kusha de zada brueja ra eka Uma etreina e ekasha Maharata mueva kirashe hasha Kusha de zada brueja ra eka Uma etreina e ekasha Maharata Mueva Kirashe Hasha Kusha de Zada Brueja Ra Eka Uma Etreina E Ekasha Maharata Mueva Kirashe Hasha Kusha de Zada Brueja Ra Eka
Okay, we can dance to this. What's to dance? <clears throat> Once was a night of a faraway dream. Once was a night when the candle fires burned. Once was a night when the nightingale sing. Once on this night worlds were born. Once on a day when the sun shone its brightest. Once on a day when the breezes rose high. Once on a day when the rivers flowed with sorrow. Once on this day worlds were gone. But today in this moment in the heat of the fire burns a long aching dream of life returned from the pyre. Oh, come near. New life reborn. Come, come, rise from the waters. Come, come, rise from the sea. Reach forth, heart of the lion ringing out from the ancient lands of destiny. Once were a people's pure and of innocence. Once were a people's loving and free. Once were a people's alive with eternal light. Once were a people's the higher lay in victory. Once came a wind, dark and cold, from the lowly places. Once came a spawn of the dark fallen sun. Once when the rays of the demons spread suffering, once stricken the higher lay were done. But today, in this moment, in the warmth of the sun, Rise the long hidden peoples of the golden silver one. Oh, come near, higher lay reborn. Come, come, rise from the dreamlands. Come, come, rise from memory. Reach forth, children of El higher lay. Camelot awaits thee where the golden portals call. Now in a dream all the worlds that had gone away. Now in a dream walking forth to the dawn. Here in this dream reaching forth to the universe and call to the port of our home. Come, come, open the doorways. Come, come, let us be free. Here now, we give of our love to thee, the homeland so long for, oh, sacred Kamalohati.
What are we doing? Mm -hmm. Yes. Like three times. What are we covered? Oh, Shadi, everybody can remember to spin their plates. Amplify. <laughs> oh. One, two, three. Will I do three times? <clears throat> there are places you can go. Where the dreams you'll one day know are free. Starlit beaches in the night, heavens meet in silent harmony. How communion is soon to come, a reunion that's just begun, and one day soon you'll find we are together in a place called Umshadi, an eternal radiant state of mind. Will you meet us in this place called Umshadi? Yes, we will. Not far from here, a step in time. From our place on heaven's shore, we stand before the shrouded door and think of you. Just across the veil plain, the starborn dance in mono rain, they laugh and smile. But the cloak you wear reflects the light and leaves you in an endless night. Yet one day soon you'll find you are free and living in a place called Umshadi 
an eternal place between the veils of time. The other end is so flame of the state of Umshadi. It's not far from here a step in time. Not far from here a step in time. It's not far from here a step in time. Mine. There are places you can go where the dreams you'll one day know are free. Start the beaches in the night, heavens meet in silent harmony. Our communion is soon to come. A reunion that's just begun, and one day soon you'll find we're together in a place called Um Shadi, an eternal, radiant state of mind. Will you meet us in this place called Um Shadi? Not far from here, a step in time. From our place on heaven's shore, we stand before the shrouded door and think of you. Just across the veil plain, the starborn dance in Monterey, they laugh and smile. But the cloak you wear reflects the light and leads you in an endless night. Yet one day soon you'll find you are free and living in a place called Um Shadi. An eternal place between the veils of time. The other radiant soul flame of the state of Um Shadi. Not far from here, a step in mind. Not far from here, a step in time. Not far from here, a step in mind. Third time. <laughs> And a little more rhythmic. <coughs> With feeling. Yeah. There, there are places you can go where the dreams you'll one day know are free. Starlit beaches in the night, heavens meet in silent harmony. Our communion is soon to come, a reunion that's just begun, and one day soon you'll find. We're together in a place called Um Shadi, an eternal radiant state of mind. Will you meet us in this place called Um Shadi? Yes, we will. Yes, we will. <laughs> Far from here, we're stepping time. From our place on heaven's shore, we stand before the shrouded door and think of you. Just across the veil of pain, the star who dance in Monterey, they laugh and smile. But the cloak you wear reflects the light and leads you in an endless night. But one day soon you'll find we're free and living in a place called Um Shadi. An eternal place between the veils of time. The underrated soul flame of the sect of Um Shadi. It's not far from here a step in time. Not far from here a step in time. Not far from here a step in
Interesting times, eh? Okay. The um the Hatter technical representative will be we with us shortly. <laughs> Mark one, anyway. Um Mark II has been uh, resisting something, to be honest. Uh, I referred last evening, I think, to um, events of Tuesday and Wednesday and just getting a ton of stuff that the Hatters felt might be helpful if one of us spoke about. So here I am. <laughs> and Bill, not unfairly, said, I expected you to be spat in a year ago. Where have you been? <laughs> well... <laughs> It's a bit of a story of a, a grid or an ARC-12 issue, but anyway, um, I'm not laying it off on that. Um, I suppose if you're in my position, you probably feel a natural reticence to come and let it happen uh, without graphs, without the kind of technical depth and detail that Ashana is contracted to present. Whether I ever do that or not, I don't know. If I don't, and you don't like what I say, you won't come anymore, will you? <laughs> as long as she talks in between, it'll be all right. Oi, I'm trying to get hold of the end of this, actually, don't worry. I've just gotten down. Um, yeah, um, I, really, I know where I want to begin anyway. Um, I want to pick it up at a point that uh, Shanna was talking on and around, uh, from my perspective anyway, um, about how you actualize the process. Okay, there's, oh, yeah. Uh, sorry, I forgot. There's a real-time window opening tonight, so Sunday is today and Saturday is tomorrow. All right? And my palms were burning like fury, and that's why I actually accepted and came down to talk to you about these things, because I can tell. When it starts to burn like this, I mean, the, it's just the, the electricity is just going crazy. So, anyway, so that tonight there's going to be a big healing thing go down, because there's a real window, a very special window, apparently, which is going to facilitate something important that we all need to share in this context. So, when I uh, shared with my friend that I'd been resisting the inclination to come down for two hours, and she said, what do you want to talk to them about? What are the hassles giving you? And I said, da 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 um, She said, well, funnily enough, they've just been telling me this about Sunday being today and Saturday being tomorrow, and this is what we have to deal with. Well, she, she and they know that um, I will attempt to address possibly the most personal issues of self-expression, of being, um, in a general way. And one of the reasons why I resisted this is because it's very personal. In other words, I can't convey my respect other than to radiate it at you, towards you, because you are unique. And anything I say cannot possibly embrace your uniqueness. All I can do is to share in the most rounded way the things that the beloveds want to point out. So, where they want us to begin is to pick up the point about individual, what was referred to as individual need in the moment. Now, what that really means if we have time, which Ishana didn't in context, to expand that idea a little bit. As a true indigo, as a, as a being striving to resume the mantle of the Christic way, you actually have preferences. You don't indulge in need. Because needs are likely to foster failure. And failure fosters the inclination to blame anybody but the self. Now, all we're doing right now, this is, this is easy. You know, we're just actually, we're, we're, we're crabbing towards or around the notion of self-responsibility, aren't we? The first time I really said anything at all, I think, was on a Bermuda cruise when I did a bad job of introducing the witness quiz. And one of the questions I asked at the time, knowing the answer, if, you, if the people were willing to be honest, was how many people in the room were willing to say, I knowingly make choices that are not as good as the choices I could make. And I was so pleased when seven-tenths of the people in the room put their hands up and actually said, I know I make inferior choices compared with those that I might. Now, if we run a technique with you tonight that offers the potential for healing, 
and potential and preferences are similar in their nature, you would um, uh, share in a technique and since we are occupying human bodies that have been influenced by the um, processes of cell integration bringing approximately one-third of what we call ourselves into the, the physical body the other two-thirds come from the parents the mother and the father in approximate ratio we would ne necessarily leave with patterns that still influence the way we identify with ourselves, the way we construct circumstances for ourselves, the way that we lie to ourselves, the way we don't look at ourselves in an honest and loving way. So what, a part of what Ashana was getting at, and the Hatters through her, was that it's very easy to say, well, look, um, you've got to love yourself before you can love anybody else. That's not a novel remark. Or, in other teachings, open your heart and be a doormat if you want. The Indigo family have a rather more difficult and more challenging process to complete. And progress towards whatever individual completion may be when completion is realized is dependent on the awareness that a person holds, carries, maintains, and reminds the self of as often as possible. Okay? How, how shall I put this? I'm, I'm, I'm not off the subject of sex. I mean, it's on my mind all the time. <laughs> I'm getting there. Right? Because what I'm trying to do, what I'm trying to do is to point some things out to you in which you can think about it a lot more often and do it a lot more often in ways that appeal to you in a very happy, very free, very guilt-free fashion. But what I'm really leading to say is, how do you fix some of this stuff? How do you go and embrace the technique? How do you accelerate it? How do you bring it on? How do you get yourself there? You have to go and meet it. Everything about your relationship with each other, with source, everything, is reaching out, is being willing to take a step forward, right? Everything that we've been taught since we were kids, in one form or another, tends to, from birth, tends to have a baby cry because it's hungry. It immediately introduces a conditional relationship. The baby knows, knows to make a bloody noise in order to get fed. Grown-ups make a bloody noise to get a bank loan, to get laid, to get a new car, to impose their will on another, to shove their opinion at other people's nostrils when it's not required. And the pattern just runs, doesn't it? We don't have to talk about breastfeeding and the relationship with, I mean, I'm sure a lot, of, a lot more mothers in America after the war must have breastfed their, their sons. The fixation with breast size in America is unbelievable. <laughs> it's unbelievable. I mean, how many guys have bummed themselves out because they wouldn't be happy if they weren't getting laid with a girl who had nymphs, <laughs> right? Whereas in point of fact, if they allowed themselves to indulge a little bit of field resonance once they know that it exists, because we weren't taught that by mums or dads. I'll come to girls in a minute, don't worry. <laughs> I said two. Right? I mean, you, just, you, you don't need a hatter to tell you this, really, and you don't need me either. <laughs> But the thing is that we wander around with all this stuff going on, like, right? So I'm not happy because the projection I'm making on my world isn't coming back to me according to some imprint I'm carrying in my field, right? She's got to be blonde. He's going to be dark and curly, right? She's got to be this much. He's got to be that much. Where is it coming from? Where is it coming from? Now, there's another point. I refer to the net, I refer to the way that frequencies are being run into the gene sets, which trigger continuously reinforcement of those patterns. So you've got to recognize the fact that that is going on all the time. All right? I mean, okay, so it's running through the grids. What? There is stuff running through the grids all the time, continuously, endlessly, through the media, through the electrical circuits in your homes. Right? 
you have to recognize that you've got a bloody fight on your hands all the time. And the more conscious you can be of the, the, the fact that those are the circumstances in which you're living, the better job you'll do. Now, if we want to draw it a little bit further towards relationships now and that, that thing, the sex business. All right. So we have, through, in our innocence, we've accumulated at start, at day one, begun to accumulate a whole bunch of notions about what we need. And naturally enough, we experience a life largely, but not entirely, depending on your individual circumstance, a life of failure to satisfy need. We have these patterns that say we need to hang out with certain kinds of people. And in hanging out with certain kinds of people, we implicitly expect them to guess what it is we think we need. Don't we make it easy for them, even if they may not be the right people? We don't have the self-confidence, the self-relationship, the willingness to function honestly to tell ourselves what we think we need while we bumble about finding out what we really do need. And we're not, because the environment doesn't support it, encouraged to be honest about it in case we are rejected for that. Is that the behavior of a maturing Azerite? No, obviously, it's a rhetorical question. So since we are so privileged, to receive some of the instruction, the information that we are doing and will do on this matter. One of the things that makes me feel rather sad is because you are, in a sense, an elite and privileged group which is confined, almost imprisoned, to express and explore these ideas amongst your own kind. Because only your own kind really understand, only your own kind has an inkling of what it might take to find the dust in the corners of their own rooms, to have the courage to be honest with themselves, and in that courage, decide, I am okay, just as I am. And I'm okay because I understand every day I'm teaching myself how to be more of an indigo, how to be more effective, how to be more conscious, how to be more aware, how to handle disappointment, how to handle engaging in a world, in a system which is dominated by the very stuff I wish I'd never ever heard of, and I can't figure out why I volunteered to come here in the first place. <laughs> but here I am. Here we are. Now, I'm acknowledging in passing the difficulty of carrying through some of the things that the Hato want me to, to touch on or to, to talk a little bit about. And that is the limited potential that we have under present circumstances to go and explore each other. Now when I say explore each other, I'm not alluding in some kind of tongue-in-cheek English way to the um, sexual relationship. What I'm really talking about is how we're moving towards a place of omni-sex or omni-love, right? in the same way that I could acknowledge openly to any guy in this room now truthfully, as distinct from 10 years ago, I could look any of the guys in this room and say, I love you, and mean it. Now, if the circumstance moved me, if the field resonance was of a, a kind that suggested it, and if my circumstances were such that it was free to do so, I could happily explore the ways of growing with another if it was a male. My circumstances don't permit that, and certain contracts and agreements that I carry don't permit it either. However, it doesn't mean that I can't say that genuinely and sincerely. I can say the same thing in an asexual way about any woman in this room. I couldn't have said that 10 years ago. Sorry, I couldn't have said that 30 years ago, because my orientation was just crazy. Um, well, yes, I mean, I understand about what objectification means. I don't take the mickey out of guys who need to be with a girl with long blonde hair or you know, certain bodily aspects without understanding what I'm saying. I mean, the best way of talking about anything is to experience it yourself. And I was a person that was like that. You know? I know it didn't occur to me that the particular body form uh, of a female that was shaped differently might actually be an ideal form for me to explore that would assist me to grow in certain ways I didn't recognize. Now, the reason for talking about patterns, as we were doing a little earlier, is that these things tend, not, tend to seem to be innocuous. You know, what is wrong in appreciating um, a thing of beauty, another being who is shaped in a certain way? There's nothing wrong with that. 
But what is wrong with that is if you don't recognize that there is an attachment within yourself that limits your own growth. And that that, that, that particular appreciation may, may assume forms of behavioral expression that are holding you in a place that you don't need to be. And that's the point. But you see, whilst ever we, um, what should we say? Whilst ever we fail to remember, and whilst ever we're a little sloppy in the way that we go about looking after our own development, goodness knows we spend enough hours mm. <laughs> waiting. We spend enough hard-earned dollars getting what we've looked for for a long time. And what on earth are we doing when we don't actually try to pay a little bit more attention about how, how we apply the things that we are discovering on a private and internal basis. We don't really need to spend as much time chatting away with each other on e-groups when in fact, in my personal opinion, you spend a lot better time just with quiet reflection for a half an hour considering aspects of your life plan. Has it ever occurred to you that you've encountered people in your life that had a plan for their life and they consume a half of their life and they think, shit, I chose the wrong plan. <laughs> what do I do now? And there are those people who make you absolutely want to puke. They never had a plan at all and everything just worked out fine. <laughs> you know, it drives you nuts, doesn't it? And be careful because there are those people that didn't really have a plan and didn't like plans and didn't like people who wanted you to have plans who, thank goodness, came in with sufficient coding to recognize that there was a thing called source, didn't know where it lived, didn't know what it sounded like, didn't really know what it felt like, but followed it nevertheless. I am that man because I'm called a lucky person. And as I share these kinds of ideas and thoughts and times with you, I can't tell you how grateful I am for the fact that that would be a word I wouldn't resent, but it, when I was in my 20s, I probably would have done. However, so then, we get around to some of the issues that uh, invariably limit our experience. And the unfortunate thing, as I've said, is that we have to, we are forced necessarily because of the environment we occupy to recognize that the things that we're striving for here, and that is actually personal growth whether that is expressed sexually or whether it's just by association, whether it's through mental stimulation, whether it's learning to overcome some emotional difficulty that's been a bit of a pain in the butt and you find someone who's particularly insightful, kind and caring, and they'll help you through it. We are very interdependent, regrettably. However, we're all in relationship with each other and that is the key fundamental and common component. We might think we need to have a relationship with someone in the group, but if it isn't happening, it isn't happening. And that means you find the maturity within yourself. You find the little lesson that you need to observe and understand that is preventing that process from beginning. If you have the, uh, sorry, I just need to be careful about, about the words that I'm choosing. I'm trying to keep out the language I would normally use. I'm trying to not mm, to be too pr prone to that. Um, Oh gosh, where are we? Um, yes, there, there, are, there are opportunities all the time when we're together. There are opportunities to explore being more of ourselves. We should, sorry, we could if we allow it, Regard these gatherings, and I know that people do, so I'm not, I'm not patronizing you, please I'm, I don't think I am, but to allow a little more of what we reflect on. The things about ourselves that we're, that we're living with, saying we're happy, I'm willing to be not good at this, not good at that, not good at that. But that isn't natural, it's a temporary way. It's a temporary way of getting the brain and the patterns out of your own face. You trick it. Because what you're really doing is you're saying, I am fine, I can love myself, and I can be aware of things around me, about myself, that are maintaining forms of limitation in my experience as a little spark, as a returning flame, 
I'm willing to recognize that, and I'm willing to trust the people who share my experience with me to treat me in like kind. Now, I can't have two conversations at the same time. One, I want to go with the, the part about if they don't, what do you do? <laughs> and the other is about what you do if they do. Regardless of which of the two directions that we might head in, it would be foolish for us not to remember that our being together in the way that we are is about growing. The reason for a man co-joining with a woman in a physical way, or a woman with a woman, or a man with a man, is about growing. Is about beginning to understand by creating new circumstances, expanded circumstances, which imply the things that we've been talking about. About liking oneself enough to get on with your life in a constructive and positive way, being honest enough to recognize the things that you need to pay a little time looking at, having the courage to share them with someone whose love you trust, and utilizing that as a creative mechanism. Now, if you can get that far, by the time you get to taking your clothes off, you should be pretty feeling pretty confident that the platform that the beings, the two beings share, contains more clarity, more commitment, more purpose, and more optimism than any other platform you could conceive of. And if you stop and think about that, you have decided to create that on your own. Because it wouldn't happen if you didn't. The other person might, but if some of the things we've been talking about, about the other person, uh, were not declared to you, i.e. if they weren't sure, if they couldn't trust you, if they couldn't reveal an aspect, a tendency, an inclination that they have, which is a momentary pattern, but it gets them going, it gets the, the frequency building, well, what are you going to say? Well, I'm sorry, uh, take a vacation, deal with your pattern, because I'm not prepared to work with you on that basis, and come back when you're done. Meantime, if I meet somebody else who I like a bit more than you, well, tough. Yeah. These things happen in the other kind of world. But the thing is, that if we were working with each other to facilitate, we surely must attempt to understand what is actually going on. It's one thing to talk about stuff in our shields. It's all right when we're talking about a blooming miasm or some such, because nobody really knows what it's called, nobody knows where it came from, nobody knows what it's doing, you know? I mean, maybe the guy's got to walk around with a martini and high heels for half an hour, and everything's going to start to happen. Right? Well, so what? So what? I mean, are you such a small being that you can't still see the essence in the person and think, oh golly, you know? Um, I wonder if, you know, we talked about it a little bit in a loving kind, kind of way, non-challenging, non-threatening, da da way. And we talked about, you know, maybe trying to develop an understanding in which we move ourselves into a place where the intensity that we create by, say, for example, um, exploring a meditative circumstance before we engage, by perhaps doing some of the things that uh, Shanna spoke of, and by golly, we'd love to have the time to be able to do it too, because we remember how it was, and that is preparing for a week. And in that week, there are things that you do. Now, I just used the guy with the martini in heels just to get into that area, but there are lots and lots and lots of other areas. People are accused uh, often um, of, a, of, a, of a lack of spontaneity. It's something that you see crop up in the environment really quite a lot. <laughs> There's all kinds of spontaneity available of an entirely different kind when you prepare for a Christic expression, a climax in other words, when you create and ball and hold and breathe energy into the combined field with your awareness. Now, um, I'm not saying it can't happen spontaneously, but if you're interested in really building frequency with your partner, you will tend that like the, the most delicate flower you've ever encountered. And so, if it were appropriate, and it would necessarily be, since 
one can do it with oneself through celebration and meditation and those forms. If you're doing it with another person, it's altogether better to consider the span of time that one's occupied in, to consider the circumstances that either or the other or both have been moving through. If a person has been clearing an awful lot, it wouldn't be appropriate for a guy to say to his female partner or his male partner, um, well, I'm really feeling strong for this and the other person's been clearing like fun. I mean, the, the, the object here is to maintain this trust and this communication and not to be playing with need, to be playing with preference and opportunity all the time. And that's the way when we start to work with each other in a new way, what, whichever form of coupling that we use. Um, and these things lead to uh, a celebration of a kind that um, certain, uh, I suppose, practitioners of certain meditative arts in their own way may have done. But given the kinds of techniques and the methods that we're actually applying, and given the kind of healing that, um, that we're being introduced to now, I would venture to say, without criticizing anybody else, that the potentials that are available to us are considerably greater. It remains to be seen just exactly how these things can be applied, because at the moment, both Ashana and I are having to live with a rather nebulous... It, it, it is and it isn't. Um, I, I tend to be more curious about the ways in which we can direct the energetic product of any form of uh, kundalini pumping, because we're really talking fundamentally about um, a mechanism which does that very thing. And um, you heard her remark, and she took it as far as our awareness goes, really. And that is that forms of kundalini pumping under certain circumstances have been used to open portals. I mean, been, the methods have been used to do very much more than that. Um, the thing is that what we know most about happens to be uh, what has been negative in its characteristic as opposed to what is positive in its characteristic. And there's too, too large a gap for my liking between where we are, the kinds of principles that we're beginning to explore, the healing that is required in order for us to follow them through, and the application of that understanding. And the gap exists between where, certainly where I'm standing and Procyone memory where whilst the Procyones could actually indulge themselves in what would correspond to direct physical contact in their own form, in their own way, um, they were though a race that were capable of manifesting another being without, without doing that. It's just that they got awfully excited about some of the other manifestation powers and started to play with themselves in ways which in the end were pretty unfortunate. But um, there are there that that is in other words that's to say that there is a form of creative expression, right? Of co-creative expression in a in a more meaningful way, that we are really just dancing around the edges of, and at the moment it's a frustration because it's something that you want to say, hey, uh, do this, then then you'll be able to play with this, but if you remember the way the guardians work, that would not be characteristic of them, so. Um, the, the message here is that if one were to be enabled to play with this energy from a Christic perspective, here we have another context, another combination of reasons why one needs to pay attention to one's level of conscious readiness. It is the same message that we've spoken of sometimes before about the idea of stepping through a gate and what would happen when you got on the other side, if you got on the other side. It isn't a criticism, it's an observation about our state of development that, and in our private discussions, I've been very happy to volunteer, that I, ex I would expect to, at the present point in time, I would expect to be held in quarantine for some period of time, so that other and advanced levels of healing would be affected. I mean, if it happened now, this moment, I fully expect that's where I would be. I'm not projecting myself into that space, but I'm humble enough to recognize that <clears throat> my personal fields and shields are not nearly as clear 
as would be necessary to take my place in an Ayanic, let alone a Hatur, collective. Okay? So the reason why the Hatur have, 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 have been kicking my butt a little bit this week is really to bring um, a point up that a point that has been made before um, in this particular context and that is that is a, a point or it's a word of encouragement rather than a point it's an encouragement that says you, you will be given techniques the extent to which you'll enjoy the benefit of the techniques will always always be determined by the extent to which you reach and embrace them with your conscious awareness if you want to improve your relationship with other people then it is necessary, surely, to allow the awareness that you already have to be brought into your own step-down version of what the teachings you are being given mean. It worries me that the, the range and the depth and the speed of this material tends to remain largely in a technical environment. And that's, no way is that a criticism. But what it doesn't do is it doesn't as, 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 I, as I have been encouraged to think, a good teacher begins from the, the, the as it were, the common denominator that is shared by the majority of the, of the people who want to, to understand what is being talked about. And that means drawing that into an area which you could call it almost your own experience, I mean a vicarious sort of experience, the beginning of an idea, germs of an idea which an individual person can take away from a situation and say, okay, I have my ideas how this needs to be applied to me in this moment and how I can utilize the insights provided in order to move myself into a new place. And that's what the message is here, that you're getting a reminder coming on a, on a basic 3D kind of what does this mean to me, what are the kind of issues I need to be reminded about, what are the kind of things I need to be thinking about and, and be aware of, how will I try to take this, the benefit of the Denver Technique and the ones that are yet to come this weekend, how can I begin to bring them into my manifest reality? And it isn't my business, but it would be a bit disappointing if most of us didn't leave this gathering this weekend thinking, how, what am I going to change? What do I need to adjust? What do I need to add more of? And what, what can I better live with a little less of? And how can I create space for myself, within myself, and in the relationships I value with my peers, my friends, my colleagues, my lover, whatever? How can I actually start to implement some of this stuff? And if, at the first time of trying, nothing seems to work, will any of my old patterns kick in? And if they do, what will I do? If I suggest what I think is a wonderful idea, and say, darling, let's spend two weeks preparing to make love in a way like we've never done before. And she goes, what are you talking about? <laughs> what are you talking about? We're behind with the mortgage. Our son's just been thrown in jail. <laughs> I've got a recurrence of whatever, whatever, whatever. And you go, oh, okay. <laughs> So, it's going to happen. <laughs> what are you going to do? Are you going to say, well, I've chosen to be in this space with this person. I truly want to continue to be in this space with this person. I truly and genuinely feel deep affection, or what is otherwise called 3D love. And love is a euphemism for drop your knickers, isn't it? <laughs> well, it is. I'm just speaking the truth. All right. So you go, yeah, I want to be here. I really love this person. And moving to a point that is close to the end now of where we began. If you put your needs up front, and if you say these are my needs, pal or lady, you're not really loving anybody very well, and you're certainly not loving yourself. Because what are you doing? You're limiting your own expression by introducing conditions and therefore, by definition, you're limiting another person's potential to love in return. So, hmm, tricky business, huh? 
So, if you decide that you need to be here, you want to be here, you're fundamentally aware of the fact that you're growing even through adversity because someone isn't cooperating with your need or with your great idea. <laughs> Don't we need to take a look at what's going on? Don't we need to take the elementals that are occupying part of our fields that have to have it now? Or the ones that could at the same time be inclined to work with it if everything seems congruent. Either way, you've got to decide who's talking to you, who's running your show, who's, who's pushing your buttons, and how you're going to negotiate a settlement on the inside. Right? How am I going to love this? How am I going to deal with this? Right? It's asking you to find new ways of speaking, new ways of expression, new ways of showing love, isn't it? Now, I'm not going to go into the place where people take this home. <laughs> Don't try this one at home. Um, especially if you happen to be partnered with, with a non-indigo person. It could be a bit tricky. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff I'm just going to totally avoid. <laughs> which has to do with how you... I will talk privately with anyone who wants to discuss a personal situation, but I'm not going to talk publicly about what people should and shouldn't be thinking about doing if they find themselves in a situation in which they feel trapped with a non-indigo thinking person. First mistake, who's trapped what and who's trapped whom and who's allowed themselves to be trapped anyway? Can you trap a Christic being? It's like trying to catch a butterfly without a net, really. You know, it's not really possible unless somehow in some curious way it's allowed. So, you know, there's all that sort of thing, and this is not the appropriate time to be talking about it. So, you see, uh, to return to the point, if many of you leave, it will be disappointing if the material that Ash is presenting and the things I'm trying to get at don't have you want to play a little bit in a new or a different way with who you think you are with the plan that you did make that didn't work out, or the plan that you never made but you wish you did, right? To try a little bit, no matter what age you are, and I'm older than most of you, I'm still willing to play with the world even though I think it's a pigsty. <laughs> <laughs> we won't harp on it, but... Um, Cleaning out other people's body hair from the bottom of a shower in order to get a crust in, on, on the plate is not my idea of fun. But there are even ways of looking at that and thinking, what a jerk. How did you, bring, how did you pull that one off? Okay, let's move. You know, let's, let's get our butt out of here. It doesn't really matter. I mean, unless you're being threatened with some, with some really seriously unpleasant and, and situation that I wouldn't joke about. By and large, by and large. By and large, we have done a disappointing job prior to the point that we started rubbing shoulders with each other. We had courage, we had determination, and above all, we had the spark of knowing that led us finally to make this connection with each other. Now we're here. Well, now we're here, the fun should start because we've got people to play with. We've got people to explore ideas with, to experiment with. And it doesn't mean to say that we should all sh sh should rush off back and take our clothes off and jump on each other. No, 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 no. No. I don't see why it isn't possible. And I know that a number of you have noticed it as the, as the shield has come together faster and it's strengthened. Uh, people who have been around the work for, particularly for mm, between two and four years, I know are, are sensitive to that. And what they're doing is they're getting a rush. I, mean, I know that you talk about it, some of you talk about it. You're getting a rush. You're getting a jump in frequency, right? Well, if you do some of the other things we're talking about and crank up your Kundalini mechanism, it's no, not fundamentally different from getting the rush of stepping into the group shield, right? Now, can't you consider that you're making love to the rest of the group? just by being in the shield? Well, can't you? Because we're loving each other, we don't have to be doing it. <laughs> Do we? 
I mean, this is just the beginning of the possibility of doing it with somebody in the room. You never know. You might get lucky. <laughs> what do you say, Ash? Sorry? Okay. Um, so, really, there we are. I'm, I'm feeling that... Um, hmm. What? Hang on a minute. I need a drink. Oh, I'm missing. Okay, all right. Well, yes. Um, my first instinct was correct, which was, um, I've bullied and berated you for long enough. <laughs> They've got the message, is what the message was. And... <laughs> And the message also went on to say, in a loving way, because they, they can be so funny and they crack me up no end, um, when I'm here in straight anyway. But basically, I'm being encouraged to think that where we've reached is perfect for where Ash is going to go when she comes. <laughs> no, 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 don't. Okay? So, this is a pregnant pause. What? It's a pregnant pause, I'm sorry. So, <laughs> there we are. I mean, it's gone now. It's it. Finished. <laughs> I'm unplugged, man. Yeah, it's over. I'm just normal, you know. Well, as ever, as ever will be. As normal as ever will be. Right, so that's it. Um, uh, I'm going, going off to... Um, um, I'm going to get comfortable. Mm. And... Um, I hope. And um, that's it. I done. So just talk quietly, you know, explore each other. Um. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I know what. Turn to the person next to you, in any direction, as long as you don't, you're not rude to anybody. Just do it now in the best way you can manage. Just turn to anybody sitting next to you. You're sitting next to friends. Okay, turn and look at the person behind you. Ah, right, try, try and get it sorted out. Right. Okay, all right. Um, uh, please, I don't want to see garments flying over the back. Find another person who you don't know, please. Stand up, move around, find a person you don't know, please. Find anybody but someone you don't know at all well. Anyone? Okay. Calm down. Calm down. Calm down. Hands in pockets. <laughs> you gotta do it. Come and stand up and do it with me. You don't know me very well. Do you know each other? Do you? Right. Come on, get somebody. Alrighty. Are you ready? This is just a little exercise in foreplay. Or oh, depending on where you're coming from, it could be five play, I'm not sure. Is the, Jim, is the camera still on? Okay. I won't tell a Benny Hill joke. <laughs> or one from Max Wall. Now, I presume that as best as you can manage, you're standing with someone that you don't know at all well, or very much, right? Okay. Now just stand and look into the person's eyes in front of you. And just stand for a moment. Quiet, please. Calm down. Calm down. Hello? Um, look, this is... I know that some of you are feeling terribly self-conscious because someone you don't know is looking at you and into your eyes. All right? Now, please, just calm down. If you want to get something out of it, just please stand and look into the eyes of the person in front of you. 
and just hold their gaze just for a few moments. Decide who's going to speak to the other one first. Just one of you decide who's going to go first. I know it's a tough decision, guys. It takes a long time to make your mind up about who's going first. <laughs> who's going to come last? That's a perennial problem that we all experience. <laughs> now then, are you ready? Calm down, calm down. Are you ready? Okay, now. From an indigo, heartfelt position, and with your eyes focused on the other, say, this is copyright Arnold Payton, I knew it, by the way. <laughs> the positive qualities I see in you, say it out loud, go on. <laughs> that you reflect to me. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Enthusiasm. <laughs> Enthusiasm. Enthusiasm, tolerance, optimism, and deep affection. And what was the other Deep thing? affection. Okay, now let the other people have a go. Now the other people, the people that haven't spoken, try and hold a gaze. Just allow a little bit of an interaction with a stranger, as it were. And the other person says that hasn't spoken yet, the positive things I see in you, which you reflect to me, are, and say what comes into your head. Beauty, spark, energy, high frequency, and you. Bless you. Okay. Thank you. I hope the, uh, the acknowledgement was heard. That was not an original thought. Copyright Arnold Patent. <laughs> Death taxes and other illusions. And you can have it all, author. <laughs> if you need a little break, take 10 minutes now because she'll be going like a train when she comes down. Actually, inverted my whole program. What I thought I was going to teach first, I end up teaching last. And what I thought was the grand finale shows up first because an activation is coming in that we have to catch. And then whatever is like, what was that about? Especially for people that are new, you'll find out tomorrow after we get to go through what was supposed to be today's program. That's what's happened. Uh, with all the other detail of things that are happening, sometimes it's easy to forget some of the things we learned a long time ago. Like today, I believe, is the fourth Hethalon, which is the magnetic peak. Now, the magnetic peak is when the magnetic Merkabas and spirals and things reach their fastest spin speed counterclockwise, which is the direction of current and the direction of the crystal spiral that goes back to source, back from the outer domains to the edons in the middle to the inner domains to the core domains. So they wanted us to catch the peak of the magnetic peak, and that's why we are here at this hour, and we're going to go through a brief period to get us to the point where we understand a certain thing about the, you know those sexy graphs <laughs> that we started in Denver? Well, we're gonna start with those, and I was planning to like move people into it gently, right? <laughs> Especially if you weren't at Denver and if you're new to the work, I don't want to like, yeah. <laughs> shock factor. But what I've been working on since I last spoke with you are the other ones that go with the sex diagram series because what we are going to do with the activation of the peak of the magnetic peak is begin the process of literally doing uh, what we would call the chakra or the chakras blowing literally the distortion out of the entire chakra system through the core crystal seals through the umshadi idanic seed atom that has begun the process of activating. So what I'm going to do, and for the new people, 
bear with us. I'll show you enough where at least when we get to those diagrams, there are a few in front of them, not like 100 like there was in Denver, but there's a few. All right, they will get you to at least where you see where basic parts connect with each other. Yeah, we got light body. Yeah, we got cosmic structure. Yeah, we got uh, uh, Ruchete spiral. And yeah, we got planetary environmental distortions. And yes, we have private parts. What are they doing, right? All right, so we're going to go through those series really just quickly enough to where you see the, the links. And then we're going to get to the last six diagrams, which are kind of the next phase of some of them are the same ones from Denver that have been tweaked, like brought up to the next level. And then the final one, that the one, the one that they wanted to get to, was the one that illustrates where, after we see how certain things are supposed to work, the Umshadi seed atom is supposed to work in our private areas, we, we will now be able to see the distortion and what is wrong with the sexual orientation of the physical body itself and what has been a biological harness for many, many eons at this point on this planet. So when we see the, what, what the natural structure of the Umshadi seed atom in relation to the private parts, in relation to the Rushate core spiral, that is the spiral of frequencies that create the chakra systems, which create the projection of manifestation, including that of the body. It also is the core, the Umshadi is the core template upon which the core of the DNA templates are built. And it is the core template that runs the axiotonal and meridian line systems in the crystal body and telia structure. So when we are getting Getting into the these programs that interface in the body through the Umshadi seed atom that is a you can picture it as a disc that's located about here in the body but it's actually a whole set of the creation sequence which I don't have time to go through tonight we'll do that tomorrow that's what I was going to do first but we don't have time to do that because I want to get this activation done but you will see, the, the diagrams you will see will give you an inkling of the distortions of currents. And what I will say before we get to that point is when you get there, realize that these distortions have literally twisted everything within the body. They've twisted the uh, axiotonal line alignments. They've twisted the chakras that are supposed to have a particular alignment with the front back and the side ones. They've actually twisted them where we're running the side ones as our front and back. Uh, yeah, and there's one thing here that they mentioned a long, long time ago in Voyager's Volume 1, I think, the first edition, where they briefly mentioned the violence mutation on this planet. And they didn't go into it too heavily, but we discover now that this is the core of the violence mutation as well. It comes through the sexual energies and it controls the fight or flight instinct through the natural connections between the lower chakras and the higher chakras in the brain. So this is literally a chemical hijack of a, a race's biofields and physical body anatomy. What is good about knowing that it is there is we're also simultaneously being progressively given the solution to this. We're now at the core of the matter. We have worked with different layers of the auric field, of the crystal body, of just about every part of anatomy you never imagined you ever had as far as the light body goes. This work that was done before has enabled people to be able to reach the core currents that are strong enough to participate in these kind of activations. And we're also in a planetary drama where the planet is finally being able to run some of these currents from the part of it that is still in natural order, which is called Eartha. So when we do the activation, whatever that's going to look like, I have no idea, by the way. <laughs> it's going to be live, as they have been recently all the time. Um, but what it is meant to do is create the first wave of release of what is called the sextant mutation. And the sextant mutation involves the area down here. Now, the Umshadi itself is not mutated. The body's shields that are also discs that run, you know, your density shields, they've actually been twisted at an unnatural angle in relation to the natural angle of the Umshadi edonic seed atom. So the, the natural sparking processes that we'll talk more about tomorrow, particularly for new people, um, the natural sparking processes or key generation processes that the Umshadi would naturally go through and then cycle renewed energy up through the outer domain physical body, they have been shut off and some of those frequencies have been hijacked to create an, an inverted uh, closed circuit circulation system that draws off the seed atom until it burns it out. That's why bodies die. And so when we get, when, when we go through this to see the mutation I'm talking about, just realize that 
your sex drives, be they strong or be they invisible or anywhere in between, they have been being controlled and regulated by this particular apparatus. There is nothing on the planet right now that has sexual organs that doesn't carry this mutation. What is interesting is for a long time I've felt this thing about um, as far as female energies, and that's not necessarily female bodies, that's people who have irade dominant energies. And I've I've sensed that there was something that in male dominant energies, and it seems it does seem to manifest more in male physical bodies. There seemed to be something there that I could sense. Women had uh, almost a custodial uh, thing to help the males because there was something in this mutation that actually harmed them even more, that made it more difficult for males to, to be able to clear the frequencies and get their chakras running properly. It made them have actually more electrical buildup in the systems than female energies would have to deal with. So it actually, males have been fighting a battle chemically that's even more difficult than what females have been fighting. And this isn't just male humans, this is also you know, any male species on the planet. It sometimes comes out in you know, a stronger sex drive because there is more electrical, there's too much electrical energy running. It sometimes comes out in, you know, in twists, but they can be male or female as far as you know, mind twists and perversions of sexual energy. But there is a thing that the males of our planet should be appreciated for what they have been doing to try to hold the ground for their part of this species so we could clear this together. They've been finding a battle even more difficult than the female battle. The mutations we'll talk about in a little bit and we'll see where they're located in the body have caused for females pain in birth. There was a time when birthing was not painful at all, it's not meant to be. And there are certain breathing things you can do that ease that, but it doesn't make it go away. You can tune it out, but it still hurts. It's not supposed to hurt. This is one of the things that the mutation manifests as within the female genital regions. Within the male genital regions, there's actually an inversion of the natural, uh, the outer correspondent. There's a part of our shields that corresponds to the Umshadi seed atom. And we talked about in Denver that in both males and females, there is a center current that should be going counterclockwise and an outer clockwise current. And, clock, and that means when you're standing here, if you were looking down at your shield, all right, say the, the, the front would be where the number six was, back would be number 12, and counterclockwise would be moving this way, all right, from your front to your left, and clockwise would be moving this way when you're looking down at it this way, okay? Now, in the female a version of the mutation, it has done certain things, but it has not inverted the spins on those two fields where the inner is still going counterclockwise and the outer is still going clockwise like they're supposed to, but there's unnatural electromagnetic barriers that are in there because of certain configurations, um, implant systems that manifest because the planet is actually carrying them. Um, <coughs> but it hasn't inverted completely the spins. On the male and in male bodies and in Mane androges as well, it has inverted them where you have the center current going uh, clockwise and the outer current going counterclockwise. And this creates chemical havoc in the body with the fight or flight mechanisms in the body as well as with procreation. It affects sperm production. It actually affects all sorts of things as well as the oxytonalized la dot and all that. So the, there's some, these mutations, they wanted us to understand as we begin working to clear them, which we will do at the end of this evening, we will begin the first stage in literally <laughs> blowing a hole through the center of the mutation to begin the release of it in all of the chakras. Because with this particular mutation that is held in the first of the first eight cells of the outer domain that's located at the coccyx, all right, down at the, the bottom, the tailbone, um, it actually creates the, the twist in the shields that allows for all these other unnatural interfaces with the Umshadi seed atom to occur. We've activated the Umshadi seed atom and it has activated in the planet as of the, the Denver workshop that, that we, we gave in July. So these frequencies are now available. Even if you weren't there, you can still 
you, you can still, by intention and working with the techniques we'll do tonight, begin the process of activating the natural Um Shadi. Now that has more power than the mutation that is held in your body does, and that's why it is really a gift that we have the chance to work with these frequencies. So I just wanted, wanted everyone to understand that the male and female bodies, and even androge with male or female dominance, man-a or era dominance bodies, have been severely affected by these things. One of the things that women um, have, one of the mutations that it creates in women is an unnatural electrical field actually up inside at the cervix that actually kills sperm. It's too electrical and it kills the sperm of anything that carries a certain percentage of Christic imprint. Yeah. And of course it's very receptive to that with a reversed imprint. And that was done so we could be nice little breeders for the fallen angelic, so we could create more and more and more of them to the point where we killed the sperm of anything that could actually save the race. And we would just populate the world for them. So this impulse that, oh my God, I've hit 35, my biological clock is ticking, gotta have a baby, gotta have a baby. Do you think this might be not natural? Why? There's a million times too many people on this planet already. Why do you gotta have a baby? You think it's holy to have a baby when your planet is sinking because there's so many beings on it that they can't support it? No, all right? There's something wrong with that picture. Now, babies are lovely, and the urge to have a baby is there, but part of that urge is being chemically signaled to you because you have been carrying a breeder program, a breeder program that was genetically imbued into your body and actually controls your chemicals and part of your thought forms in order to make you feel like you are lacking something if you don't do this. Now there are beautiful places to have babies and there are wonderful times to have having babies. I wish I'd known this before, but if I, if I did, I wouldn't have my children on the planet, so I'm kind of glad I didn't, you know, <laughs> However, the urge to have to have a baby because if you don't, there's something missing in you. These urges are not natural. Christian beings think about having a baby. Is it good for the baby? Is it good for the environment and the people around it? Because they know they can choose to share bringing another being in at the appropriate time anywhere. They know they are eternal, so it's not like desperate, got to do it now. They're not worried about their bodies falling apart so they can't do it anymore. So these urges of the female are actually connected to the parts of our anatomy that up inside have been twisted to create a certain electrical currents that create certain chemical properties that will actually kill Christic sperm. And um, this is one of the things we're going to progressively uh, heal as we heal it as well. So it's not just guys. Guys got the violence mutation where they get a buildup of electrical energy and it has to come out someplace and it's harder for them to control that than it is for women because they don't get the buildup of electricals. They actually get a buildup of magnetics that rub against each other and create an unnatural electrical field that manifests itself as certain chemical and molecular properties that form a substance that kills sperm as it attempts to go up and fertilize eggs. Unless, of course, it's particularly Anunnaki. Okay? It's very receptive to Anunnaki fertilization. The human bodies right now are. Certain ones, certain groups have been actually taken from that stage and further mutated so they would serve um, non-Anunnaki fallen angelic races because there was a competition for who was going to take over this planet. So as we, we learn a bit more about the anatomy, which we'll do tomorrow, and we go through the process to the point where you can see the sexy diagrams. I wouldn't call them sexy as far as they're not going to turn you on. They might just make you want to throw up, actually, by the time you get to the last one. When you realize what it has done to you, when you realize every time you thought it felt good, what you were actually activating can really make you go, ooh. And if you happen to have an aversion, and you don't know why, to say orgasm, all right, be man or, or woman, doesn't matter. But there are certain properties of these frequencies, these mutated codes that are let loose when orgasm occurs. So there is a strong imprint in particularly ERA people, not necessarily just female bodies, but people who are ERA dominant, be they male or female, have a very strong uh, aversion to, to orgasm. Sex is okay, but nobody's gonna make them come. They're gonna hold it. Why? Because there's a, there, there's a, an instinct, an inkling of the Christian left, right? That says, I am not going to allow those sparks to run through my body. I am not going to allow a conception of a, a, a child body, a fetus body, that has that imprint 
be, take my body hostage if you're female or contribute to bringing that to the planet if you're male. So the parts of us that have remained Christic have an instinct and sometimes it comes out in funny ways in relation to sexuality where you have your elementals that are distorted into this mutation pattern trying to drag you one way chemically where it's like, you know, I'm horny, I'm horny, I'm horny and the other part's going, no, you're not, you're not, you're not, you're not. Yes, I am, I am, I am. No, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. Some, usually people end up somewhere in the middle, right? And it all goes on subconsciously. 99% of it. It's done through the hormones in the body and the pheromones and all of this stuff that you don't see and you don't even realize you have until you realize you have a light body, until you realize some of its structure, and then until you realize the final core of that light body is where it came in in the first place. Where did we come from the, um, the core, the inner, the middle worlds out into the outer domains of manifestation? And that point is the Umshadi seed atom. And that Umshadi Edonic seed atom, the Garden of Eden, is the par part of us that is connected to the Jadon of Eden, which is the stories of the Garden of Eden came from there. All right, they were the middle domains between the inner and the outer. Now, these, we used to have a natural back and forth. In fact, whenever orgasms would happen between couples, they would actually disappear here and end up back there. And that's where conceptions would occur as well. And souls would incarnate and come out from there, where they were Christic. And they, you know, they held the original imprint, the Adamic races. They held the original imprint of the Adama flame, and they came through with the natural creation cycle. This whole mutation that was caused by severe environmental distortions that were done through black hole technologies over many, many eons, all of this has literally closed that passage. It closed the birthing passage to Eden, first of all, where nothing from there could incarnate out here anymore. And it closed our ability to be able to enjoy that level of orgasm, either with ourselves or, the big one, was when you could combine it with a sacred mate, particularly a twin that had compatible coding to your own, where you could make what are called uh, transharmonic ruta keys, which are bigger keys than just harmonic keys that a singular body can make. This whole mutation that was caused by severe environmental distortions that were done through black hole technologies over many, many eons, all of this has literally closed that passage. It closed the birthing passage to Eden, first of all, where nothing from there could incarnate out here anymore. And it closed our ability to be able to enjoy that level of orgasm, either with ourselves or, the big one, was when you could combine it with a sacred mate, particularly a twin that had compatible coding to your own, where you could make what are called uh, transharmonic ruta keys, which are bigger keys than just harmonic keys that a singular body can make. When we work with these technologies now, we are getting back the ability to do this. We are getting back the ability to open the natural transit passage. Now, it's a birthing passage if something's coming from the Edons out here, but it's also the other way birthing passage that we can birth back into the Edens, back to the Garden of Edens, where we came from, back through the gates with our bodies, if we can reach a level of clearing the mutation out of the bodies by the time starfire occurs on the universal VECA level. Starfire is going to occur, and we're still stuck someplace between as soon as three days to maybe 2014 to at latest 2047. All right, so there is going to be an event that changes this solar system and this universe and this planet. And there are people that are going to be able to go back and ride the crystal spiral back into Eden with Starfire, which will allow them to rebirth out on what would be considered the new Earth and into the new solar system, which is just a rebirth of the original imprint. Or they will go into black hole fall. And that is what we're facing on this planet. Now, a lot of you may know that because you've been following the work. If it's new to you, don't let it scare you to death. There's a lot of work you could you know, do to, to understand it better. I will wrap that up tomorrow, probably 
toward the end of tomorrow because I am going to touch on tachyon cycles again. I am going to show you the starburn cycle in relation to tachyon cycles because the tachyon cycles that we talk about in the natural first creation process are the same process that are processes that naturally take place when your sexuality is functioning properly and is the same key building process. And these are the same keys that when people like Enoch talk about keys, they talked about them, talk, they tend, Enoch tends to talk about, talk about them in very convoluted language, but doesn't explain exactly what are these things. We have explained what they are, right down from where you have a first particai to where particais make quantum sparks of geleasic radiation, and those form other things, and then they combine and form keys. So there's a whole process of physics involved here, where there was never ever a real separation between science and spirituality. But right now what we have on this planet is a shame on both counts, because it is not science. Science, it is half science and it is not spirituality, it is half spirituality. So all of these things, just for the new people, please know there's a huge amount of data that links all the dots together. What I want to do now is just move through this set of diagrams to give a, a quick leap to the point where we can talk about the mutation once we see the diagrams because this is a sacred sex workshop. And the second thing you need to learn after what was learned in Denver, which was how your light body directly connects to the first eternal creation process and directly to source, is next is how your light body and the parts that you know as your sexual organs have been functioning under a mutation caused by the environment so you can begin the process of healing that. And once those two things are accomplished and you start to understand what mutations take place when if you're mutated and you have a, a partner who's mutated, the, when you get together and join your energy fields, yeah, you're going to make keys. They're going to be mutated keys. They're going to be keys that can be harvested, radiation quantums that can be harvested and used for black hole technologies or for um, birthing races that have reverse matrix DNA templates so fallen angelics can incarnate into them and those kind of things. We have been just totally sideswiped here as far as at our planet as far as what has happened. We, we are in the death throes of a planet that has been under attack for a very long time. But what's nice is we are still standing and we still have the ability, at least some of us, to pull out of this, to ride the crystal spiral back home through the natural star fire pr process when this planet goes through it with the rest of this universe. And we will one day be able to sit in a much nicer place and look back and remember this. And at that point, we will be considered as elders because very, very few people actually get out of systems that go this bad for this long, where a fall takes as long as this one has, which has been billions of years in terms of linear time as it is perceived in a density system. Um, the chances of anybody, even one, getting out are very slim. There are many, many thousands, if not a few million of us that can still get out and talk about it later. And we will be the elders when we return, because though the ones we look to now, from the middle domains and the inner and the core domains, they know much more than we do here. But one thing they don't know directly, they are in there. They don't know all the nuances of what it means to participate in a fall and live to tell. So we will be respected as equals when we go back to those places, just so you know. Anyway, next one. First one. <laughs> next one. First one, yes, and there's not a lot of these tonight because I, I was going to, if I'd started, it would have, there's probably about 60 graphs first, and then we were going to get to these, right? So what I did was hop, skip, and jump through the key, most important things that, that tie into the conversation that we're having tonight so we can go right to understanding the sexual parts so we can go right into the activation when they say it's time to do the activation on the peak of the magnetic peak. Oh dear, heats, excuse me. Here we go, strip tease time. <laughs> It'll probably only be five minutes, then I should put it back on because I'll get colds. It's been going on for a week. Okay, now, very quickly. Um, if, if you're new, I don't know how new you might be, but this is a very old chart that explains the basic structure of what's called the stairway to heaven. I'm not going to go through it hugely, but if you'll notice, it is all formed on the Cathara grid structure, interwoven, embedded Cathara grids. These are on a universal level. If we are here on planet Earth, Planet Earth is in one very small location in a solar system in a galaxy that is called Density 1. Density 1 exists down here 
in this one little Cathara grid here. This is called one Vecca quadrant. All right, Vecca quadrants stick together. There's a Vecca quadrant that has a density system and it has four density levels in the density system. And you have over here, the primal light field that goes with that particular VECA. So you have two VECA quadrants, one a primal light field, this is a PCM primal light field, this is our PCM density field, and we are down here, our whole, our whole um, galaxy is located in density one. This is just showing you how the Cathara grid structures, the core bones of creation, are actually build up to form where you have two VECA quadrants to stick together. So you actually have four VECA quadrants that forms the inside of what's called an Echaveca system. It forms the Veca part. Remember, we're down here. When we get next going upward, this is the stairway. This is the ascension process from the outer domains. This is before we ever got into talking about the hubs or the middle and the inner and the core domains. This is after all those things happen. If creation starts at source, then you have the core domains that manifest, then you have the inner domains that manifest, which are called the hubs, then you have the middle domains which manifest, which are called the Edens, or the Jardins of Edens, then you have the outer domains that manifest, and together they are collectively called the Eucatharista body. All right, this is the structure of the bones of the Eucatharista body only. This was the old way of ascension, the long way, when you could still go vertically up from the density system you were in down here. Right now our Veca is falling, which means it is cracking, its, it, its axis has cracked cracked from its connection to its core, which means it is going into black hole fall, and anything that's going to get out has to go out through the Edon, which means it has to go in, because it cannot make it up the stairway to heaven anymore from the, the Veka level into the Eka core, and then into the larger Akasha structure, and then to the Akasha A structure, and into the Akasha Aya, which is the top level of the Ukatharista outer domains creation body. Now, all of these, wherever you see a cathara grid, you will see light cells around them. But by the time you get all that put in to any one of these, you can't even see what the diagram is showing anymore. So we call these the bones of creation, and this is the outer stairway to heaven. Now we are going to have to <laughs> go from here, where normally we'd go up to density 2, then density 3, then density 4, then we'd be able to pass through the Eka center and um, go into what we're referred to as inner earth and those kind of things that was uh, our earth is actually down here but it was a connection through inner earth that takes you into the inner Eka and from there you could progress from the Eka up to the Akasha which would be here and into the Akasha A and then into which is this and then from the Akasha A into the Eucatharista the full Eucatharista body and then from there you would usually take the core center flame home and from there go into the Edon cycles, and then you would travel the middle cycles. And after you finished all those, came down into manifestation, manifestation, then came back up again. Then from there you could go into the inner hub cycles, and from there you could go, after you finished those, you could go into the core cycles. So there, this is a long journey. There's a, this is a really, really long path of experiential hologram in space-time systems that you could have. There are also shortcuts, fortunately for us, because under certain circumstances, the gates that link the outer domains and their light cells to the middle and then the inner and then the core, under certain circumstances, they open. One of the circumstances that occurs naturally under certain conditions is called starfire, and that's what we are headed for on the universal Veca level. Our entire four-density universe has lost its connection to its Eka core. It is going to go black hole fall, and under those circumstances, whatever is remaining that can hold a Christic imprint is being prepared to have the gates that go inward from each density level into the Edon level behind it so they can ride Starfire, which is the crystal spiral, into the next level and then rebirth back out because the Vecca system, the outer Vecca system, will be reborn again in its natural order. And the parts that have fallen will not disappear or vaporize immediately. They will simply shift into a different angular rotation of particle spin in the area that they fell and they will have a finite lifespan, it may be billions of years, but it will still be finite because they can no longer run the main vertical currents that run and perpetually cycle between source and the manifest body of source. So in a nutshell, this is the stairway to heaven of the outer. We are now going to take a shortcut from density one, step one, down into the Edons so we can continue our evolutionary cycle and not end up stuck in the black hole fall. Next one, please. 
heat. All right. If we look closer at that stairway to heaven and just come back down to this one little cathara grid here, all right, that would be our PCM density system. Density one, density two, density three, and density four. Over here would be our PCM primal light field. Up here would be the antiparticle PKA primal light field, and over here would be the PKA uh, density system, which is the parallel to our VECA system. There was the, the, in this system, there was a parallel Earth that was the counterpart of our Earth. There's a lot of history that we have been following this, just so you know, for people who are new. So I'm not going to cover a lot of it now, but there's lots of workshops that explain those relationships probably in more detail than you'd ever want to know. So it is there, just so you know. What I wanted to show you, because what I want to get you fast from, is the stairway to heaven, realizing it is cosmic structure. The cosmos is structured on the light body structure. It is the manifest body of source. And it is not that is not source alone. That exists within the vast unmeasurable consciousness field that is source. It is a small part of it that is made manifest and eternally so. But when we come back down to just our little Vecca quadrant here and when you have the four Vecca quadrants together it creates what's called an Akasha system. So this is our Akasha system with our four Vecca quadrants within it and inside would be our Eka core inside here. What I wanted you to see about this is before we had just the bones of creation, now what you're seeing is there are spheres. Spheres of, of energy, these are, um, these are the light cells, part of the structure of the light cells of the cosmic body or the local cosmic body. Um, we have density one down here. All right, density one, ignore this one here. Density one is this sphere here. That's called the density one radial body. Even the new people have probably heard a bit about the fact that we have a radial body because we taught a bit about radial body in Merkaba in I believe it was the end of Cathara one. So this is where those, that material of Cathara at one plugs in. We have a radial body. In every radial body, there are what are called hoover bodies. This is where we get our five, ignore that one for now. One, two, three, four, uh, five, six, seven, eight. We have the eight Huva bodies, the five Aria Huva bodies, and three Yuseta Huva bodies. That's where they come in. These are part of the light body structure of the universe, not just your own, but it's also part of your own because everybody has a light body structure that is a microcosmic reflection of the macrocosm. So I wanted you to see this part here and how it connects where all of these Vecca quadrants have that same structure. All of these have names and we have charts that have the names on all of those. I'm not going to go through that right now. I just wanted to remind you of structure. Next one, please. <coughs> now, what you just saw, if you ignore these outside, right, you saw this part. There's PCM Vecca quadrant, PCM primal light field, PKA primal light field and PKA uh, density, right? So that's the four Vecca quadrants. That's still our Akasha system. And out here, these are, call, I call them the Oses for short right now. This is where we, we begin to get um, different types of etheric cur currents, sorry, currents. This would be um, the ethos. We have ethos, eros, eros, and ethos. These um, cathara grids and their light cell structures phase at certain times with our universal structures where this cathara grid would come up and merge with that cathara grid and then this one would come down and merge with that this one would come in and merge with that this one would come merge with that and when that happens they all come in and merge together and literally pull out of manifestation recharge in their echa and then pop back out into the manifest worlds of creation. So is the structure of your body is also structured similarly. You would have your density one self would be right in here. This would be the density one hoova body in the PCM universe. And it would be the density one aspect, your physical body as far as your own light body structure. Next one, please. This is honing in a little bit on if we looked at what we just saw before where you had one going down, one going up. You also had two, one, two going that way and two going this way. If this is that center point, that ECA center point, this again is the PCM density grid here. This is the PKA primal light field, right? This would be the ethos grid going down that way below the PCM, and this would be the eros grid going up. I'm just not showing the ones that are running horizontal 
because I want you to see just you know, a close up on these. Now there are specific ways that these phase together and that has to do with the hoover bodies coming together because you will actually get a density one hoover body. In the density one hoover body you have the um, atomic body and the atomic body and you have the etheric body of density one is actually up here in the same place as the density two atomic body. So there's these overlaps of light cells that are actually where you get your etheric levels from and where you get your physical levels from. When you go into, if you're going to go from density one to density two, you would have your density one hoover body would merge with this etheric blueprint that's in um, uh, density two that's merged with density two and the density two body would drop down and you would have a body in the center here. And all of the diagrams that we've showed where we show the embedded cathargrids with your density with your density body and your activated crystal body sphere, that applies to when your radio body is activated. That is flame body activation, but that's only on level one. Then you'd have another level to do it here. That's the long way. It's the long way of ascension. We are so far past that now <laughs> as far as, yeah, we were going to start that, but with the drama the way it has unfolded on this planet and in this Vecca, it is no longer an option because we can't go up. In fact, any parts of ourselves that are in the domains up here have to come down through us and through our fields in order to get out through the Eduns because they have gone into reversal. It's actually tilted. I'll, I won't even get into the fact that we're already rotated over into the horizontal position now. That's, that's other stuff that we've talked about a long time ago that happened quite a while ago at Heath Arrow, three, uh, Heath Arrow 2003. But anyway, just wanted you to see the structures of the hoover bodies that we talk about, particularly people just coming in. You probably heard of the hoover bodies. So you see where they fit into this more complex structure of light body. Next one, please. This is a bigger close-up, <laughs> okay? <laughs> We're going micro on it, all right? This is, again, your density one cathargrid, okay? And that means your density one hoover body is here. And it's in here, you'd actually see your D1, D2, D3, and something called the silver sanctum. Uh, cathargrids, each with a light cell around them. So it, it, there's even more complexities, but this is showing you basically where your body is located down in here. In the density one radial body, it's the lower half of the density one radial body where, it, where the density one hoover body is, the not a hoover body. Next one, please. <sighs> ah, if we go back to looking again up here, that's the primal light field PKA, which is the one on top of our density field PCM here, and here's that same one, our PCM density here. This is simply showing you that even though with the hoover body structure that we have and that we've showed you and the radial body structures and these larger bodies around them and all these bodies have names, um, we also have by the, the 15 dimensional time matrix structure that all of these teachings have started with, they fit in to this structure in this way. These are actually wave bands that run, not just from the Cathara Center 1 to Cathara Center 12 on our 15 dimensional system, but they run up to this, which would be the EUMB point on the PKA, antiparticle primal light field. So this is where you get the arcs that form the ovals that form the 15 dimensional structure. So I just wanted to show you how all those structures fit into that structure, particularly for new people who might just have seen that structure and don't realize the rest of this exists yet. Next one, please. This is a small part of what is called the starborn first creation cycle. This is called the Eden light cell. When we talk about going back to the Jardin of Eden, the Eden is, uh, there, there is a, let, let's say creation starts way back at source with the first particle and then the second particle, units of the consciousness of source. And from there, this amazing dynamic called the starborn cycle that we'll see more of tomorrow emerges. And at a certain point, after numerous phasing, of particle that makes sparks, a certain amount of sparks build, and the particle pull back in and actually replicate into source and replicate in source, come back out with their replica. So it's a quantum expansion that the universe starts with actually one point, the cosmos starts with one point and then progressively births out. The Eden is the 1728 cells 
of the Edan. These are the 1,728 keys that we talk about. Each one of these represents a large, on the cosmic level, particle cell or light cell in the cosmic structure of the, inner, uh, of the middle domains. There's also a set of these. There is an Edan that is connect, an Edan phase connected to the core creation cycle, to the inner one, to the middle one, and to the outer ones. But the middle one itself is referred to as the Edan. So when I talk about Edan, I wanted the people that might not know what I'm talking about at all to at least have an, a conceptualization of every one of these are spherical light domains that space, time, and matter take place and exist within. All right, when we talk about the 1728 selves that are part of your natural incarnational pattern, this would also be the pattern of your selves. It is called a monadic configuration. The positioning of balls, and all of these have names, which is frightening, and I hope I never get that far, <laughs> because that's a lot. And what's scary is there's another structure called the Rashala, that is the next phase of expansion of these that has 20,736, which is 12 of these put together. And we even have that someplace, but we didn't need to, that for tonight. And um, I don't even know if I have it, because see, part of our reference material right now is on a boat on the ocean. Because we had to pack up, after the Denver workshop, we had two weeks to pack up everything in our house and our office over there, which were in the same place, and put it on a boat and move it over here, because we moved out of England. And uh, so a lot of the reference materials that nobody said we'd need for a particular workshop um, are, are on the boat for eight weeks. <laughs> so we do have the Eden, just so, so you know, when we talk about the Jadan of Eden, it's a particular domain of um, spherical standing wave universes that are clustered together in a very specific mathematical configuration, and that configuration is called the Edon. All right, next one, please. We're, oh, can you put that one aside, too, because that one is the one they want to use. Yeah, thank you, honey. Now, we have a basic, really fast crash course in basic, basic bones and cells, or the bones and balls of creation, as I like to call them. The bones are the cathar grids, and the balls are all of the spherical light cells that are formed. And all of that starts with the first point of creation and the first two particle. And we'll see the starborn process a bit more tomorrow. Now, when we see that we, we realize we have a light body structure, the universe has a light body structure, the cosmos has a light body structure, the planet has a light body structure, the galaxy has one, and so does the solar system. When we get to understanding the mutation that we have, it's a good idea to understand that it's caused by what is wrong with our planetary environment, which is part of the, when what's wrong with our planetary environment has to do with what's wrong with not just the planet, but with the solar environment and with the galactic environment. And that has to do with black hole technologies that were used literally billions of years ago up in the higher densities and not too long ago. In fact, they're in the process of being used right now on this planet to finish off the job. So we are talking about a structure of light body that applies to planets and solar systems and galaxies as well as to individuals. When you have a natural light body structure, you get what's called natural Merkabic structure. Merkaba spirals are simply vortices that are supposed to be part of the natural circulation system of the cosmos, where certain ones, they're never supposed to be same spin spiral sets. You're supposed to have one that spirals clockwise that um, brings energy into a system and another that spirals counterclockwise that brings energy out of a system. So it's like a breathing rhythm, a breathing of energy. And Merka, the Merkabic structure, wherever you see a light, wherever you see a cathara grid, which are the bones, implies the existence of light body cells, wherever you, the spheres. Wherever you see the spheres implies the existence of the vortices, which are the Merkabic spirals that are formed by the spinning of the spheres, the circulate energy in and out of creation. Every level of creation has those core structures. When we come to our planet, our planet is supposed to, this little planet in here, has all these fields around it. It's natural density one cathar grid structure and would have density, it would have a D1, D2, D3, and it's density interbedded, <laughs> embedded cathar grids and Merkabas. This is showing the natural structure of a Merkaba, how it should look in relation to the cathar grid. Its axis should run straight up and down vertically and it should have a horizontal axis as well. This is called the staff and that's the main vertical current that runs and this is called the rod and that's the main horizontal current that runs. What you have at the center is a seed atom, that would be the Azure point in the planet, right at the core of the planet. Now, there's all sorts of fields, I won't go into that heavily now, there's other workshops to cover that. In a natural system, the planet would have the same vertical axis as the sun. 
whatever the vertical axis of the sun, all of the planets in that system are supposed to have the same vertical axis because it creates an open network of energy flow between the staffs and the rods of all of the planetary bodies. It creates what are called the natural arcs and angles, or archangels, if you want to put it that way, in a solar plane. Our solar system started at, well, actually, our, so, our, our, the original solar system that we are now a part of, let me word it that way, um, started out in this configuration. If any of you have read Voyagers, uh, Volume 2, you'll know that there's a story about the fall from Tara and how our particular solar system actually are fragments of a planet that was called Tara. Part of it's still there and is called Alcyone now when we look up and see it. And we are the fragments of what was a larger Alcyone that was called Tara. We, our whole solar system was a host, an attempt to bioregenerate this planet until it could ascend back and actually reassemble into the body of Tara. That plan has failed. All right, so just so you know where we're at in relation to that. Well, I want you to just touch base and remember these things. It's also remembering something that you will see soon, and this is the Ruche pattern. There's a particular core creation, they call it the crisscross pattern. It's a pattern of energies that is a particular mathematical distribution of core energy currents that forms the core template of creation all the way up at first creation that involves the first particle and all the way out through the domains. And so this natural configuration that fits into a cathargrid, I don't have it here, it fits naturally into a cathargrid. It's also known as the monadic configuration because it is the structure of a, a, what is called a monad or the, or, or the main phasing light cells of of a light body structure. So we have this particular pattern of Ruche. It's called the Ruche. This is also the pattern that you will see is the natural configuration for what is called the Ruchete spiral. The Ruchete spiral is something that runs the vertical current um, through your body or through a planetary body. Planets have them too. They are natural configuration of currents where if you took this particular configuration, and you're looking at it as if you were looking at a plate this way, a dinner plate. If you turn it this way, and you were now looking at a plate like this, if you were standing in the middle of it, it would be around you like this. All right, that Ruche configuration would be there. Where you see those dots, it implies vertical currents running through each of them. All right, so when we talk about the Ruchete spiral, as you will see as we go, it's referring to this configuration. This configuration is the core of the divine blueprint configuration. It's not the full divine blueprint, it's the core of the divine blueprint configuration. This is just a natural, this one down here is just showing the natural arcs that are supposed to form the natural energy flows and circulations that should be occurring in a solar system or a galaxy between its sun and the planets, all with their vertical axis pointing vertical. And right now we are on a planet wh where we have uh, the ecliptic, which means our planetary north is not in the same north as the solar axis. It gives us the ecliptic, it gives us the seasons and the equinoxes and all of that stuff, and that is not natural. That is evidence of the fact that we are in a partially fallen already system. Next one, please. <laughs> This is some more of the things that, that, can fit, that what, when we saw how we were supposed to have a vertical axis alignment to our sun, well, if this is the sun over here, this is where we should have our staff running. Our, our planetary ruchete should be running this way. Um, our Merkaba should be standing up nice and straight this way, but it's not. It's tilted here, 23.5 degrees. And there's another part of it tilted 23.5 degrees and 11.5 over here. It creates a set of very unnatural vortices that work like satellite dishes that draw in frequencies from other black hole fallen systems. And it was done on purpose and it can't be stopped at this point. This is why this, this planet is going through or is going to be going through what's called a starfire process, which is a natural immune system response of the light body of source that will literally pull what's still viable back into the level before, which is the Edon level. The, inner, the middle domains, and then rebirth it back out in a natural recreation cycle. Anything that cannot hold those frequencies will be set free, and it will be it will fall into the place where it lost where, where it lost its connection to the natural light body structure, and it will remain and stay alive until it burns out the quantum at its core. And at that point, it cannot renew its quantum, so it will go back into space dust. Space dust is back into particle units of the consciousness of source. So there's two ways to get home. If you do black hole fall, you can uh, you will go back to space dust, but you can never 
never escape source because you will always go back. When a black hole system implodes and goes to space dust, on the next natural star fire cycle, that space dust will be pulled back in to source and rebirthed out anew. It will just not hold the form or the memory matrix of what form those units of space dust had before they had fallen. All right, so we are not on the space dust path. The path the, these workshops are about being on what's called the crystal path or the path of the crystal spiral, and that is the path of the starfire and return to Eden so we can participate and keep our templates and our patterns and our cognizant identities as we move through these structures that the universe is going through right now and our planet is going through. I'm not going to get into the heavy mucky messes because I've covered these extensively in other workshops as far as what does this configuration of 23.5 degree tilt of north do. This would be our geographic north, and that is not natural. It should be here. That is a natural solar axis alignment. Um, there are what this gives us is the unnatural procession of the equinoxes and all sorts of unnatural planetary configurations, including this set of magnetic, base magnetic fields, which we refer to as the poison apple. All this is connected to what is called the daisy of death configuration. that has to do with the lotus arcs that are natural part of the phasing configurations of living light bodies that have been actually sprung and pulled and fixed where they can't phase anymore, which means they can't move the light body cells together anymore so the light body cells can spark to generate more quantum. So the daisy of death system, the poison apple system, which is the configuration of the magnetic fields that are surrounding the planet and the magnetosphere at this time, that is the harness, that is the net we talk about, that we have been held in a prison planet for a very long time now, and this is the final uh, final saga, final chapter in this novel as far as what is happening to this planet and in this particular novel the Wiesedrax have won because we are, the planet is going to fall Wiesedrax with this, with the solar system, the entire solar system and this Vecca is going to fall Wiesedrax. That's a particular system I won't get into right now, it's an adjacent part of the light body structure of source, not even in our particular time matrix, that a long time ago it fell into black hole status and it chose to become a feeding system, which means it uses antichristic technologies and bends the natural laws of physics in order to tap into other living systems so it can suck energy off them, because the more energy it can draw into itself, the longer it can postpone its inevitable implosion. And that is how we got connected with all this. All of these are a product of what is called Metatronic technology. So if you've ever heard of anybody out there teaching Metatronic science, don't be fooled into thinking Metatron is your friend because Metatron has done this. Metatron is a collective of fallen angelics that once upon a time was a decent lot, but um, they fell. And when they fell, they devised a code. It is, the, it is called the Antichristic Code. It is called the Metatronic Code or the Tandem Code. And it creates unnatural energy structures that have the capacity to feed off living systems. And it is a black hole technology. So this is the environmental problem we're referring to. And it's not just Earth. It is affecting the solar system because the solar plane is not at the right angle in relation to the galactic plane. And the galactic plane is not at the right angle. Even science knows that there appears to be something like a black hole at the center of our galaxy, somewhere around Sagittarius. Sagittarius A star or whatever, all right? This is just still dealing with the density one level of our singular cathara grid, right, in our universal level. It has been compromised all the way up to 11.5 and it has caused the cracking of the connection of the natural staff and the Ruchete current between the core of living creation that we emerged out of between our Eka Veka and Akasha and the Veka system. So the Veka is falling and the parallel Veka has already fallen. So there is nothing even to tap it into to support it. So that's what we talk, what, this is what we're talking about when we're talking about fall. We're not just throwing that term around like an airhead. There are technicals here and there are some, this is just, this is a breeze through on the technicals. There's huge technicals on this. But at this point what's important is not how bad is it. It's okay, what do we do about it? And that's what the workshops are about. Next one, please. This is some of the messy, uh, I told you that, that that configuration of the combination of the daisy of death, the poison apple, and uh, what's called the demon seed, which is a distortion of the natural seed atom at the core. Um, it actually creates sets of very unnatural vortices that are running. I remember this is the 23.5 degree tilt of the, the we call our, our north on this planet, our geographic north. And these are the other angles. This should have been the natural angle that north is supposed to point. These are the vortice systems 
that they are plugged into what is called the tube torus system, which is an unnatural, uh, it's a product of metatronic code and the Fibonacci sequence and the Fibonacci spiral. We call it Fibonacci because it does just that. It robs systems of chi or life force energy. And uh, it is also being taught as a great thing to do, and they're teaching you how to activate your Merkabas on it and all sorts of things, certain teachers out there in the New Age movement, so just be careful. All right, this is what we're dealing with, too, as part of our environmental mess. This symbol, the yin-yang symbol, is a symbol for how the currents run when they're in the tube torus configuration. It's all part of the Metatronic code. So if you use this code, and it's really sad because it was considered a sacred code by some of the Oriental races a long, long time ago, they lost the text that explained what it was. It sounded good. It sounded like perfect balance, but it isn't. What it is is a symbol code, just like we use symbol code encryptions that will activate certain things in your light body. What this assists, if you look at that and play with that, it assists in activating the metatronic code in your gene code. So, I just, you know, that's, that's all part of this configuration. There are so many pieces to this. You know, it's, it's been fascinating learning about it. And all of this could go right down to details. At some point, you could place exactly where in the atmosphere which band of what was. But if we started doing that, they'd probably make us disappear fast. Because at this point, we are watching the buildup of a war, a war between fallen races. Now, the people here that are being used as the puppet soldiers, it's not them. It's who's connected to their energy fields that's directing their emotional and their mental bodies into fighting wars with each other. Um, there, is, there are competing factions at this point for who is going to own what during this black hole fall. We are watching it now again heat up in the Middle East because some of the soul groups involved there are connected to some of these races. Not all of them. And some of them are indigo races that are, they're trying to use them to hijack in between because the indigos have very strong codes. And if you want to use bodies to control grids, indigos are great if you can get a hold of them because they can run a lot more frequency. And if you can get that running on a metatronic code, you've got quite a little generator there. So there's a lot going on in the politics that is happening right now. It's another step forward in the advancement of the One World Order agenda. The One World Order agenda was always about competing Leviathan or fallen races, the people on the planet being used because they were bred to carry certain strains of metatronic code. They were, this gets into the mutations that I talked about, that we've been carrying these mutations literally into the birthing process, into the sexual process for many, many generations. We are watching the final product of that. We are watching soul groups mo move races toward each other. And from what it looks like, it's not going to get much better. So. All of it is being controlled through the net. The net has to do with the poison apple fields that are magnetic fields that are actually what, what we navigate planes by and everything these days because they are what appear as the natural configuration of magnetics on this planet. They are not. They're being controlled remote through these satellite dish vortice systems that are literally plugged into the planetary body. They don't even need to have a big dish sitting on top of, you know, of the North Pole because they have these, these or, uh, they're not organic. They are formed of natural matter by twisting organic structure into something it was not meant to be. And what's interesting is if your planet looks like this, so do your biofields. Because when you incarnate into a planet, you will take on the configuration of the system. So this is part of what we are healing in ourselves. All of this comes down to a core, a core part of the mutation. That has to do with what's called the Ruchate spiral, which, is the, which are the core currents that run through the central vertical column. On a planetary level, we had a Ruchate spiral once upon a time. Next one, please. Hmm. Okay. What's where? I want to see. All right, yeah, I'll go this way. All right, I'm going to put this in here for a second. Now we had a, a, a Ruchate spiral on this planet. We still do, except now it's called the gravitron. All right, it was turned into a reverse spin set of vortices, uh, core currents that would run those big vortices, and it's been activated in the last two years. They've progressively activated, and that is what caused the final crack of the link between the staff on this universal VECA to its ECHA core. And that's what was the final weapon in the Metatronic arsenal that once activated enabled them to pull this whole system into Metatronic fall. Now, what this is showing you, this is for those who haven't seen a Talia sphere before. The Talia spheres are part of natural light body structure that is covered in Cathara 2.3. What I wanted to show you here simply is 
I mentioned that our solar system and our planet are hosted. They were fragments of the fall of Tara in density two, when they fell to density one. Those fragments were harnessed a long time ago, 550 million years ago when the fall occurred. They were harnessed and brought down, stepped down into density one and placed in, in hopes of um, regenerating them back where they could ascend and the beings on them could ascend back into Terra, which didn't happen. They were hosted into a set of stargates. One was Universal Stargate 3 that is called Eartha. All right, U-R-T-H-A is the original USD-3. Now, we've always said Earth is... Yeah, you know, Universal Stargate 3, that's why it's always been a hot place, you know, for like interdimensional action and that kind of stuff. It's actually Eartha that is the Universal Stargate 3. The planet we call Earth that we see from space when our little ships go out and take pictures back, that is Earth and that is the fragment of Tara that was hosted into the larger uh, stellar body called Eartha. That means that we have a little teleosphere and light body structure of our planet here called Earth. And it's been placed inside the shields and light body and crystal body structure of a much larger celestial star called Eartha. It is also an inhabited star that when you're in certain frequencies, it looks like a planet just like Earth would. But it is still being run Christic. It has not fallen. It does not have its axis cut. Earth is not capable anymore of doing what's called rotting star fire. It cannot go back to the Edens because of the final, um, the, the breaking of the staff and the, its link to its core. It can't run the frequencies required to do so. It would vaporize if it was, uh, if anything tried to bring it through into Eden. However, the larger host shield and the host uh, stellar body that Earth actually exists within. And this means this is actually in our atmosphere. It has to do with the Van Allen radiation belts where there are crossover points that go into the larger sphere that you can't see if you just take a spaceship and go this way. Different angular rotation of particle spin. You would have to actually align it with the configurations of the natural Earth angular rotation of particle spin. So there is literally, if you start seeing mirages in the sky, it's not just your eyes or your imagination because there's bleed through starting to happen because they are opening the gates between this crystal body that is falling, this little crystal body of Earth, and this larger crystal body structure, which means light body structure, which means Cathara grid and all that, right? And matter structures, of course, of Eartha. And I just wanted you to see the relationship between them. Here you have Eartha where it would have its natural um, vertical axis and its natural horizontal axis. It would have natural Merkabic configurations and all of that. It is connected to Universal Stargate 4, which is called Sala. The thing we call our sun was a part of Terra that was hosted into USG4 Sala. Therefore, our sun has operated as a subharmonic of USG4, just like Earth has operated as a subharmonic of USG3. But the core stargate, it goes with the big one around it. So the sun is like this too. You have the sun that we see, and then you have structure. And so we have Eartha and Sala. And this is where the activations are running from now. Both of these um, stellar bodies will be doing star fire, which means they will be going on the natural wave that is going to come through this universal VECA system and take anything that's on its natural, original um, angular rotation of particle spin and frequency back in to the edons, which are the middle domains. And then they will rebirth out again in a natural cycle and order will be restored. This is what Revelation was really talking about, with the new earth, the new heavens, and the new earth and they forgot to mention the black hole stuff. Well, they kind of did, but and a little, very colorfully, you know, fire and brimstone and, you know, things with many heads and wings and all sorts of stuff. That, the book of Revelations, was a coded story that was trying to tell this story in a time that if you dared, uh, first of all, most people wouldn't understand the thing you said because all the Atlantean knowledge had been lost and science and things that were very known in Atlantis they weren't known in the time of Christ. So there was a story that was put together in order to try to convey some of what was going on when the end times came. We are in the end times, which are the rebirth times, the starfire times. So I wanted you to understand that here is Earth, here is Eartha. If you're looking at the sun, here is what we call sun or soul, S-O-L, and here is Salah. Eartha and Salah are the places we need to get to in order to ride starfire because Earth 
and the sun and the other planets that are connected to that are going to fall we Sidrak, black hole system. So our jobs are to figure out how to get to Eartha and Sala. And that is what the beloveds are trying to teach us. And part of this is directly connected to our Rujute spiral, our natural vertical current that we have to get back. And that means clearing the distortions that are held within the core root of our creation, which are the, the uh, sexual parts. And in, I want you to understand one more thing too. Between Eartha and its crystal body and light body and Earth, there is a field of something a field of energy that was given as a gift a long time ago. It's called the Aurora Field. This Aurora Field, I won't get into it heavily right now, but it is a, f a set of frequencies that will allow the beings and things on Earth that actually their imprint is not encrypted into Earth's grids. It's, they're only in Earth grids. Uh, anything on this planet right now, including the angelic humans, we're not part of the Earth. -a um, life cycles. We came in later as just part of Earth. We were supposed to ascend back up to Terra and take it from there. If a thing is not encrypted into the natural, that means your radiation signature is not held as a part of the core radiation signature of that planet, you would not be able to ride Starfire with it. So this Aurora field was given to us a long time ago by a certain set of races called the Aurora races who came through from the inner hubs and came out through, which was not easy to do even way back then because of the distortions in this universal time matrix, but they came through and they set an imprint that would allow for an interface between the Eartha signature and the beings on Earth that could still hold a Christic imprint. Through what are called the lights of Aurora, we can actually encrypt our signature now as it is into the Earth body. So we will be able to go through eventually those Van Allen radiation belts, do the angular rotation of particle spin shift to end up on the planet where it looks like a planet when you get there. From other areas, it looks like a star where it would be, look like it's on fire. But there are certain bands of frequency that would be just like going to a beautiful place on Earth. You know, you even have mountains and you have trees and you have water and those kind of things. So it would look like a big version of Earth, but in its very pure state before there, there are cities and things, but they don't look like cities here. It is a Christic Earth, and that is where that is the first stop for anybody who is getting out of the black hole fall. They have to get out first through Earth. Anything from here has to get out through Earth. There are a few other systems that have evac stations in density one. You have um, Iridanus, I believe, at uh, USG2, I think has some, but not for our races. So our out is through Eartha, and that would cross over into Sala, which is USG4. Through those, we will go back into the Edens. So I wanted to understand, when I talk about the word Aurora, I am talking about that field of frequency that was laid in that would allow us to actually imprint um, bring in the aurora field into our bodies and then send it back through to imprint our, our body imprints and our consciousness imprints and our shields into the earth the core memory banks into its teleosphere so we would be able we would be recognized by the earth the body and therefore be able to ride its crystal spiral as it goes back into starfire so eartha is hosting anything from this planet from earth that can get out eartha is hosting it and it has to be done through the aurora the lights of aurora field next one please Yeah. Yeah, what was I doing here? I was actually showing the proportions, I think. Yeah. I was showing on here I was getting a little bit closer to the actual proportions. No, actually it wasn't that one. This was the first one. That one was the closer to the proportions. This is just showing a little bit of the distortions that this if this was Earth, it's shown much bigger than Earth actually is in relation to Eartha. But if this is Eartha's axis and this is Earth's, and you have natural um, the axiotonal and meridian lines running on the planet, it creates this really wacky set of uh, diagonal grids that actually end up looking like, uh, and I think somebody in Russia has actually discovered this grid. They're kind of like triangular. I don't have this perfected yet. But it's because of the unnatural cross-throughs of the natural planetary lines, meridians, and axiotonals that are running on Eartha and the unnatural tilt on the ones running on Earth that creates this um, artificial grid that is an artificial racial grid and that's what a lot of the um, other teachings, teachings that have to do with uh, Metatron and Toth and those kind of things. 
and the paracletes and things like that, yeah. All of those things are teaching you about using these grids, which are ways to suck energy off Eartha in order to do things on Earth that you're not supposed to, all right? So anyway, next one. <coughs> yes, they call it sacred geometries. Spare me. All right, this is just a really quickie to show you. When I talk about the Ruchete spiral, the natural Ruchete spiral would run the natural uh, north-south axis on the planet. It is a natural Ruchete spiral supposed to be built on the Ruchete configuration. We have the four inner and then the eight outer. The four inner points or pillars in the shield are the uh, what are called the harmonic pillars and the eight outside of them are called the octaves and together they phase and spark. What you have here instead, this is the mutation that is carried in the planetary Ruchete spiral, which means it's carried in your Ruchete spiral as well. This is what has formed what is called the gravitron, which is a really nasty vortice that actually linked with a whole set of them. They go up the densities up to density 3.5, and they were enough once they were activated together to crack the axis of the entire four densities of this universal Vecca. On a planetary level, it means our Ruchete spiral of the planet has been twisted and tilted. The natural Ruchete configuration that should be the shield that each of these things run on has been twisted and mutated into this configuration. All right. This configuration is what you've got down there sitting on top of your Um Shadi. And it is harnessing the Um Shadi and it has blocked all the things I talked about at the mutation are coming out of this configuration. And I'll show you more what it looks like in the sexual organs, but I wanted you to see it is part of, it is the gravitron configuration that is the mutation of the natural Ruchete spiral that would run down the center of the planet if it was on its normal axis. Next one, please. <sighs> now a natural Ruchete spiral is based on this template. You basically have a core one, the 13th pillar in the center, and you actually have 13, 14, and 15. There's a, it's actually 15 pillars, but it looks like 12 because you have, you know, um, you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. That's natural Ruchete configuration. It is also the template for the Ruchete. That's looking at your plate this way. If you turn it this way and it's a shield around you, you would be looking at 6 here in front of you. So you'd have the six, the four, five, six configuration should come out in front and the 12, 11, 10 would be in the back. What this does when you tip it up, oh, can you move this up a little bit, honey? If you look at this as a, as a plate or a shield, right, it creates these spirals. It, first of all, take them as if, as if each one of these pillars, right, was just a straight pillar, right? But then have all of it spinning and the center four are spinning in one direction and the outer eight are spinning in another direction and each one of them is spinning individually as it spins as a whole. What it creates are these, these wonderful loops of energy, spiraling currents. They're spiraling up and down your central vertical column. It is actually these and these spiraling configurations that undergo an interesting process where at first they, are, they, would, they simply look like this, where you have the electricals would form these outer ones and this part of the inner ones and then the magnetics, the inner ones, the four inner ones, form these spiraling currents. And this is trying to look at something that's three-dimensional laid out flat. All right, think of it as a spiral of energy. You have a, a spiral that connects to eight different points on the outside and then you have one that connects to the four on the inside. And it starts out looking like this but this has to do with the breathing rhythms and it has to do with your breathing rhythms too or a planet's breathing rhythms that at certain points when it's in complete just stasis, say pause between breaths, not inhaling or exhaling, it would simply run this configuration. It does something different when you exhale, when a planet exhales or when an expansion cycle is happening where it actually polarizes. These currents polarize and they open up what's called a breathing tube down the center. And in that polarization, they form vortices all along the sides. And this is where chakras come from, as you'll see in a minute. But I wanted to show you just the general beginnings of understanding that it is that template 
run horizontal, that creates each point on that template is a vertical column of energy. And when it spins, it creates these looping spiraling columns that are the Ruchete spiral. So everything that has a central vertical column, which means everything that has a cathar grid and light bodies and Merkabas and all that, has a Ruchete spiral. All right, next one, he's not there. <laughs> oh, thank you. I also wanted you to see something that the old DNA template diagrams correspond directly to this template as well. There's other diagrams from, I think they're in K23, that show how to plug the Ruchete into the 12 pointed clock thing that emerges from it. And the Ruchete controls the DNA template. It is part of the DNA, it actually creates the currents, the spark pulse currents that become the chemical arrangements in the molecular structure of the DNA itself. When you unravel the DNA and you see the DNA coils, they're like a micro version of the natural Ruchete spiral. Next one, please. Thank you. Uh, this goes this way. <laughs> there we go. Yes, here's where my, my menagerie started this evening. I'm going to put my jacket on for this. Now I'm getting cold. Excuse me. We're getting close now. <laughs> All right. Um, can, we, can you shift it over just a little, please, so I can see this? Oh, he didn't take that off yet. He was going to take the white bits off. Can I see, let me see that a minute, please. Yeah. Thank you. We just didn't get to it because we were in a hurry. There's one. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. There we go. Now, in simple terms, and this is driving me nuts because we, the diagrams, yeah, bring this over just a little, no, yeah, for now, leave it there. These boxes, when this is finished, they actually do is just a photocopy or cut them off because we have A4 paper from the UK that the diagrams are drawn on, and we have 8.5 by 11 over here, and it's shorter. <laughs> and we didn't have time, more time, to play with that. But what I have shown you on here is this is the, the 0.5 scale. All right, for example, 0.5, this would be 3.5, all right? The EUMB is at 3.5. You would have uh, 3.5, 2.5. 1.5, 0 0.5, all right? In between the 0.5 scale, you'd have what? D1, D2. So there's like D2, D2.5, D3, D3.5, D4, D4.5. This is showing you how to do the dimensional breakout on a cathar grid, all right? This is useful when you want to see where the chakras are because the chakras are vortices that form through the Ruchete spiral and its interactions with itself, basically. Um, the currents that are spiraling up and down the Ruchete spiral create the chakras, and they emerge at very specific points. Now, the Ruchete spiral, the outer electricals, form this configuration going all the way up. There would be what are called 15 dimensional shields. There's actually more of them. You have double shields for 15, 14, and 13, and you have uh, 15, 14, and 13 here as well. These are numbered. These are uh, what are called Ruta templates. They are also what are called DNA templates for each dimension. All right? So our DNA template is the compilation of all of these Ruta templates. The Ruta templates are shields that form from the spinning of the Ruchete currents that are moving through. So you have a loop of Ruchete current that forms uh, a movement in the energy around it, and that movement around it becomes the shield, but it's the spiraling of the currents that actually creates the counter spiraling of the shield around it. So where you have the currents coming in, it creates a deflection field around it, and that creates the shield. So you have your dimensional shields and the dimensional Ruchete currents, each coming in at very specific uh, scales. Um, the 0.5 scales, that run here. If you notice, well, first we'll look at this, D6. All right, between D6 and D7, you have 6.5, and that's where the Azure is located. It's like that's the center, right, of the cathar grid. At D6, if you take this over, that's where you have deflection shield 6 and spiral 6. But when you take this over further, you'll notice that there's that 6 again. There's the shield. But 
they form vortices between them. The shields form the chakra vortices between them when the condition of exhale or expansion of energy outward. When the rushate brings energy down and then pushes it out, it polarizes where this, these currents actually split into two. And if you take that diagram and make another one and put it on a mylar and put it that way, you end up with this, right? We have this column in the middle that gives you the outer currents that, that polarize. So now you have <clears throat> what were eight, you now have the double eight. And what were the four inside are now two sets of four inside. When you put these all together in between these spinning currents and their spinning shields, there forms vortices that spin. And these vortices are, there are four horizontal vortices and two vertical ones for each of the dimensional levels. The center point of these vortice structures, the vortice structures are this down here, where, where, where that is in simple terms, it's hard to see in that diagram, is uh, you've got one um, upside down vortice here with its small point here and its big one here. You have another going down the opposite way, that way from the, uh, yeah, from the center point. And then you have four, two, one going out in front, one going out in back, and one going out on each side, horizontal ones. There's also two, uh, um, four little inner ones that you don't see that correspond with these spirals. So we're getting the structure, like more and more, on the structure of what actually, how chakras actually look. But they are supposed to be positioned very specifically and run specific currents of the Rushate. When, in, for, to, to understand how the Rushate spiral works a bit, is when you um, inhale, for example, can we move this over a little bit, honey, this way, please? Can we move this this way a little bit? No, no, did you see? Thank you. <laughs> yep. Now, if this is in their resting state, this set here, all right, this is just showing the electrical one, the inner magnetic one, and the two of them together. That's the whole thing. That's when it's in, um, like, just neutral position. When you exhale, you go, <sighs> that is when the polarization of these currents occurs and the center breathing tube opens and the chakra vortices come into activation. So that's when the chakras are supposed to go and the chakras open and spin and send energy out into your hologram, right? And the inner ones do the same. And when you put those two, that's the inner set polarized and that's the outer set polarized. They give you specific center points for each one. Now these little squares here are the, you have the Azure, the Rajna, and the Iyumbi. All right, so they are the lock systems. If you look over here, something interesting happens on the inhale. This is the exhale when the chakras come into being through the positioning of those spirals. And that's when chakras, you know, chakras are supposed to like turn off and on. They're not supposed to just hang there and beam, all right. all right? And they're not supposed to just be in the front either. You're supposed to have, if you have one in the front, it implies one cone in the back and it implies two on the sides. And they're supposed to rotate and spin with the spirals, the Rishate spirals. Chakras right now do not do this. What they do is sit there and beam, all right? Which means they're sucking energy off something and just throwing it out into the hologram, all right? And they're actually regurgitating their own energy front to back, but they're not generating any new energy because part of the generation of new energy process of the Rushate when it's, active, when it's operating properly is on an inhale. Now remember, if you inhale, your arcs go up, your pillar comes up, right? What it's doing is taking these discs that are stretched out, and they're, you know, when they went on the exhale, they stretch out. It's pulling them up together, one into the Iyumbi, one into the Azure, one into the Rajna, one, I believe this one goes into, uh, what is that, D13.5, D, 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 and that one goes into 13.5 below. And these get into the, the parallel D13.5 frequencies and that kind of stuff. So what happens, it's like an accordion where it squeezes up and the inner little vortices that are formed by the harmonic vortices, the four harmonic dots in the Rishate that are formed by these four, they draw energy from the standing flames that are in the voids, your density flames. And then when you exhale, that energy is then circulated out through the Rishate and through the chakras. So it's a natural 
circulation process. Energy is brought back in, sent out to source and out into the larger light body structure, and new energies come in. This also allows for sparking, a natural sparking to occur. Because right here, we talk about the Umshadi on this particular set of diagrams where you have chakra one, where the center of chakra one. Now see, here's the horizontal sticking out on chakra one. And it would also have two verticals, but you don't see those because you wouldn't have been able to see anything if I put all the verticals in. So what you're seeing here are the side chakras and the front one. That circle there implies a back one, right? So if I were standing here, right, if, if that was my chakra one, that would be down in this area, and I would have the two vortices coming out that way, and I'd also have the one everybody recognizes is the one that points downward, plus one that points upward and links to the, spiral, the down spiral of the one above it. So it's a natural system when it's working properly. Now in this chakra one area, this is the area that the umshadi seed atom from the edonic level from the middle domains interfaces. So I wanted you to see what the Rushate does, how, how it actually forms the chakras, how the chakras are supposed to turn off and on with the natural expansion and contraction of energy, and how if chakras can't go into this phase where they squeeze up like an accordion, they're unable to draw natural energy from the flames, the, the, the core density flames that are in each of those density locks, and uh, they are also unable to send energy back to those flames. So the circulation, if this cannot occur in the Rushate spiral and in the, the Ruta shields that the Rushate spiral forms, then you have a phase lock system in the chakra system, and that's what we're going to overcome with the activation that we're going to do before we leave. This will be one of three, they said. This will be the first of three activations, and they wanted it done tonight. They'll let me know when. We're getting close, but it's not quite. But I can, my eyes are starting to water, and that usually means incoming something. <laughs> All right. Next one, please. We're, now we're getting to the good stuff. <laughs> Almost. Right? Okay. Next step is back to this diagram. Remember, that was the other half of the one you saw where it just showed all of those together. This is just showing the chakras, and this is on the exhale phase, right, where it's, and the chakras are turned on. When you take these lines of frequency, these dimensional lines on the 0.5 dimensional scale as well, over into the Cathara grid, this is the D2 cathara grid we're referring to here, and this is the D2 body, right? It shows you where each of these vortices, see that vortice? is this vortice, right? Which is this vortice, right? This two is the front vortice of that. So you have one there, the two side ones, and it implies one behind, right? Plus it would imply one going up this way and one going down that way for each of these. So this is what your natural chakra system is supposed to look like when it flashes on with exhale and energy expansion. And then it would close up and the little interior ones would turn on and spin when energy was actually coming back in from the hologram through those. And that's when they would exchange energy actually with the flames in the void spaces and then circulate the new energy back out and take the old energy back up and send it out through the other parts of the light body structure through the core seed atom at the Azure. So there's a whole intricate structure of, of chakras. It's, it, they're fascinating when they work properly. What's also interesting here is, now this is it's hard, a little bit hard to see it, but this same size cathara grid is being used here where you have cathara center one is down there at the bottom end. You follow that over, and that's where you would actually have chakra 12B, right? Follow it over. Okay, that's the bottom of the D2 cathara grid, okay? There's other things that we'll get into later that have to do with the ethos and eros that like, like where do my feet come from kind of thing, right? Because <laughs> this ends at the knees. There's an interface between the D1, the D2, to the D3, and the density level embedded cathara grids, first of all, that help to form an interface with these vortices, and that's where you get the structures that form, you know, the, the feet and everything from the knees down, because there's a point, and I don't, you, if, if you're getting any pain in these areas, it has to do with the fact that we're starting to clear these spaces, but right inside the knee, like uh, right in this little area here, you might find it swells or sometimes it gets really, really sore or even sometimes might develop what feels like a cyst 
in it. And you can use any of the, even the, even just running Maharic steel frequencies or uh, especially using the K23 Lotus Touch stuff, you could actually break up cysts there just with frequency. Because what is happening is the energy systems, because of all the work that has been being done and because of the frequencies that are running from Eartha through the Aurora field into Earth now for anything that can receive any Christic frequency, we are starting to clear the messes that are in these areas. So when we get into the D2 body, all right, our D2 emotional body, Body is what we appear, what we see in the mirror is our physical body, what we touch here. Because our consciousness is stationed at D3 in the mental body, we see a solid, what is exactly one dimension below, and that means our D2 uh, elemental emotional body is what we're referring to as our physical body, and we also have within that the atomic body, all right, which is our atoms, molecules, and that level. So this is the basic chakra system. We can understand that. It is created by the Ruchite spirals and the Ruta shields, the dimensional Ruta shields that are formed by the Ruchite spirals. Next one, please. Oh, wait a minute. Let me bring this over a little bit, honey, please. Now, when certain things activate that we are going to begin the process of activating, that has to do with uh, um, activating the core flame of the core creation flame and a lot of the technologies we're going into have to do with that, activating the unisci, which is the, the first point where we actually interface in, in the core domains with source, our first point of exit from source in the inner domains. We're going to be doing technologies, I think one of them is tomorrow, we start that, um, that have to do with this. But what it will do is begin the process of these chakras will begin to blend. Right now they have seals. If you notice the seals form, on some of these, where these currents, the inner, the inner four currents when they polarize, interface in a way with some of the outer currents and their vortices they form, and they actually blocks flow, but only on some of them. So there's a whole list of seals. There, there are, uh, some of the chakras have seals on them. Um, these, I believe, are the chakras with the seals on them. Uh, can we, yeah, move there a little bit. 15A, 13A, chakra one. Uh, there's a seal, 3.5 Ayumbi. Um, uh, chakra four, chakra eight, okay, front, all right, chakra 9.5 at the Rajna, it's not a chakra, it's 9.5 Rajna, uh, and then the chakra seven, nine, okay, the front nine, which is up in this area and here, that one shares a set of seals, 11 and 14A. Now those have these Ruta seals on them, and this, these, this here indicates the ones, this, this shows you the chakra lineup without all the mess around it, which is, you know, corresponds to their placement there. This shows you which ones have the seals on them. Those seals are like membranes and like little lids, almost like having a piece of saran wrap or cling film over the chakra. So for the energies to flow, those seals have to release. When those seals release through certain circumstances, one of which is when you begin the natural process of activating the Yom Shadi, um, what the, one of the first things that will occur is this. Over here, honey, please. is you will have chakras two and three will merge at the Iyumbi, you'll have chakras eight and four will merge at the Azurae, and you'll have chakras five and six merge here and form three big ones, right? So the vortices blend and get bigger. This is the beginning of activating the entire flame body. Now I just wanted to show you that, and you will also have progressively bigger vortices activating top and bottom as all the little inner ones start to open up. Next one, please. Uh-oh, <laughs> it must be one of those. <laughs> I can't remember, so. Here we go. <laughs> okay. Now, yeah, why don't you move that over just uh, for a minute? Let me talk about these first. Keep going, <laughs> keep going. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, let's ease into this now. All right. All right. This again is the your Kathara grid, your D2, corresponding to your D2 body right now. Okay. This this is your chakra system that you saw from the other graph before. Okay. Every one of these chakras corresponds to its corresponding level of the auric field around you. So when you're dealing with auric fields, eventually we're going to plug in the Brennan bodies too. I call them Brennan bodies because she did amazing work on seeing the auric levels. Her name is Barbara Brennan. She, she, she's a healer and she has some amazing stuff on a particular aspect of the more local multidimensional anatomy, including chakras. She, she uh, shows what she sees. 
and she sees what is there. And what is there right now is the mutation. So if you want to look at that, you can see in a lot of the, you know, the drawings she said, she will show you parts, you know, what it looks like right now, what the structure looks like right now. What it's supposed to look like are these vortices. Well, her pictures are a lot prettier because she's had time to have artists do really fancy paintings and things, and I hope someday we can too. But somewhere in here, we will also find the Brennan bodies. They're not just a simple, straightforward, oh, they're just the auric levels. There's more to it than that. That goes back to your, um, your hoover bodies and how they blend in the radial body and all that, so we're still working on that. But what's important to understand here, when it comes down to the sexuality issue, is you have your chakras, they're created by the Ruchite spiral, which is implied by that configuration. Now, right here, chakra one, this is the interface point. Notice where that is, okay? That's right down there, right? Where the Umshadi Azure is. And that's where the Umshadi's seed atom is. Now the seed atom, this is a part of the seed atom. This is called the monadic aspect. The seed atom, before anything gets to a seed atom stage, it starts as Particai 1 and Particai 2, and then it goes from uh, Particai 1 and 2 to the triad, to the taran, to the dyad, to the myad, to the monad, which is this one. Then it goes from the monad axis 4 to the Adon hub cell, then it goes from the Adon hub cell to the 144 Particai divine blueprint, then it goes from that to the 1728 Edon cell, then it goes from that to the 20,736. Rashala shell cell. So wherever you see one of these, it implies the rest of those, the little ones that go down in the center and the bigger structures that emerge from this. But right now, because this is the level that is activating, because it corresponds with the part of our own light body structure that we have just um, completed activation of. It began, it was rebirthed, our, our natural monad level, which is called axis four, or tachyon cycle four, was rebirthed during the Shasta trip in, uh, at Hitharo in May. And it has finished its cycle now. And we have, in, in the Denver workshop, we were able to activate the Umshadi by connecting it to the activation that was happening through the tachyon cycle that finished of the outer monad. So we linked the outer monad to the monadic level of the Umshadi and it activated both of them, giving the monad a stronger activation and also beginning the process of opening the passages by which we can clear the sexual and genetic mutations fast. So we can do fast track evac if necessary, which I have a feeling somebody's preparing us to at least go for a visit because this is really soon to throw all this material at us at once. It's like there's never time to even get the diagrams done from the one before, before we're being bombarded with the ones you know, next. So this is a configuration, it's called the monadic configuration. When we see tomorrow, we go through the pictures that have to do with the starborn cycle. I will run you through those fast, particularly for the new people. Um, you will see that that represents the, mona the monadic cell structure. It, it comes out of the starborn process and at um, the, the fourth level, when it gets to axis four, there are other levels that grow beyond this. So you have this structure interfacing here. Now, if that's the Azure interface for the Edon structures for the middle domains, that implies cathar grids are very precise. Okay, they have a very specific shape. If that's the structure, uh, I mean, that's the middle point of the cathara, that implies here would be the top point where our chakra eight is, and the bottom point would be down here where our feet are. All right, so there is a light body cell structure running behind us and through us that has to do with that 1728 uh, lovely colored balls that we saw that is connected. At the center of those balls, you would find a configuration, one level of it, of which would be this, and that is referred to as the Umshadi uh, Edan, middle domain, seed atom, monadic level. All right, that is what we're activating. When we look at this, look at the cores of each of those. So we take the big light spheres off and look at just the cores. There you go again. We've got that Ruche configuration. This Ruche configuration, these are called Ruta pillars. These are the Edonic level Ruta pillars. They are the root out of which the Ruches on the outer domains are formed. Now, these are, this is the template. It's called the Edonic Ruta template. It is the template for the outer manifestation. And from the first, it is, it is the template of the first point that we ever entered outer manifestation from 
the middle domains. And no matter what system in the outer domains you enter, you will always carry the imprint of that with you. Even if you entered, entered, entered here from another star system and not from Earth, which is what most people here, most people didn't enter at all to, you know, onto Earth here. They might have entered from Tara. But this is what we're beginning to activate. What this does is kind of neat because these phase, which means these phase, these light cells do what particae do. The one here, which is a harmonic one, draws these two together and they phase together. And when they phase together, they make sparks, quantum sparks. And then the sparks collect and they collect in the center. So you have this set, this set, this set, and this set of the monad phasing, creating sparks, and then bringing them to the center. When you look at it this way, it's easier to see. You have this little triangle, these two spark on that line, they spark there, these two spark there, these two spark here, these two spark here. And after that happens, they bring their sparks in here and make these spark, so you end up with one, two, three, four sparks. Then, because those sparks get sent in here and they make these spark, you have one, two, three, four more sparks. When they spark, then it causes these harmonic ones to spark together. So you get another one, two, three, four. You get a set of 12 sparks that occur in the natural phasing of the Um Shadi, or of any monad, or of any monadic configuration of any level of your light body structure that has that particular configuration. When this comes to sexuality, <laughs> can we shift this over, please? <laughs> now remember, this would be like a dinner plate turned on its side up here, right? You'd be looking at the edge of it. Here, you're looking down at it, right? When you're looking at it here, you're actually looking at it upside down. You're looking at the, the opposite end of the dinner plate from this diagram. But if you were looking from down there, right, you would see that it, the, the six would be in the front. All right? you, so what, we'll get to the numbers in a bit. But I wanted to show you where we just happened to use a female body because it was a bit less lines when we were first introducing it. <laughs> All right, don't worry. We've got the guys there, too. This shows you the configuration of the entire monad, but it's hard to see what's going on where. These are actually the structures that form the currents that, that circulate energy in a way that forms the, the light, you could call it almost like a light mesh armature, that the molecules or, or the atoms and the, uh, the subatomic particles form on to create what is the body mass. And that applies to every organ inside of the body as well as just the, the skin and the shape of the body on the outside. But it's hard to see what the monadic configuration itself of the Umshadi is doing. So we just took it down to the Ruta pillars in the template. Now, you would have your main vertical current, your Rushate, coming down. And each one of its pillars, or its spirals, would anchor into one of those pillars. And that would be your natural connection. Normally, we'd have a natural connection to the Edan in, uh, middle domains. We would be able to go back and forth. That's, we, we were designed to do that. We weren't supposed to be hijacked here. But we have been biologically hijacked, so this, doesn't, this process doesn't work naturally. When it works naturally, it's really neat. Can you put the next one on, please? Um. Hey, here we go. <sighs> okay, now we got the guys there too. <laughs> okay. All right. Now I had mentioned before when I showed you the easy diagram of just the 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 ruta in the ruta take configuration through the pillars, how they spark. That there were four sparks that would happen when the outer ones, the octave sparks. So you get one, two, three, four spark points. <coughs> so this gives you four outer spark points on the body. Parts, and I'll read those off in a minute. All right. Then you would have the next ones that spark where the harmonics are, as that spark comes in and actually makes a spark with the, the harmonic pillar. So you have another one, two, three, four. That means you have another set of spark points in the body. All right. And then once those spark points go off, there's a set of at the 45 degree angle spark points. And they would be at the 45 degree angles on body. Both male and female have these configurations. Um, let's see. The, the 45 degree angle ones connect to what are called the Shaddai chambers that run through the plate, which means they run horizontally this way. And they create certain configurations in the body that allow for the final big sparks which would be the 13th, or you already have 12 sparks here. You have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Then you have 13, the center spark. 
then 14, and then 15. And when those last three go, they are sparking open your central vertical column and your pillar, which means they're allowing you to go into light and turn into light form and enter a state, we'll see in a little bit, the, the vehicle that it's called the Christ Star vehicle. Some of you have seen that, those drawings a bit already. But it allows you to go into a state of uh, sadi, and it's a certain type of sadi state that will allow you to pass through into the edans, like we used to, where we could go back and forth through the gardens. And when the body is acting naturally, what's interesting too is it doesn't just, they spark once and then pop, you go through the gate. It's a building process, just like what we'll review again tomorrow is called a tachyon cycle, which is a key generation cycle, where you have these um, currents and their pillars phase, they spark. Those sparks create what are called kilana sparks. Kilana sparks build up to form kilons. Kilons build up around the center and form like kilon crystals, right? At a certain point, the kilon crystals release their bonds and they form what are called harmonic keys. This is where you will get a crystal key and what is called a kasha key. One is uh, electrical and one is base magnetic. These keys then go through something called, um, what is it called? Uh, it's where they distribute their quantum so they're equal. I forget what it's called. What is that called? Do you remember? Because with R. <laughs> Resolution, thank you, that's the word, it's very late. <laughs> we'll see this in the tachyon cycle, but this works the same way as the full light body tachyon cycle and the core light body tachyon cycles. Your private parts are supposed to work the same way in phasing with the umshadi thing. So what would happen is there would be cycles of spark generation and they would create crystal kilons and uh, crystal keys and kasha keys. And at a certain point, those keys would release their bonds, have certain energy exchanges, and then they would reform into sets of 12 keys and to form what's called a tachyon. And a tachyon is a tachyon, T-A-K-E-Y-O-N, right? which is what they're actually trying to talk about when they talk about tachyons that are spelled the other way, the superluminal particles. All right, it is the same thing, but it's actually a tachyon, and that has to do with the tatwar, and that has to do with the creation cycle that we'll talk about tomorrow. But when, we are, when the, the, the body is acting normally, the umshadi would stimulate natural phasing of the Rushate currents, natural sparks and quantum building would occur. It would go to the center and store there until a certain point of quantum was built. The quantum would go from um, sparks to kilons to harmonic keys to tachyons. And at a final point, there'd be a big bang point where the tachyons would pull in to the level behind it, right? Which in this case, because we're in the outer domains, would be the edon in the middle domains. And our bodies are key generation plants, and that is why they were hijacked in the first place, because we are quantum generators. And when we're functioning naturally, it is a very natural process, and after certain cycles, we can reach climax, <laughs> and we can go into a natural return to the garden for recharge, and come back out again, rebirth. We could do our own little personal starfire cycle. That's what sexuality was meant to do, even by yourself. It is really, really interesting when you combine two people, because there are some similarities and some differences between the male and female imprint. Both of them have the same configuration of the uh, umshadi with its uh, core ruche-shaped ruta template, the same would be here, same spark points. But there are different polarities, and we'll see that on the next one. Under natural circumstances, oh wait, I'm gonna read these to you first too. These spark points, the spark points are a little different. Obviously, we have a little bit different biology down there. On a man, you have, okay, the first four sparks. Remember, they're the outer octave ones. You have spark one occurs at the base of the penis. Uh, two occurs both in male and female at the coccyx, a little bit at the base of the tailbone. Um, three occurs, and I forget because it's been it's late and I don't have my anatomy book with me, the arteries that run down the legs, all right? Three and four, all right, there's four and there's three. These actually spark in the arteries, they spark the blood crystals, so it actually starts sending the frequencies into the physical blood, right? 
Right. The, so you have the three and four are the right artery and the left arteries that run down the legs, and I forget the name of them, but I'll get it eventually. What was it? Femoral. 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 Okay, thank you. <laughs> I didn't do biology, actually. <laughs> Not on this planet anyway. Yeah. Anyway, number five spark points. So you have five, six, seven, and eight are the next bits. That's where they come into where the harmonic currents are running. And you have the base of the scrotum on a male. On a female, five is, what does that say? If I can read my writing. Yeah, the vagina. Except it is the G spot. It's the outer front wall of the vagina, actually, up inside a bit, but the outer wall, all right, that is the natural G-spot, all right, and that is the same point as the, at the base of the scrotum there is that same spark point five. Now, um, both male and female, spark point six is here. It's in the rear portion of the rear wall of the anus, where if this circle up here is the anus and this is the spark point, it's in the rear part, all right. Now, the there are two ducts, and I forget what they're called. I had this, I think they begin with a V. Um, seven and eight. Yeah, I think, I think so, yeah. Uh, yeah, I have to look that stuff up, but I didn't even have the books or on a boat at the moment. But it's enough to know there are two ducts there, and you can look it up in an anatomy book, and if it's a decent one, it'll show you there are ducts of some sort there, or glandular type things. But they, our guys call them ducts. You have the right one and the left one. That's where seven and eight spark points are on both males and females. Then you have these, nine, 10, 11, and 12. These are called the, sh the shoddy chambers. These, these are what open the shoddy chambers that come through this way. They're actually pillars of currents that come through on the 45 degree axis. Um, these guys, they open through the template. So they would open through this way. And then when, they, when all that occurs, and meanwhile all these start to spin really, really fast, all of the little uh, individual pillars and currents that are connected to it start spinning really, really fast at, at their particular polarity and spin speed. And the disks, the outer one, spins clockwise faster and faster, and the inner one spins counterclockwise faster and faster until they reach specific speeds, and they probably go with the Merkabic speeds for each density level, I wouldn't doubt. <laughs> they haven't said that yet, but I'm just assuming. Um, so it's just a guess, but I think it's probably accurate. Uh, so as all of this is happening, you have, you're having sparks building, and this is what you're doing in the process. This is what you're feeling as you're feeling arousal, right? And the more arousal you feel, the more sparks you're making, the faster your pillar starts to pump, which means the faster your breathing and your heart rate start to go. So they're all connected. The arcs phasing start to go faster. The ethos pillar up and down starts to go faster. The spins start to go faster. The sparks start to go faster, right? right? And at a certain point, you get <laughs> right? You know, that sometimes you have to go, like, it, it, you go so fast, you go slow, and then you go so slow, you go really, really fast and turn into light and pop up in the Eden. There's a natural process of being able to go back home this way with just thinking it. You didn't have to, like, use plastic and stuff, you know? You really just had to think it and send energy there and it would feel good and warm and all fuzzy and it would, you know, your body do its natural thing. And you could also do it in sharing, which is a real joy because um, you get two or more than the sum of their parts. There is a level when you combined in true sacred sex and sacred love of beings who have their fields straightened out, there is a most amazing experience that you can experience, it's almost like the closest you can get in a manifest form of any kind of touching God or touching the consciousness, the full consciousness of source. There's, because it forms, the two light body cells form what's called the tri a Triveca unit, a living light unit. And they phase together and are capable of popping back in as one to source to actually experientially feel that cognition together. And that is a state that in any of the worlds that still have anything that resembles polarity combining that way, it is highly, highly prized. And once upon a time, even on this planet, there are races who, who understood that. And there'd be like days and days of preparation <laughs> of everything. So all, the energy was all perfect. And if there's anything like somebody had a headache that day, 
well, you just scratch it for that week or whatever, you know? It's like, it was too precious to rush. It was too precious to insult the whole process by, well, what they do here this, in, in this place with, with sexuality. You know, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, thank you, guy, whatever. I mean, this stuff is just brutal. <laughs> you know, it was meant to be transcendent. You were meant to be able to, you know, either go with yourself or even amplify that and go even higher together. And this is something we will get the ability to do back once we undo the damage that's been done. Now, the damage you'll see in a minute. But before we see that, let's look at the differences between the male and the female. We've seen these. Oh, all right, we got the we got through these nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. Once um, those currents open that run the diet, that run the 45 degree angles. Then they progressively pop 13, 14, and 15 is the one that runs around these. And that means your whole inner pillar opens. Now, sometimes it's for birthing, where something from the Edon is actually coming out, you know, to incarnate into a body pattern or something here. But it is opening the passage of transit between the, in, the middle domains of the Edons and the outer domains where we are, the manifest worlds out here. So it, they are the final three sparks, 13, 14, and 15. They're the Edonic sparks, Edonic D1. The D1 pillar opens, the atomic body gets to go. Uh, that's located on a male in the prostrate and in a female, the thing I still can't pronounce right, perineum. All right. And there's actually an indent in those areas. There's actually, if you get really sensitized with your partner or yourself, you could feel, you, you could actually put your finger through what appears to be solid skin because there is an opening in there once certain activations take place within the Umshadi. So there's actually a little orifice you didn't know you had you know, that's in those areas. And right now it's been fixated. That's why it, it's covered over as if it's not even there. But it will become, uh, the skin will still stay there, but it almost kind of like being a virgin, but on the outside of the body where there'll be a, a membrane there. But there will actually be something behind that. And that something behind that is where the pillar 13 currents will run. And that's also the area where this, now tomorrow when we talk about the, uh, the phasing of the tarin and the process of tachyon cycles, we'll find out about the gelesic states that are inside of a tarin unit. This three particae here and one in the center. You have three particae and one what is called a particae photogenerator unit that holds the natural gelesic states. This is the core out of which all manifest um, uh, subatomic particles and quarks and things are formed way before they even get to the outer domains. So right at the core of all of this, the fact that this is a monadic configuration implies that back a couple steps, there is one of these, a little tiny tarn, but it's the edonic tarn. And inside the edonic tarn, you have the edonic particle photogenerator. And way at the core of the particle, you have what is called the diamond door or the nada or the uh, diamond door of first creation. And it's when that opens that literally the entire structure can turn to light and transit at will. This is also where, as we get used to doing this, we not only got to get our sexual parts kind of like, you know, moving, we also have to get our minds moving because when you get this kind of power back, you need to have a bit more mental control than you do right now. If you freak out, if somebody like scares you or something and you really let your mind run away with you sometimes or if somebody hits you with psychotronics and you can go on like for a week get on a really downward spiral and nothing just means anything anymore and you get really grouchy and a whole bit. If you're still having those things, which most of us are on this planet, this power will come gently because if you had it, you, you're getting back the instant manifestation power. So you want to make sure you're manifesting things that you desire to manifest. Part of the things we have to do first is clear some of the teleosphere distortions that will manifest messes that we do not want to walk in our hologram. And as we get our, our power of core creation back, the hedonic creation power back, we will first use it and begin to use it as we get it back to create the process of the healing. And that's what we're going to do at the end of tonight. I'll show you what we're going to start the process of healing in a second. Let's go to the next one because I would like to show them uh, a little bit quick differences before my back collapses. <laughs> I think I'm going to sit down for this one. Something's activating. It must be soon. <laughs> I just went there and my back turned to cement suddenly. Oh, <laughs> excuse me. All right. Now, back to our guys and gals here. Uh, 
uh, yes, I would love one. Thank you. Okay, now, on this one, <laughs> this is stuff, this is just new to me too. I just learned this myself. Let's see if I did or not, or I almost learned it, I could say. Oh, wait a minute, now the heat's, excuse me. Jeez. Yeah, we definitely got incoming something, so if you feel anything weird, it's not just you. <laughs> All righty. Well, well, the cement went away anyway. It turned into a heat flash. <laughs> All right. Now, even though the structure of the Ruta pillars and the Ruta templates are the same for the Umshadi for both males and females, the frequencies that they are running are a bit different. Now, first we'll look at this, they call these the Ruta Edonic Transharmonic Keys to the Gates of Eden. This is what all this is about. Now over here we have, uh, I had to cut off part of the words, octave currents and chakras. Okay, these are the currents. These are the numbers that correspond to the numbers here. Now because we're looking at this at a funny angle, we got like one, two, three here, where if you were looking at a ruche this way, Right? If it was on you, you'd have your 12. If it was on you this way, you'd have your 12 and uh, 10 and 11. And then you'd have your 3 over here and your 1 and your 2. Because we're looking at it from the bottom, it gets a little weird. That's why I didn't even try to put the directions of spin. Because you're actually supposed to spin them this way, the one outside clockwise and the one inside counterclockwise. But if I try to show that on these diagrams, it'll look reversed. Or if you try to follow these diagrams, if I put it that way, when you do it this way, you'll say, wait a minute, your diagram's going in the opposite direction. And you'd be right, right? So I didn't put the spin directions exactly on there. But what I did do was show something that they broke chakras down in a fascinating way. And this is probably why they never heavily taught about chakras until they got through this. Because there's a specific way the chakras are supposed to, frequency they're supposed to run, and um, way they're supposed to spin. And they correspond to the spins that go with the ruta pillars. So we have the ruta currents and the pillars and that particular ruta number on the template it also corresponds to that particular chakra. Now, they're calling the base tone ruta currents and chakras 1, 4, 7, and 10, all right, out of the, the 12 spectrum, right, out of 1 through 12. So 1, 4, 7, and 10 are base tones. Now you'll see what that means in relation to male and female in a little bit. All right. Overtone or Gruel chakras uh, and Ruta currents are 2, 5, 8, and 11. Remember, they're the ones that if you looked at a Cathara grid, you'd have 2, 5, 8, and 11 running up the center, right? All right. And if you looked at a dimensional scale, you'd have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, the base tones, right? The first ones. All right, they're the overtones, the gruals, and you have the harmonic currents and chakras, the resonant tone root of currents and chakras, which are 3, 6, 9, and 12. Then you have the primal field currents and chakras, which are 13, 14, and 15. All right, now, once that's established, that we have bass tone ones, overtone ones, which are gruals, and when it comes to chakras, and we have resonant tone ones. I think here we go with cement again. <clears throat> Okay, let me try to get out of the way here too, but I need to sit for a minute. Okay, over here in the male, this is the configuration where you have one, all right, the, the, let's look at the inner ones. You have three, six, nine, and 12. Remember, this is the front, so six is in the front, and three is, uh, actually I have this, I think I have this reversed, I do. Uh, three should be, when you're looking down at it, three is, on the left. Okay, so I may have to adjust these. This was the left. This I may have to get undyslexic and check my whether I have my shield flipped or not. But it shows the configuration of the root of pillars and it shows that in a male or a manae gender, which could be an androge with a, a manae dominant, okay, and it could come out either, it could be male or female, right, but it's mostly in the male form. All right, in, the, in, in male biology, and I do believe a male biology pretty much implies it 
then there's, we'll have to find out. They'll tell us more eventually about those differences of where do androges and androges with this recessive and that dominant fit in or whatever. But in general, for male, who are running primarily more mani, the mani gender, um, the base tone, the currents and the chakras and the pillars or the templates um, would run, the, they would be the one, four, seven, and ten ones, right? The base tones are PCM base tones from the PCM side. That means the particum side, right? Our matrix, as opposed to the part of K side, which would be our parallel, right? So the male has base tones from PCM. That's what the black dots refer to, okay? Base tones are four, seven, uh, 10, and which one is it? One, I think, yeah, one, I have to color in one. One, four, seven, and 10. All right, now when we get to overtones, which are the gruel ones, are two, five, eight, and 11. They correspond to cathara centers two, five, eight, and 11, and chakras two, five, eight, and 11. All right, in a male, they in the PCM universe, which we are, um, it should be, the overtone currents are PKA overtones. So they have PCM, particum, base tones, and part of K, overtones, and they would be 2, 5, 8, and 11. So you have the 2, the 5, the 8, and the 11. Okay. When it comes to the resonant tone currents and chakras, and this gets important, where we've got, I think, I hope I have this one right, I think I do, um, 3, 6, 9, and 12, which are the inner ones, yeah, this is right, 3, 6, 9, and 12. On the male, they are supposed to be PCM resonant tones, all right, particum resonant tones. So the resonant tones and the bass tones are supposed to be from the particum side and the overtones and gruals are supposed to be from the parallel side or carry the coding of the parallel of this universe. Um, that would mean a D13 monad would be PC, uh, PCM monad for a male in the PCM universe should be a positive D13 with clockwise spin and that would give this configuration. Right? That's a natural set for a male. Can we move it over to the female, please? Thank you, honey. For a female, the ear gender, you'd have base tones, currents, and chakras 1, 4, 7, and 10 are PKA base tones. Females are carrying the base tones from the, the antiparticle side, right? The overtones are the gruals, and notice the gruals go with the D13 monad. Okay, so if you've got, if you're a female, it means you have a, a, D, a, um, a negative D13 monad, or not negative, but um, negative charge kind of clockwise. It corresponds to the PCM. All right, so we have 2, 5, 8, and 11 on the overtone currents, and they are PCM overtones. Now, remember the males had the PCM base tones and the PKA overtones, right? So we've got the overtones of the PCM, but the base tones of the PKA, and our resonant tones, currents and chakras 3, 6, 9, and 12 are supposed to be PKA, which means they have more of a base electrical, all right? They have a positive electrical, all right? They actually have both charged, but they have a bit more, if it was like one was positive and negative, it'd have an extra positive. The, the, these would have an extra negative with them, but they're actually like positive, negative, zero, plus whatever its extra kick is. And the extra kick is what we're showing here by, you know, showing whether it's the PCM or the PKA side that's being carried. Females carry the PKA side. The PKA side, the, the uh, part of K side, which are the parallel antiparticle codes, tend to have a bit more energy, more joule count. Okay, more radiation units. Female bodies store the jewels, <clears throat> and when they get mutated, they become fat and things. You know, where we put fat on in certain areas that, you know, um, men who are running manae tend to not put fat on in those areas, where women who are running irae tend to. Women who are running manae can usually balance it out pretty good, and some guys that are male but they're running irae will also put fat on in those areas. Has to do with jewels being twisted into something else, where they become 
um, calories and, and they become fat, what we call fat here, and lodged in the body. But anyway, well, that's another story that has to do with tachyons and what joules are, so I won't go there right now. But what I want you to understand is the difference between, even though we have the same um, configuration of the Umshadi template and that means the Rushate spirals, there are different types of currents running as far as PCM, PKA currents. And it's because of those differences that our currents would naturally plug into each other in a very organic way. Now, if we can move these together, back, back where I can see them together, please, honey. Thank you. Like, where I can see, yeah. Like, yeah, there we go. Okay. If you notice here, the male has, and remember, we have pillar 13, right? That would be where spark 13 happens. This would be pillar 14. All right, and this would be pillar 15 as far as the main vertical current running up inside. Because remember, you're looking at that dinner plate, but it's actually tilted like this in relation to your body, right? Okay, so here you have four PCM base tones here. This would be a PCM pillar, right? Over here, the same pillar is a PKA pillar, right? So if you notice, the PKA antiparticle and the PCM that would go with these dark ones, that would be like shaded in, that would connect. The particle and antiparticle would naturally connect. Here you have the D13 center point. The D13 monad male, it, monadic core, is a positive electrical. All right? In female, uh, it, it's, pos it's actually positive electrical PKA. And in female, it's, um, it's negative magnetic PCM. So again, they would be particle-antiparticle pairs. And the outer one, you would have the uh, same type of alignment. Even though you have this inner pillar here would be spinning counterclockwise, if you were looking down at it, counterclockwise for both, you're still doing a counterclockwise particle-antiparticle connection pillar. And the outside one, would do the same thing. The, the um, uh, frequencies would align where you have the D13 and 14 line up and create particle-antiparticle conversion on D1 and D2, and then the D3 body would phase in and the entire pillar would open and the pillar around the entire body would activate. The core flame would activate. The core flame or the fla flame of Rashala. And that's something we've talked about in the creation cycle that we'll review tomorrow. But this is how it's supposed to happen naturally. As, thing, as all of these phase and spark, and the more that, like, the attraction that you're actually feeling between you is carrying, particularly if you are, are twins or even remote twins, you will have very similar encryptions in, like, there are specific encryptions. There, these are the core that everybody has. But then you would have very individuated ones that have to do with your trip down from source all the way through what your incarnational heritage is. And you would have a twin that was your, your polar pair, where at one point you were whole, but in order to come to the next level down or out, you had to split. The Umshadi would actually hold your Edonic twin connection. And your Edonic twin may or may not be out here. It may, your Edonic twin may actually still be in Eden in the, in the middle worlds. And there would be attractions. So attractions are naturally, natural attractions would be between the shield coating and the natural um, part, uh, PCM, PKA connections that should be occurring in the pillars in, in, yeah, and in the sexual organs. All of these things, the, the Umshadi template sets the template for each of the dimensional shields, the ruta shields that go up each dimension, and those ruta shields are the, e the each dimensional level of the DNA template. They set the chemical um, instructions of how the body will manifest and upon which it will manifest. They set the gene code. And all of it is connected in to the first point of entry into the outer domains, and no matter where that happened for you, even if it was on like a completely different planet or star, you will still carry that point with you, and you still have it. But we have a problem with it at the moment. Next one, please. Yeah, I know. I missed that one. Yeah. These are the roughs. These were whipped off really fast, as fast as my little hands could go. I know. Yeah. 
yeah, there's still some like, a, yeah, he was pointing out that the little one needed to be colored in black on that one. It's like, yeah, I know. I also have to check for dyslexia and flipping that back and forth. But it didn't matter for what we were talking about on the diagram. At least you see the connection. That's why I'm not publishing any of this as far as giving chart packs or anything yet. I have to go through this stuff with a fine tooth comb to make sure, you know, I didn't like, you know, write down a wrong number or something before I put it out in written form. You know, but I, at least you get to see the graph so you can see the connections and, you know, kind of visualize them for yourself in your own bodies. Now, what, um, what when, when, the body is act, when the bodies activate naturally? Individual bodies create harmonic keys, and after a number of key cycles, they can generate enough keys to do a, um, I'd say hyperspace, but it's not. It's going superluminal and popping into the Eden. That would be going into this state of core flame activation, and there's a whole set of diagrams that go with these that show different stages of this. But what it culminates into is what is called the Christ star vehicle, the Christ star crystal capsule, and the core flame activation. And it also gives you, if you're here, the ability to levitate as well. You can decide what you want to do with your relationship to gravity on the planet. And you can go through solid things in this capsule and that kind of stuff. So once you get your sexual parts together, <laughs> this is part of what you have to look forward to as well. What's really nice is all by yourself, you're capable of once your currents are functioning naturally in connection with the base pulse rhythms of the Um Shadi Edonic Sidanam, you can enter this state yourself. But what's really, really neat is you can enter a state of, imagine this ha would have a big sphere around it, right? And that would be one huge um, edonic, able light cell that is you. Now, if you took another person that was also, their bodies were phasing naturally, and, and you put yourselves together in connection through the natural configurations of the Umshadis, you would actually create a third that is the identity of the two of you combined, and you'd still have each of you. So there would be the three. You would form a Triveca light unit, and it would create three, a, a three-pronged of these, like one, and another one, and then a big one that's the us, right? And you would know yourselves, both of you, as that being. It, you would be like an entity. And when in that state, just like a single person in this state can go into the Edons, um, there's another set of activations in the Edons you'd have to go through before you could get into the, um, the because the Edons are the middles, before you could get into the hub inner domains. That state would be the energy equivalent as if you put two of these together and they form that third. So with true divine sacred sexuality, a couple in true divine loving connection after they've straightened out their chakra system have the capacity to put these two together to form that third so they not only can just go into the edons but some of us can go all the way home to the hubs to the inner domains and for those who came from the adjacent matrix that a very long time ago that's where the wisa drax fell from uh, the wisa, wisa races both of them fell from there there is a non-falling group there that have been with us for a very, very long time. And they're one of the main guardian races that deal with Eartha. They're called the Aquari, A-Q-U-A-R-I. A whole part of their shield over in the adjacent matrix fell. They were called the Equary, with an E. And they become what were called the Dragoon races over here when they interface with this. They interface with the express purpose of our matrix to destroy the Metatronic entities, to destroy the Anu because it was the disease of the Metatronic Code that caused such destruction in their own matrix. Now, there's a whole bunch of healing missions and things going on that have to do with some of the remnant of the equerry who can actually make it home. And there are a number of them among us on this planet. And everyone has been touched by the equerry in relation to the dragoon races because of raids that were done on this planet at different times, and then biorigenesis that was done to try to help them. So there are some of us that the word aquari, A-Q-U-A-R-I, will have a particular feel for that it is the home that's been so long away, we almost forgot it was there. And the ability to combine 
fields with another of your kind, particularly a twin, in the divine coupling that we're going to learn more about a bit more tomorrow and then more in the Virginia Beach workshop. We'll be able to generate whatever they're going to call it. They haven't given the name of it yet, but this one is the Christ Star capsule. I wonder what the triple size one is, I don't know. But that is the one that's needed to be able to go all the way through into the hubs. That also has to do with which, um, which pathways to Eartha you'll take. Because there's something still left and that will remain that's called the rainbow thread that can still get you through into Eartha on a particular type of host with a bit lower base pulse rhythm if you can't hold the higher one. And then there's another set of portals that have to do, we know they're, they interface with Arizona and Colorado and a few other places that are for people who are going to activate the triple set. Now there's something that is, I, I don't know what it is yet, but it has to do with those who actually do as couples enter that state. There's a gift that is given to the planet, and I don't know what it is yet, but I can sense it there, and that's probably why they're teaching us sacred sex along with understanding the energetic stealth instead of like first teaching us elementals, then teaching us about that. Because there is some kind of gift that if enough of us are able in our coupling relationships to do that, there's something very positive that happens, and I'm not sure what it is, but it has to do with hosting, big hosting of maybe getting something through that wouldn't otherwise or something. So we'll learn more about that probably, hopefully by tomorrow's end. Um, anyway, this is what the natural configuration of even a single body is supposed to be able to do. You're supposed to fly around in this thing, go wherever you want to. It's just like a very joyful state of being. It's really funny because I'm getting practice with parts of this in some kind of Saudi state that I have to lay the body down to go into, but I'll find myself flying around in it and going, whoa. Neat. How do you steer this thing? You know, don't think too hard. Think quietly. Okay, okay, I'll think quietly. And I can feel the guardians with me, right? They're teaching me. It's like they're taking me out for my road test. Not quite yet, right? But there, we will start with learning how to do these projection states where you can start to get a feel for, for what it's like before you have to worry about having the whole physical body in it because I imagine that could be really challenging and somewhat dangerous if you didn't know how to drive it first. So anyway, this is the Christ Star capsule. That's the first objective. Uh, maybe by tomorrow we'll find out what its, uh, its um, triple set that comes through coupling, divine coupling, is. Um, can we see the next one? I think that's the one that shows the mess. Yes, okay, thank you. Yeah, the next one is the, the one where, this, this was the last one that I was, my, I was trying to get done before I was any later. That's the good news. This is the bad news. I'm gonna put my coat on for this one. I just got a wave of cold. Oy. Sorry about that. I really don't mean to do that, but I get really, really uncomfortable temperature-wise very quickly. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I'm leaving white out all over the microphone. <laughs> now, if you recall the configuration of the circle with the dots in it way back when we saw the gravitron, in the planetary diagrams that showed what was the twisted Ruchete spiral that became the Gravitron mess and the core template where it had one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five dots, right? This is a sextant interface shield that actually interfaces over the Umshadi and it twists and phase locks the it's, the, it's not that the umshadi is shifted, it's that the body shields are actually shifted 180 degrees and then 23.5, either right or left, depending on it's male or female. So it has shifted the entire chakra system and everything out of where our front isn't really our front, basically. Our front is supposed to be in line with the umshadi and it isn't. At this point, if you looked at this shield here, this would be this way. So if you were that guy, Laying there with that plate between your legs. <laughs> and your right hand is over here. And that shift is where it is over there. <laughs> okay. You need to shift it over that way. That's where your front's supposed to be. Right? <laughs> All right. So if you just get the idea. I mean, I, I can analyze this more later. But it's trying to show you that the, the, there, are five, uh, there are actually 
the inner spiral, and which is the 14. You have the 13 at the center. Then you have what would be the 14, pillar 14 and pillar 15. They're actually phase locked through this implant system that is running because it is in the planet Earth planetary core. And it's in the Earth template now and it's fully activated. So these are fully progressively activating. They've already been partially activated, but now all this stuff is fully activating, which I have no idea what that's going to do besides maybe turn us inside out once it's fully activated. I don't know, but probably turn us inside out and whip us down a black hole and then whip us back out. We're sort of right side out again. This has to do with the fall and about somebody orchestrating a fall and harnessing you so you could still be somewhat put back together when you got to the other side of a fall. That's what the Metatronic Code was meant to do. Um, we have these implants system. It's an interface shield that twists our entire Rishate spiral and our Ruta, dimensional Ruta templates out of alignment with the natural um shadi. That's why we can't open the passages anymore. It also does some strange things because of the polarity of them. In the male, you have, uh, um, I believe it's a PCM polarities running here in the four outer ones, and you have PKA ones running on the inside. The males are supposed to have those inside ones are supposed to be PCM frequency. What is created is an inside out, an inversion of the natural structure where you have the uh, clockwise antiparticle, double antiparticle running here in the center around the antiparticle natural 13. So you get a double electrical charge. This is what causes the violence mutation. It creates way too much electrical manna frequency in the male body, which translates into wacky chemical constructs in the male body. And it also tends to increase the male sex drive because it's, it's like hyperactive key generation that you can't stop, but they're not natural keys. They're what are called sextant keys. They have less quantum and they actually have a different shape than, a natural, than the natural crystal structure of an organic Christic key would have. So this is when I talked about the violence mutation. It's caused by this. It's an a electrical field, another a natural electrical field, harnessed by an electrical field inside of an electrical field, and it creates uh, an inversion of what's supposed to be there. That should be PCM frequencies, and what you got are antiparticle frequencies running there instead. And out here, where you should have the antiparticle frequencies running on the male, you've got the opposite. You have PCM frequencies running. And the female, it's not quite as bad, but it's uh, not, not that much better on the female. Same configuration, but turn inside out. Where here, they have the implants that are the PKA implants on the male. And remember, the PKA implants, PKA holds more joules or more radiation count. So what you got are implants in the male system that have more joule count, and that's why it's another reason why it's harder for the males. That's why they have so much electrical buildup down in those areas and the chemical you know, mutations that come from it. Now with the female, there's the same four inward, inner ones holding on to at an angle. See, they're actually crossing through the natural ones and holding the templates at an unnatural angle to them by those five anchor points, or five, one, two, three, four, five, and then it's actually five if you count it this way too. It's actually one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight implants around the natural structure. So on the female one, you've got PCM here when it should be the antiparticle ones that are running the inner, and you've got antiparticle out here, but this creates still, you have PCM, um, this is still supposed to turn counterclockwise, where it didn't reverse the spin and charge, because this ended up getting reversed with, the, with, with it, I forget, I, I can't explain it right now because it's a bit complicated, but males ended up with the inversion of the two, where females ended up with a double magnetic charge, but it didn't cause a full inversion because the inner pillar is still spinning counterclockwise as it's supposed to where the males actually flipped over and went clockwise, and that made the outer pillar of the male flip over and go counterclockwise, where the female just ended up with like a double magnetic field, and the two magnetic fields rubbing on each other create not as strong a charge, but an errant electrical static charge that is the charge that translates into chemicals that will actually kill 
natural Christic sperm, so that progressively our bodies have been activated into this so we can progressively birth um, metatronic races and not be able to birth Christic races. It's not, the mutation isn't fully, fully set yet or we wouldn't still be talking about it. There wouldn't be any hope of pulling us out of it, but it's very, very close and that's where the races that fall will go they are turning into a new species. They are turning into a species where that template will no longer be connected. They will no longer be connected to the, their own Umshadi template. And they will be running on the Metatronic template and their light body structure will follow what is called, I believe, the seed of Metatron or the demon seed structure. So it is a completely different species that was formed out of forcing a uh, light body mutation on you know several types of species on this planet, angelic humans and indigos being one. This has also happened to all of what were original um, natural animal forms on this planet and plant forms as well. They have their own version of this. That they are, <laughs> it's kind of like Noah's hijack arc, <laughs> except it's not Noah that's doing it, it's Metatron's crew. but. This is orchestrated black hole fall in order to take the life forms from one system and bring them into another. And we're at the end of this, this particular story. We're at the end chapter. And at least we can still get out. And it's nice to know that that is there. So what we are going to do, there is going to be one activation. They say it's not going to run very long, but it's going to be there and it needs to be set before we get into tomorrow afternoon stuff because I think I'm going, to try, I'm going to try to show up by 7 tomorrow. I have to do it all tomorrow's whole program when I get back, right? So like, there's no sleep time, but I'm going to try not to be late, 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 like we were tonight. But at least we got to the big stuff that they wanted to show you, which was supposed to be tomorrow night, I thought. But I guess I just misunderstood how it was going. I didn't know. They didn't tell me. But we are going to begin the process of clearing this sextant interface template from the Umshadi. What has the power to do that is the Umshadi seed atom itself. And I don't know what the meditation is yet, but we're going to run a simple meditation. They said it will only be about five minutes. But if you want to take a bathroom run, it would probably be a good idea if you need to. But only if you need to. So do a five minute and then we'll come back. You could put the, the two codes, up, or the one code up first, please. Just so they see. Before you go out, just take a quick look at this one. Just to see, is it up in the right way? Yeah. <clears throat> we're going to start with that and then they're going to do something with the Edon with it. Okay, and we're going to do a visualization and optical pineal induction, and I have a feeling more than optical pineal, but I don't know how that works yet. <laughs> okay, so you can do a quick bathroom run, and we'll come right back. We'll do that, and then I'll let you go so you can get some sleep. Okay. Do two things. It starts... Where? Where does it start? Hello. Um, starts down. Okay, down where? All the way on that side? No, down further. Oh, okay. They're saying start it down at the little akasha, way down at the bottom of the other code. The center of the 1728 needs to align with that little purple akasha. Right. Okay. <laughs> You're perfectionist. <laughs> You're perfectionist. I like that. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> All right, now, um, that little guy down, way down there. We start here, right there. The center of that bit needs to be in the center of there. So you literally just got to take it almost all the way up. Center got to go up, 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 up. Uh, more up, more up, more up. Okay, <laughs> I'm just trying to help. <laughs> right there, bingo, there we go. Bullseye. Okay, now what we're going to do is they're going to move it there. The next place they're going to move it is to Cathara Center 12 point, which is, I believe, at the feet 
of the little, don't, you don't have to move it yet. You can just keep it there for now. But just so you know, the next movement will be to work with our center 12 would be like right you know, up there. And then there'll be a set of something they have us do there. <coughs> then it'll go all the way up to the top at the center of the Tribeca Shapey up there. Okay, of the code way up at the top. Okay. The, the third station will be that, see the center of that bit? Star thing there. That goes in there on the third. No, no, we keep going. Yeah, right to there. Over this way, it's right there. <laughs> I know, I know. Other way, that way. <laughs> this is gonna be fun. Oh, yeah, we, yeah. That that's almost there. Yeah, close enough to hold the math ish. Yeah. Yeah, there we go, bullseye. All right, so that's three. And then there's going to be a point where they're going to have us. We're going to be visualizing. This is to give you, like, the visual, the, the code reference in the math, you know, like, so you can see it. And then you can, like, close your eyes and just, like, hold the energy signal. Don't worry about trying to see, like, you know, recreate in your mind the picture you just looked at. Kind of like... When, when we start, they'll have us breathe it in at whatever station it's at, right? And this isn't the first station, so don't breathe it in yet. And we'll, we'll breathe it in and into the pineal. And then um, they're going to have us move it around just as an energy signature. And I think they may just give it like a... There, there's going to be some shape <laughs> that's, that means all of that. But you've got the imprint of all of that. So you've got the math running. And then there will be some image they use, a small image, like a dot of something probably. And you'll be moving that in connection with it. And when we move to the next station, then you need to like open your eyes and breathe in the next set of maths that go with it. And then again, they'll have us do something with it. And then for the third one. And the final one, um, we'll, our movement will be faster then we can move the picture because once we're up at this point there's going to be a thing we do and then they'll have us blow down really hard with the with the whatever the control is the key is that we're going to be using and it'll actually be taking that image and moving it all the way down to um, where it's centered on uh, where your chakra um, not chakra your uh, cathara center one would be on the D2 grid so this one's actually going to go down to the knees all right. Just remember the D2 cathara grid. We had the point of that comes down in between the knees. So they're going to have us run that, and then we would take. As we'll, we'll ask you to take this and put it all the way down at cathara center one, right on there. That will be the last station. And after we'll already have done that movement, like have gotten it down there. But then there'll just be a breathing, opening, opening your eyes and like looking at it and breathing it in to get the rest of the math from that after the fact because the movement has to go faster than what we can move. So some, it's something to that effect. So well, I, I do believe we're probably going to get a Zara in on this one. I have a feeling. Yeah, it's uh, uh, it's starting. It starts way down at the little at, at this. Yeah. So that's one. Then K12, then Lotus, and then one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, I think they're going to give a little preamble here on what is this doing. <laughs> okay. All right, this first part is to initiate the process of opening the Edonic diamond door which is the, the, the core tube at the center of the Edonic seed atom and opening the passage between that level of your um, middle domain anatomy and the outer, you know, the outer domain physical body. So it's, it's opening the core passage, uh, first of all, between the outer and the um, middle domains, the outer and the edon, and um, it's picking up the maths that would be if you ascended the long way and went up 
and then went up through the Eka, and then went up past there, up into the Akasha, into the Akasha A, and the Akasha Aya. You would pick up a whole set of certain codes. By the time you picked up natural codes that were yours, but you would activate them in your shield as you went up. And when you finally got to the top of outer ascension, you would have all those codes activated, and they would give you the base of the uh, transharmonic Edonic keys, the Ruta keys that were needed to enter the Edon. So what we're doing by using the Voyager code, which is a compilation, we've used this before, to you know, activate rapidly the um, ascension sequences in the natural shield structure, the natural light body structure. It is, by using that, and with the Edon, it is, it is keying the natural codes into the natural Edonic pattern to allow for the opening of the door that would naturally occur only after you went all the way up to the top of the outer creation before you could then go in to the next level. So it's something that's done when any being, for whatever reason, is going to be allowed back into the Edons from the outer world. So it can be done from a density level like it's being done from here, or it can be done from an echo level, you know, in systems that are functioning better than this one. So this is the beginning, and it is a code that is, because it's kind of like when that door pops open, it's like a, right, a spiral of energy, like a pop with a vacuum that pulls, right? So imagine there's going to be like a, a pulling sensation where you can actually feel a little bit in your central vertical current as if a, a tube opened and there's actually a little tug on it, like as, as if it's pulling you back, you know, starting to go back into home where that little little um, space in the center, the diamond doorway opens and in the Edonic level and it allows the beginning of the keys for the, the, the Ruta keys to activate, which would be the cores of each of the 1728s, which hold the full key package for each of those. There are levels of keys that usually take long time cycles to manufacture in the body, just naturally, through the process of the natural sexual energy exchange that should be taking place between your Edonic, you know, your Edonic parts and your outer manifestation parts. This is a way to expedite the activation of the keys by activating their core key encryptions. And this is new to me too. <laughs> but there's something, because of the uh, magnetic peak that we're still riding through tonight, um, it's the peak of the magnetic peak. Magnetic peak is when you get the strongest pull. All right, so that means like the pull backward towards source. So it is the best time to open that doorway because you'll get the strongest back pull, which means you'll get the strongest return because after you get the back pull, tomorrow there will be an outflow from the Edonic levels that will, for people who were in Denver, who already started the activation of the Umshadi, it will expedite that and begin its entering its next level, and hopefully we'll know what that is by tomorrow, what the next level of this activation is. For people who weren't in Denver, it will start the process quickly for you, where you can catch up with, you know, you can, it would like catch you up from Denver, at least on the subharmonic level, enough to hold what the next level is that we'll all do tomorrow, and we'll find out more about what that is and what to expect next, basically. <laughs> all right, so um, <coughs> if I start talking funny, um, those of you who are new, uh, it is, just so you know, I don't channel, but there is a level of my own consciousness that's called Azara that's stationed, you know, much, much higher in the higher domains. And when that level of me interfaces with this level of me, I end up sounding like I have a Transylvanian accent or something. And that, that's, it's funny, you know, because I'm, I'm still me, but I'm communicating from a, a much higher space. And when those spaces interface, it just comes out funny, like an accent of some sort. So if you hear that, don't think it's weird and don't think we're endorsing channeling because we don't. If you ever have that, you know, we, there's a difference and, and I, I'm hoping in the, the uh, 12 tribe classes we might start to understand that difference a little better where I can teach people how to do this with your own self but not get hung up in somebody else channeling through you and taking over your body, that kind of thing. So it's all right to let your own self speak out your mouth but we suggest not letting anybody else do it basically. <laughs> so if I sound funny. And I hit my Azara level, just, it's another part of me saying hi. <laughs> okay. Ow. Oh. Okay. I don't know if that'll happen or not, but just in case. <sighs> mm. 
Okay, and they're saying for those of you who, who know how, activate your Saudi Seda spheres. For those of you who don't, just a simple quick activation of Mahark Pillar, if you know how to do that, Mahark Seal, whatever is the last thing you learned as far as how to activate something, because you'll pick up the rest of it from the group shield if you want it. If you don't want to participate in the activation, simply put out the intention that you're not ready and you don't want to do that, and you will just simply not receive the frequencies from the group shield. It's never inflicted on you. All right, now breathe gently and open your eyes for a moment and look at the image that is on the uh, board and focus your attention on the center point of the Edon cluster, the little center point. Just try to relax your vision a bit and breathe gently and imagine each inhale breath is bringing just a wash of colors holding that math to you. Just try to breathe in the pretty colors of the image. And then just for a moment, try to look at that center point and cross your eyes and breathe in hard once. <laughs> the eye crossing brings it in on one optical current as opposed to a polarized reversed one. And then just exhale gently and relax. Now you can close your eyes. And we're going to move this image. We have just brought this image in through the eyes. And that means it has entered the pineal at the center, the brain center. So imagine now that there is a very pretty pale, pale pink dot at the center of your pineal. And surrounding that dot, there is a pale gold sphere. That image of the small pale pale pink dot with a small gold sphere, sphere around it will be the key image we use to move the entirety of this mathematical equation through the body. We will have you now inhale that small key, I will call it the key from now on, Inhale and draw the key up to chakra 14, way up above your head, 36 inches above your head. Hold it there for a moment. And then send it down on one fast breath all the way to earth a core. And pause with lungs empty at the bottom of the exhale. Then slowly breathe it back up, bringing the key with you up to the Azure slowly. When you reach the Azure, stop the inhale at that point and just hold for a moment. Now do a rapid finish the inhale and pop up the key all the way up to chakra 14. And bring it down slowly with the breath just to the top of the head as if it is sitting on the top of the outside of your head. Release the key there for a moment and just breathe gently and normally. Okay, would you move the key to the next position you have already? <laughs> Very good. All right. All right, now if you would open your eyes a moment. And again, observe the image where it has moved to its second keying position. Again, just breathe in a few breaths with the eyes in normal focus. And then breathe in a quick, sharp one while crossing the eyes into the pineal. And up just a bit to the top of the head where you left the key. Hold for a moment, leaving the key where it is on the top of the head. Just gently relax the breath. Now, with the attention again inside, 
your, close your eyes. Focus your attention on your Azure and simply breathe in and know your arcs are going up, phasing up. As you breathe into the Azure, as if you're filling the Azure, imagine a ball of pale gold energy is now filling the Azure to where it's filling the entirety of your body cavity where your lungs are in the area. Now pop up quick to get the key from the top of your head. Bring the ball up and then bring it down with the exhale right down to your private parts and leave it there. Leaving the key and the golden ball there. Breathe easily and gently. And imagine now, if you are, uh, if you are a girl, imagine that the key is now going in to the top part of the outside of your genital area, in your clitoris area. Pull it in just a little, and let it be there. If you are male, let it do this to the base of the penis. And then let it be there. Now we are going to energize and activate the key so it begins the process of phasing of the Um Shadi Edonic Seed Adam with your attention at the spot where you left the key. Try to feel a bit of fuzziness there where it is. See if you can feel a little bit of sensation. Some will, some won't. Don't worry if you don't. But you're going to breathe from that spot now. Imagine, instead of just breathing from your lungs, you're actually going to put your attention down to that spot where the key is. And when you inhale, imagine the key and the sphere around it expands and forms a ball about the size of a tennis ball, right in that area, part of it inside your body, part of it extending out. And, then, and when you exhale, Imagine that it contracts and gets really tiny in the same place again. Inhale and expand the ball. Exhale and contract. And one more. Inhale. Expand. Hold it there for a minute and see if you can feel the sensation of a large warm area the size of a tennis ball expanding in that area of your private parts. And then contract it back. Now just breathe normally and gently and imagine that the inner part, the pillar 14 aspect, of the Um Shati begins to spin slowly counterclockwise for both male and female. That means spin it from the front of you over to your left, then around your back, coming that way around. So from front to the left hand would be counterclockwise. Let's breathe gently. You're going to take three acceleration breaths, and each one make the spin counterclockwise of the inner pillar go a little bit faster. We will go inhale, hold, then exhale, push, and spin faster. Okay? Inhale, hold, and push, spin. Inhale and hold. Push spin. <laughs> Inhale and hold. Push and spin. <laughs> and just breathe normally. Now we'll do one set of three breaths for the outer pillar. 
that will go clockwise. That will be from the front over to the right hand. And remember that the counterclockwise one will still continue to cycle now. It will spin counterclockwise. And every time it spins counterclockwise, it will create pulsing in the key that is located in that area of your private parts. So try to be aware of the sensations. Next, we'll inhale. Exhale and push the outer clockwise. <laughs> inhale quick. Push fast. Inhale quick. Push fast. And let it be. Now breathe gently and normally, and we can open our eyes as we watch. Again, we'll move to the third station. The third station is a set of frequencies that connects through your chakra 14, 36 inches or so above the head. So we are going to draw a breath in from the azure. And as we draw the breath into the azure, we're going to also pull the key up from the genital area up to the azure, and we're going to do breath and key all the way up to chakra 14 and leave it there. So look at the image. Couple of gentle breaths. Cross the eyes once. Bring it in sharply. Send that image down to the key. Now breathe from the azure. Exhale, I mean inhale upward and bring the key up to the azure. And continue inhaling upward, up to chakra 14, and exhale and leave the key there. Imagine now that the key is spinning like a little ball up at chakra 14. And just leave it there. We will breathe naturally now for a moment. In this last set of activation, we will rapidly, we won't do it yet, but we will rapidly use the breath to bring the key all the way down. We will bring it all the way down to what would be the Kathara 1, the D2 Kathara 1, which will be a spot between your knees. Now, it doesn't matter if you hold your knees together or not. Just imagine a spot that would be between them. If you were sitting normally, a spot right between the knees. We're going to do this sharply, like quickly, sharp breath downward in a minute. And once we get it there, we'll bring it back up just a little bit. And then we'll explain what to do, because that will be the point where you enter the Om Shadi. The place of entry, after we get the key down to between the knees for the males, it will be bringing it up from the knees up into the prostrate area of your body. And for the females, it will be bringing it up to the perineum. All right, now, just breathe gently for a moment or two more. We're waiting for a grid um, activation to move with us here. Yeah? Inhale gently upward from the azure all the way up to chakra 14 where the key is. And hold at chakra 14 for a moment. In one quick rapid breath, pull the key down to the knees. <laughs> Leave the lungs empty there at the knees with the key at the knees for a moment. And now pull it up into that spot. Hold the breath for a moment. And push the breath out horizontally in all directions. <sighs> Release the key now in your mind. And return your attention, your visual attention, to the final image. And simply draw in the map. Cross the eyes just once and pull it in on a single current. 
to the pineal. Hold the inhale for a moment at the pineal with the mat and then bring the imprint of the mat all the way down, slowly breath down into that spot where you left the key. And do a simple cleansing breath. Your biofields are now ready for the next stages of activation. There will be somewhere within the next two hour period, you may be sleeping, that's all right when it happens. It may wake you up, it may not. But there will be a very subtle pop sound. It will be the opening of the diamond door at the center of the Um Shadi, an opening that will allow a current of energy to link directly in to your Rishate spiral and begin the process first through the 13th pillar, the center part, to begin to restore the polarity to the natural angle. And it will begin the process of first we will do the center pillar, the next it will begin the process all in its own of beginning to transmute and bring back to this normal configuration the distortions that are holding the spark points in the physical genitalia at hostage of the sextant template. It will begin transmuting this. You may feel warm, warm fuzzies down there. There should be no pain at all associated with this particular level of activation unless you happen to be a blue or glowed flame runner particularly because they tend to anchor it and get hit with the full brunt of it first. And that's what we're here for. We step it down for you, the blue and the gold and the violet. So if you see us having lots of aches and pains, um, just be happy that we, <laughs> we are downstepping it in a way that you will have less. The aches and pains are simply um, the body is being pushed a bit beyond its natural, its usual frequency holding capacity within the framework of the mutation. That is the only way to purge the mutation out is to push it a little bit at a time, and that's what these activations have done for the last number of years, progressively build the ability in the body to hold activations like these. This will be gentle and subtle. You may find um, interesting dream times. Just remember to keep the intention that when you have what you call dream experiences, they are really no different than physical experiences. If you have anyone come to you for sexual engagement in the dream state, just realize that it is no different than if they came to your door and you let them in and did so here. You must protect your fields because astral sexual infiltration of fields is very, very common among particularly various branches of the Mediterranean races and they are very body snatch hungry right now because of where their particular trauma is going. So be very, very careful. It's fine to feel sexual feelings, but try to actually keep it all in the physical, which means don't let yourself have those funky fantasies and stuff because you're actually inviting things in that you don't realize are attaching. It's okay to do the sex thing, but bring it down in here and you know try to find a partner that is the right one and you can work, work your fields in, in protection with, which we'll teach you a bit more about too tomorrow. This is the beginning of clearing the mutation there. Some people have been clearing it the hard way, where they've been having problems in those areas recently, where everything from cervical issues to you know female problems up in there to, to male problems too in those areas. And this is part of the purging and clearing, and that will go away. When you purge this way, it's not just the karmic pattern firing it, firing it random, whatever comes next is just there. This is more organized, so you shouldn't have symptoms like you're not all of a sudden going to like you know develop like a huge tumor down there because you started to purge unless you happen to have one there already and didn't know about it because these are simple, gentle 
clearings that will order it in, in a natural harmony with your body. There will be two more levels of this activation tomorrow. One involves a code that you've seen only in black and white, and it needs to be colored tonight, so we will do our best with the colored pencils. Um, but it is a journey called Return to the Unisai, and it will give you the ability to run certain frequencies that will allow you to participate in Rashalaitalia healing and also to pass that on to others. So this was the beginning of that. And this activation tonight is synchronized with the cycle of the peak of the magnetic peak that we are in. And uh, we will let you go at that. And you can sleep or whatever you want to do. Uh, don't be afraid to touch yourself either. It's all right. <laughs> it's like you don't, just because you activate it there, you don't have to like do hands off. If that's your thing, you, it's okay. But just, just realize where you're aiming for it. And I'm heading to Eden. <laughs> all right. All right. So have a good night, and thank you for your patience this evening with all of us. We'll see you tomorrow. We will try for, we will try for 7. We will try for, for 7, no, 7.30, because your dinner runs 6.30, I think. Um, we'll try for 7.30, because we don't want to keep you up this late again on Monday, because it's a, you have to go home. So thank you again for your patience, and we will see you tomorrow. Thank you again for your patience. At least it's not four in the morning. We have an interesting presentation tonight. I had to get a bunch of words put on a bunch of mylars that I partially had that had no words on them. And uh, I was fascinated by the time the words came because I learned things that I had no idea. Sometimes it's funny because I'll get the pictures and I'll have an idea of what the pictures mean. But then when the words come, it's like I had no idea really what the pictures meant. And it's one of those evenings. At the end of this evening, sometime in the morning, hopefully not by breakfast time, like hopefully for their sleep time, um, we're going to go through the other activations, and they've actually added one more in, instead of just the other two that we were promised, there is one more. I'm really excited about these activations because the names of them are, are quite fascinating. The one that we did last night was basically what we did was we opened the diamond door of the Um Shadi Eden Seed Atom. And that prepares the way for the other activations. The one we were going to finish with, uh, the set we were going to finish with is uh, a journey called Return to the Unisai. And it involves three codes, which I had to color. They're rudimentarily colored because I don't have the computer to do it. I had to do them with colored pencils and then try to print them on the little portable printer we have. So they're not perfect, but they're enough to hold the color frequency. Um, we will use three of those, and this begins a process that creates what's called an encryption. All right, now some of you know what the word encryption means. It refers to the gelesic, um little points of gelesic, um substance that are inside particae that actually hold the creation imprint from the first particae onward. Everything has an encryption. It can also be understood as its core vibrational signature. We are going to do an encryption using three of these codes that has to do with the unisci, which is the inner domain's seed atom. And from that, we are going to be able to do something called activating the Rosetta code. <laughs> yeah. Think about the stone, right? <laughs> Think about Rosicrucians and what they were twisting, <laughs> right? <laughs> there, there are two spellings of Rosetta. One is R-E-U-Z-H-E-T-T-A. This refers to a certain configuration within the core and inner starborn cycle. Then the R-H-O-S-E-T-T-A, Rosetta, refers to the middle and outer equivalent of what this thing is, and the two of them together are referred to as the R-O-S-E-T-T-A code, the Rosetta code. Now, just like we have the Christ code, which is the core imprint or encryption for eternal life, for perpetual motion, eternal life, first creation, from the Christ code evolves what is the Rosetta code. And this is something I had no idea about, but the Rosetta code is the core elemental root cell code. It is the code that, from the first sets of creation that you will see as we go through the starborn sequence a bit, you will see that there is this particular cell cluster that is created. And in the inner, 
levels, it is called the Rosetta. And that cell cluster phases perpetually and it creates what are called particle phase currents. This is where Chalet light units come from, the Tribeca configuration of living Chalet light units. And it is from these, these are the elemental command core um, root cells that continually produce the currents that create the outflow in a manifestation and the backflow back into source. When we activate the Rosetta code, the natural Rosetta code in our bodies, it very rapidly creates what's called Talia healing. We will bring it up through the um, um Shadi seed atom and Idan seed atom, bring it up into our outer seed atom and bring it into our Talia spheres in our crystal body. And that will realign in the crystal body the distortions in the axiotonal and meridian lines and it will come right down into the axiotonal and meridian lines in the physical body. And that will allow all the chakras to readjust to their natural core pattern on the Rosetta, the natural Rosetta pattern, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's exciting, it's a big one. And talk, talk about like blowing about three, million, three billion years of karma out instantly. I mean, this, I do believe, will wipe out part at least of the memory banks that have to do with the fall. And I'm talking about memory that's stored in there. Not that you will forget it existed, but you will no longer have the pattern going on autopilot where the elementals are fulfilling that pattern over and over, repeating the same karmic pattern, which is the fall drama. So it is literally beginning to free ourselves. After, this is the exciting part, after we do that, if that wasn't exciting enough. <laughs> this is the little extra one that they added. It's actually technique four because we have technique one that we did last night. Technique two will be doing um, the return to the unisci in order to enable us to pick up the Rosetta Code. Technique three will be picking up the Rosetta Code and doing the, uh, the uh, what's called Rashale Chakra Talia healing. Then, technique four will be doing what is called opening the glory hands of the sacred heart. Yeah, now, when we go through the diagrams, when we go through the, the bit that I have for you tonight, you'll understand what I'm referring to when I speak of the sacred heart passage. It has something to do with specific configuration of energy in certain parts of the anatomy going from the core to the inner to the middle to the outer. And once we have the Rosetta Code, the natural core elemental code, the, the, the Christic elemental code reset in the bodies, we will be able to, well, once that happens, it will realign the axiotonal lines. Once that happens, then for the first time ever on this planet, we are going to be able to activate what are called the glory hands. The glory hands are where the tips of the chakras on the fingertips as well as the palms activate these core and inner frequencies and they create little flames and the flames are small versions of the large flames that you will see that are part of the encryption codes that we'll use. Once we have that we will be able to pass on the Rosetta encryption. So in any healing applications that we do, even remote which we'll eventually be learning how to do so we don't have to like, you know, have people come all the time. We can, we can do it remotely even through like photographs or whatever, that kind of thing. We'll be able to pass on the Rosetta encryption and what that will do is for them, it will stimulate activation of the Um Shadi. So if there's anything left within their, their light body structure that can anchor crystal spiral, they will be able to begin the process of doing it automatically through a, a host, through the Earth a host and through the Indigo Shield host. So it's really exciting what this is going to, yeah. <laughs> so hopefully it was worth the wait this weekend. <laughs> yeah, and that was a mouthful. Because <laughs> what, what, they just told me this, right? As I got through all these graphs, finally got the graphs done. I was so exhausted. I don't know how I'm going to go down there tonight because I am absolutely burned out. And there were th there's still four to color, right? Because I just had all the words done on all the other ones. So I took a 15-minute nap, her power nap, and got back up and was functional, which is nice. I did ask for help. Help, <laughs> right? please, I'm falling apart. My body's gonna croak, <laughs> you know? So I felt better, got the coloring done and came down. And right before I came down, they threw this at me. So it's in one of those like scribble frameworks. <laughs> right? But that is the end of this workshop. And there'll be live activations that'll be done and eventually we'll be able to pull them off the tapes, you know, to get the transcripts of them. But I'm excited about where this is going. Here we go with the heats already. Um, well, what I'm gonna do is start with some of the information that I told you that we were going to cover yesterday. We do need to touch base on the tachyon cycle again and I have those charts finished and the 
what, I, I'm not, I'm not going to spend an hour going into what happens before this. For people that are new, it is on the Denver tapes, um, there are certain sequences in the manifestation transduction sequence. When you start with source, and source had an idea once upon a time, <laughs> that idea was to create manifest creation. It starts with the first partikai. Before we have a first partikai, there was the pre partikai stage and how that first partikai formed. We're not going through that whole set of many, many graphs that are still under progress, but we've talked about it before and it is, you know, it is kind of like run down on the Denver tapes. After we have the birth of the first partikai, then of course there's the birth of the second partikai, and that sets in motion um, the partikai phasing that creates what is called the first unit, which is the triad. It is partikai one and partikai two, but when partikai two births through the creation point into the center of partikai one, it splits partikai one into two. And that splitting begins the first phasing, which is the two split units are still attached to partikai 2 that is at the creation point, they phase back together, make a spark, that spark is a backflow spark, it comes back up into creation point with partikai 1, they both go back into creation point, rebirth, and split partikai 2, which actually splits up. This is where we get the creation of atomic, which are split down from partikai 1 currents, and etheric, which split up from partikai 2 split currents. That's where atomic and etheric currents originate. It is from that point of partikai 1 and partikai 2, and the triad, which is actually two partikai, but one splits into two smaller units, which is the partikai and the particum. They each have names, they have vibrational signatures. All right. That is the point, that is the beginning, what is called the first creation starborn cycle. So after we get there, I'm going to, when we, to get to this configuration, I'll explain in a minute what, how we get from that first partikai triad to here. I will do that briefly. There are basically, you could do about 20 graphs for before you had partikai 1, for once you got partikai 1, how'd you get partikai 2, and then from once you have partikai 1 into what is the process by which they phase and create the first living light seed, which is the taran unit. This unit is called the Taran unit, and it is the first phase generator cell. So we will start with this particular part of the manifestation transduction sequence because it will take probably like four more hours just to go through the first two stages, and it is covered elsewhere. So I'm going to start here, and I'm going to take my coat off because here we go. <laughs> Let me hold this, please. Yeah, you too. I'm not going to read every word on these charts, but if you want to and you can, feel free. I'm going to paraphrase them because the most important thing we need to get to, see, <laughs> this is just the beginning <laughs> of a process, a series of graphs that involve a process that I understood part of when we went through it in the Denver workshop, but there's a whole other part of that had to do with the words that weren't on those graphs yet that has to do with these flames we're activating. So we will go through those with a bit more you know, in-depth attention. So it's going to take a while to do this, but it'll be worth it because by the time we get to the end, you will see where this fits in with the things we covered yesterday which have to do with the Um Shadi and the sexual parts and the distortion that is being held in those regions and you'll see w where these activations will give you back the ability to run the axitonals the right way in the glory hands and you'll see where it started from and it's funny all of this is about sacred sex because sacred sex is about what is happening with energy in the physical bodies, either alone or when they combine. When orgasm happens, be it alone or with someone, it has to do with key generation. And if you don't know what keys are, it's not going to make much sense to you. So when we go into the series of um, steps or technicals, on the creation of the taran and then what the taran living light seed, first living light seed does, that is where we get into tachyon cycles and understanding what a tachyon cycle is. It is a ta ki yon cycle. It is a ki generation cycle. So we will look at those a little bit more in depth so that we understand, even when we come to the point of manifestation here in the physical, when we are phasing the um shadi, when the chakras and the natural body parts are working in the way they're supposed to be, there would be a natural cycling of key generation and at certain points there would be a buildup of keys 
where the frequency would build and then you hit something called the flash point. The flash point is the point where you would be able to have enough frequency or key generation to actually pop through to the next level in. And in terms of a particai, this is just the first living light cell unit that every manifest structure's light body is actually built on, including the cosmos. It starts with this, but that same process is echoed in every little light cell, tri uh, Triveca light cell, which has three units and a central unit that is different than the other three. Every little Shalaya light unit also phases and functions in the same way, which means it is capable of creating manifestation. These are the core things behind the Big Bang concept as far as, okay, well, what got together to make the Big Bang in the first place? There is a Big Bang point, and there is one for the core and inner worlds, and then another one for the middle and outer worlds, where they kind of go together. The core and the inner have a cycle of what are called the full days of creation. Now the days of creation, there are, I believe, 15 days of creation between the core and the inner, and then there are another 15 between the, or it's a repeat of the cycle, going into the middle and then into the outer worlds. And part of the, the end part of those cycles is this pop, 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 six days of creation, but six days are actually the last six of the 15 set. And the first 15 set starts with Partikai 1 and Partikai 2 in the formation of the triad. And the second part of that is when the triad forms this, which is the living light seed. So we will start with the Taran living light seed. All right, the Taran living light seed, eternal life, Akasha, God seed. Now, on the cosmic level, first creation was set in motion with this. The Taran Living Light Seed. All right, the Taran Living Light Seed, Eternal Life, Akasha, God Seed. Now, on the cosmic level, first creation was set in motion with this after Partikai 1 and Partikai 2 phased. Through the process of this phasing, if you think of this is the creation point, you have Partikai 1 was born, which that is a whole other process that other workshops will deal with and we have covered it in the past. All right, Partikai 2 emerges from the consciousness of source into the consciousness field of source. This isn't something source put away from itself. It's like a point of attention in the vast, um, limitless consciousness field that is source. Source created its own body, its manifest body, as a thought form within its own expansive um, mind, you could say. It is in the mind of God, but it is also the consciousness field of God, or the complete unified field. So, first creation, and the only real eternal creation, takes place as a thought form that emerges in, in, from the mind of God, in the mind of God, um, from which Partikai 1 emerges, and then Partikai 2 emerges. Partikai 1 and Partikai 2 are bearer of what are called the eternal and the original encryptions. The original encryptions are a signature of radiation stored, or stored electrical potential, in the form of what is called a geleasic state. These have to do with what are called the etaors, or the ethers, that are a state of consciousness, a state between consciousness and manifest substance. So we say partikai are the first units of creation. They are units of the consciousness of God's source, and they are part of what are called the etaors. And there's a whole <laughs> bunch of texts in scribbled form that are about those. So once we have the etaors that create um, Partikai 1. Within that Partikai, it is imbued with the signature or the natural encryption of the Eta Ors that is carried within the consciousness beam of Source itself. Let's say Source decided to think about something and focused its mind in a small area, just a bit of concentration in one area. That beam of consciousness focused in a small area like a laser beam imprinted the energy that is still part of Source with the very specific encryption or the energy that is carried on the consciousness of source itself. This is where we've got the base 
12 CRIST code encryption has come from this. It has come, and it, the first encryption has to do with what is in the Cathara grid configuration, the precise mathematics of the Cathara grid configuration, 12 points of energy. And those 12 points of energy are 12 points of eta or, and they divide into something called ERs and RUs. ER units and RU units. I believe they're I think the ER, I have this all written down somewhere and it wasn't what I was planning on going into tonight, but I'll just do it briefly. ERs, I believe, have a stored electrical potential quantum of 15 and RUs are ERs reversed, which changes their delisic state, so they also have the stored electrical potential of 15 and I believe you end up with a stored electrical potential in one part of chi of being 360 because of a set of 12 ERs and a set of 12 RU. I believe that's how it works. And from there, the quantum mathematics of the of particle and of creation mechanics begins to occur. This is where the when when we go through the processes by which those first two particle enter the starborn cycle of expansion and quantum replication to create the manifest light body of the cosmos. It all starts with the mathematics that are held within that original encryption and the eternal encryption. So I won't go into which is eternal and which is original because it has to do with the process or the birth of the particle and one is the replica of source, it's exactly like source, the image of, and the other in the process of birth flips, so it becomes the reflection of, and then you, so it gets complicated with encryption. But if you can understand encryption as being a set of little gelesic units, gelesic etwer units that are stored electrical potential of specific quantum, and they come from the first particle that set eternal life creation in motion, and everything will carry the core encryption from which eternal life manifestation emerged, but it picks up different encryption as you get into the manifest worlds. Every individuation requires a different combination of encryptions that are built around the Chris code encryption of first creation. Now, there are beings that lose their Chris code encryption. Where they started with it, everything in creation started as a child of the Chris. It started with the Chris code encryption. But in falls, like black hole falls, or the metatronic code mutation, that encryption is twisted and distorted and loses part of its quantum, and the natural geometrical relationships between the units in the encryption changes, and it changes everything as far as the way the light body structure and therefore the manifest structures that form within it are, are, are created. So we are working with the original first creation encryption. We're the only ones on the planet that are actually teaching it and teaching that there's a difference between encryptions. You have Metatron teaching you how to spin your Merkaba in the wrong direction, but um, they're not telling you where all of this started. They will tell you about the seed of life, but they won't tell you that it's the seed of artificial life and it's built on the Metatronic encryption. We are dealing with Chris code encryption and that starts with Partikai 1 and Partikai 2, which bear the original encryption of source consciousness in the form of little gelesic units called ERs and RUs that together form the quantum of the first particle, the stored electrical potential of the first particle. The second particle also has a set of them, it carries an encryption. It is the interaction not only between the particle units themselves, but between these gelesic radiation points within them that the process of sparking is enabled where when you have particle one, let's just ignore these three for a minute and imagine this is particle one, that's creation point. Particle one is born, then particle two comes through and births out through the center of it, and it actually splits Partikai 1 on these axes here, splits it at 45 degrees. Actually, they start at 45, it's not, it's, I don't think it's at 45, yeah, it is at 45 here, at 45 degrees, because these move in and out from 45 to 30 to zero. But it starts from creation point, Partikai 2 takes the place, holds the place, the position at creation point that Partikai 1 originally had, you have the two pieces of Partikai 1 that break down into two 180 quantums, right? So you had a 360 quantum that was Partikai 1, it got split by another 360 quantum coming through it, and it split into two 180 quantums, one with a positive electrical charge and one with a negative electrical charge, one carrying predominantly ERs, one carrying predominantly RUs. Now all of these has, have names and things. The first split are the what are called the HA and the LA the, I believe it's the part of K, ha, with a positive charge, and the la, with a negative charge. When 
these, the ha-la of Partikai I split. They come down, but they're still linked. Their, their uh, core encryption and cathar grid that's inside that holds that encryption is still linked to the creation point, even though Partikai II is at creation point. So they link in through Partikai II, and that means they are drawn back together, and they phase on what is called the zero point line, right, which is the vertical line coming down from creation point. When they phase, the ers and rus within them, those geodesic points, spark. They release some of their, release and replicate some of their stored electrical potential. They create a, a spark that is the first spark that is called the hala spark, H-A-L-A spark. That hala spark is a backflow spark. The backflow spark goes back up. It come, these come down here. It sparks here on the spark line. And you have the hala spark and the remerging of Partikai one. The hollow spark enables Partikai 1 to ride up through the zero point axis because it opens what's called a breathing tube up in through Partikai 2. They go back into source. Partikai 1, the hollow spark go back into source. And then, because backflow is given to source, it opens the creation point again, and the hollow spark comes back as the ala spark, where you have the HAs reverse to. A H and the L A is uh, L. Wait a L A is A L. It ends up as hala hala a. A refers to the void space that is actually created around the Partikai space from when Partikai one split and Partikai two came in. It creates what is called the A A A H void. So this is where we get names and encryptions, the vibrational signatures like ala and hala and later the kara ya sata where you get Christ and all of those words so all of the words in our religions had to do with translations into auditory outer auditory terms of the original encryptions the names originally did have meanings and they still do so when partikai one splits phases creates the hala spark backflow and then comes back out with the the ala backflow return spark Partikai 2 splits when that happens, which means Partikai 2 splits, but it splits up because the backflow return spark is coming out this way and it causes Partikai 2 to split up instead of down. Partikai 1 again takes the place it originally had, and originally the first backflow spark, the ala spark, would go here. Now the same type of process happens with the Partikai 2 where it up phases, it sparks, and it creates, I believe it's the bada backflow comes back in and it uh, releases a backflow spark. What you're seeing in this Taran unit are the backflow return sparks that are created from the process of sparking of the Partikai. So we had Partikai 1 originally, it was the atomic down phase one of Partikai 1, created the ala backflow return spark. And meanwhile, the Partikai 2 had split into the ba and the da. They create the bada backflow spark creates the abada, I believe it's called, backflow return spark. Then that coming out, the backflow return spark coming out, causes Partikai 1 to split again. And again it splits and it tries to make another spark. However, there's already the ala spark in the way on the, on the vertical axis. So it does indeed make another spark, which um, makes another spark, travels back in, but when its backflow spark comes out, it can't come down vertically because there's one in the way. So the process of the third, which is an atmic from Partikai 1, spark occurring, creates this movement where what was on the vertical axis, the ala, shifts over this way, and the one, the next backflow that was coming out, actually reverses spin and shifts that way. And that creates this interaction between these three, Okay, you have the first backflow return spark, the second at uh, etheric backflow return spark from Partikai 2, and the third backflow return spark from Partikai 1. Both of these are atomic, one with a positive charge, one with a negative charge, and they create a magnetic connection, an electromagnetic connection between them into the center. Then there is a process that is about 25 steps long, they said, <laughs> about what happens then, because again, they phase with each other, but there's, I don't even have the charts for that, by the way. But those three, which are considered Partikai backflow return sparks, so these are three Partikai units, right, that were created through the phasing of Partikai 1 and Partikai 2 of the triad. 
They phase together and they pull into the center and then rebirth out with a central unit that is called the part of key. Okay, the part of key can be looked at as the fourth backflow return spark. The part of key is a photogenerator cell and it has within it what are called layers or uh, gelesic layers. Within these gelesic layers, which are different states of gelesic matter, the gelesics refer to that place between um, consciousness and substance. They're the etur gelesics. And inside of the partiki, you have layers of gelesic radiation. And it is through these layers of gelesic radiation and their interaction with the other three partiki that you have the first process of spark generation occurring, of spark cluster generation occurring. And it is those spark clusters being generated that form kilons, fire letters, and then harmonic keys. And then those keys go on to build and form tachyons. So that's the process we're going to look at now because this is the key generation cycle which is a tachyon cycle. When we get to understanding the starborn cycle as far as how the layers from Partikai 1, how the layers of um, the light body build up from the first creation point all the way through the four domains into the outer domains, it, it starts with this process and it starts with, um, wait a minute, do what? Excuse me a minute, I got, I got company. Incoming, what? Go to the next graph and then stop. They want to do something. All right, there's an activation coming in. They want to do one. All right, they're going to do one of these early. Okay, what are we doing early? Okay, they said go to the next one for a minute. Okay. They said, all right, talk that one through and be prepared to put up what? The return to the Unisci one on. Okay, all right. At the back of the pile, dear. <laughs> yeah. This happens sometimes because they're watching the grids, and if there's the best time for an activation to work, they will run it then and you know, do things like, excuse me, knock me on the brain and say, <laughs> we interrupt this program to bring you a broadcast, <laughs> right? All right, return to the Unisci is, starts with, um, wait a minute, activation of Rashallah core. The windsong circuit, okay. This is, it's labeled code one. It is the, um, the Rashala core flame. Okay. The colored one, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I forget which color one that is. One of the, I think it's the rainbow flame. It is. Yeah, that one. Okay, so they're gonna put that on in a minute. I will talk through this one in a minute. <laughs> we're going to <laughs> jump backward and then come back again to where we were. All right. Anyway, this is still the Taran living light seed unit, and we still have the three partikai and the partiki in the center. These bands represent the gelesic states inside of the partiki. I'm not going to go through all of this, but the first, the the nine inner gelesic states that are inside of the partiki, they all have names. You have one which is called the nada or, or the diamond door. You have two, which is called the Adama, or the Adama flame. You have three, and this is working out from the center. You can't even see one, two, and three in there because it's so tiny. Now you have three, this is called the Jaffa. I do believe this is where you get the Fa ratio and things like that. <laughs> that is not supposed to be the Fa ratio, it's the Fa Jaffa ratio. But they haven't even gotten into that, they've just hinted at it. So you have one, two, and three gelesic layers. Um, four is called the Tau. I believe it's pronounced uh, Dao here, but they do say Tao, T-A-O. All right, which is one, two, three, four, I believe is right there. You have the Ida, which is five. You have the Jada, which is six. These are the encryption signatures when you translate them into sound of these gelesic states. Notice somewhere out there, by the time we get into middle manifestation, you have idas and jadas, like jadans of idans, that has to do with the, the gelesic core matter states of those spaces. So you have five, um, the ida. You have six, the jada. You have seven, the ta'ur. The ta'ur, and this is where we get the ta in ta'kians. It has to do with what forms in that layer within the core of the partiki. Okay, we have the maja, which is eight, and we have the ka or the ina 
Ka. And this is where the twist on the, the keys of Enak, it's the Ina Ka is this particular layer, the ninth layer out here, Jalizic state. Those, these are considered the inner nine layers of the part of key, and they are called the Iyuka, or the yolk of the egg of life. There are other layers, there are six outer photogelesic layers of the part of key that are the Ra, Sha, the La, the Ka with an H, the Tha, and the Ra without an H. All right, these particular outer layers are the outer layers of the egg of life. So this is the core, this is, this is the Taran seed, uh, light seed, but every little chalet unit also carries these same properties, but in a, a microcosmic version. First creation was set in motion through this, the entire cosmic light body structure and all the things manifest within it have at their core the first Taran living light seed. And inside of that Tarn Living Light Seed, you have the nine inner and the six outer Jalizic, um not quite matter, states. <laughs> they're, they're, these are called proto Jalizic layers. And when you get out here, they're called photo Jalizic, which has to do with light or the beginning of what we would consider light or electromagnetic spectrum. So, we, um, are we ready yet? Almost, <laughs> go to the next one. He said, okay. He said, one or two more, and we're going to do it. They just wanted us to be ready, because it's coming. Okay. Now, this is just to show you the part of key up close, and those layers where you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine inner layers in the part of key. Then you have 10, 11, 12, and you can't even see 13, 14, and 15 that go out that way. Now, this is just showing you that there is a specific size expansion. There is a specific mathematical formula of um, the size of expansion from one to another. There's a rotation that occurs, and this is the same thing that happens when we get into the starborn cycle, where it is all built on the Cathara grid, the precise mathematics that are held within the Cathara grid template. And there is a shift of, this would be considered the zero point axis, then first shift axis one takes it from a Cathara grid this size to one this size. Then axis two takes it to one this size. Axis three, to one, where are we? Axis three to one, this size, I think. Yeah, wait a minute. I'm losing track of myself on this one because I can't see where I put my three. I think that's here. Then axis four is actually this one. Axis five is this one. And the expansion rates, the circles that define the geleasic states within the part of key, the nine inner geleasic states, are if you drew a circle around the size of that particular cathara grid. So these are precise mathematics and they're all implied by the first mathematics that are held within the first eternal and original encryption that is held within the first particle from source. All right, so that is still, you're just looking at the part of key. And remember that's part of that larger Taran unit, all right, the Taran living light seed. Next one, please. Hmm? <laughs> okay, go. It's a go. All right, this is just looking at it. So you can see, if you're just looking at that part of key unit, the inside of it is if you cut it in half and you're looking at it, because actually there's spheres. There's spheres of energy. So if you cut the sphere in half and looked at it like as if you were cutting an orange in half, you can see what is inside. This is the structure and the depth of each layer compared to each other. And the depth of each layer compared to each other has to do with the diameter of the sphere of energy or circle around it, which has to do with the particular size of the cathara grid encryption that emerged with in it through the spinning cycle that we saw before. Now, this is just to show you again, we have the ta, the ma, the ka. These are part of the inner layers. These become important. I'm not going to read all this again because, um, well, actually, I will read these just to remind you of what Jalezic states are like. This, I just do this once. Let me see the, uh, this up a little bit, honey, please. Okay. Now, this is a summary of the inner nine of the 15 crystalline geleasic radiation states. So they're considered geleasic radiation all right, layers within the part of key unit. Okay. The outer yolk, now they're still being, dealing with the yolk, which are the nine layers, okay, because the other ones are part of the outside of the egg of life. But the, you have nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Nine is the ka out here. Ka refers to specifically Thermo, a thermogelesic field of hot glowing ketha vapor gas gel. 
Ketha equals atomic plus etheric ether vapor. This has to do with a whole big long dissertation we got on the birth of the first particle and where you get these different types of ether states from the from source consciousness into the beginning of um, creating of the substance that later becomes matter. All right. So we have ka is thermogelesic, uh, glowing glowing hot ketha vapor. The ma layer is magnogelesic field, a magnogelesic field of warm, moist, liquid, silica-like vapor gas gel. It's called the maja or the ma. It's considered the outer mantle. Sometimes it's just called the ma or the magma in the blood. It's related to the magma in the blood when you get into manifestation levels. These have to do with keys. When we talk, about, we've talked before about um, blood keys. They're the key, you know, the crystal keys in the blood, blood crystals. This this has to do with what takes place in the ma layers in the first part of key, but also within the living light units of which your body is made. All right. So the ta layer seven, and that's where ta kians get their names, is. A hydrogelesic field of warm, dry liquid vapor gas gel. The Ta'ur, the outer core, Tower of God, these are other names that have, it's been used for. Yeah, they have been used for it. We get into the middle yoke, that was the outer yoke, right? The outer of the inner, in other words. <laughs> now we have the middle of the inner, the bitter, middle yoke. Um, this layer, oh, by the way, the outer layer is called the Ketha layer of the Pardaki. Then coming inward, you have the Etha layer of the particle has layer six, the jada, which is called ecto, it's an ecto field of cool, dry, semi-liquid vapor gas gel. The jada, middle surface, the garden, or jadin. Okay, you have five, which is called the ida. It's called K-R-Y-S-T-O, christo field of cool, semi-solid silica gas gel. The ida, middle mantle, Ida'un, Eden. These are words that are affiliated with that state. All right. Four, you have the Tao, or the, the Tao. It's called, it's not pronounced Tao, it's actually Tao in uh, Guardian speak. It's a cryogelesic field of cold, frozen, solid silica, ice crystal gas gel. The Taor, the middle core, the Tor, the Tor within the tower. Right? Then you have the inner yoke, part of key the atma, all right? There you have the jaffa, which is called neurogelesic field of cold liquid vapor gas gel. The jaffa, the inner surface, the guff hollow body. This is where a lot of action takes place within the particle when it comes to spark generation and when it comes to um, replicating quantum and generating quantum. And I do believe somewhere we're gonna be given information on the Fa ratio, which is the Jaffa ratio that has to do with how many sparks do what at what quantums to create what. We already have some of that, but we don't have it right down to specific quantums yet because we didn't have time to analyze the data from the first part of key with its 360 quantum in Urs and Rus. Because <laughs> there's all sorts of trade-offs that, that happen where things, where sparks are made in one place, they have a certain quantum, they interact with another state of the geleasics, they lose part of their quantum, part of it goes this way, part of it goes that way, they pick up this. I mean, there's heavy math in this stuff, and I really, I'm not a math person. So just so you know that it takes place there, someday we will have the real Fa ratio, not the Phi ratio. And it is very important to all physics, actually both manifest and before you get to manifest. The Jaffa is that layer in here, that little layer in there. And again, you could actually think of your, uh, your atoms when you look at this as well. That's how they're supposed to be structured. And the same exact thing as the particle of living light cell. Um, the, the Jaffa is a neurogelesic field, cold liquid vapor gas gel. It is, uh, we have the two, the Adama, which is proto geleasic field of cold burning, glowing, dry eta or vapor gas gel. It's considered the inner mantle, the flame of Adama, the Adamic flame of life, the eternal flame. Adama, son of Jada, or Adam, son of God. All right, all of these translations have, are connected to that particular encryption and that word. So when we have the stories, the creation stories that we've been given and that have been twisted here, they all come back to once upon a time, all this was common knowledge. There were, you know, we, we all knew these physics and we were fully conscious and aware. And some of the pieces of the stories were still left and they became what were originally the, the, the 12 natural 
um, legions of the 12 tribes that later got mutated into the 12 distor or the, the, the distorted re-legions or religions on the planet that took parts of those teachings and abused them for control dogmas. So it all comes back to the particle, believe it or not, it comes back to physics. Source comes back to physics and physics comes back to source because in truth they are not separable. They are, they are aspects of the same identity that is God, that is God's source. Then we have the nada or, which is called carbo with a K, carbogeolysic field of compressed, cold, frozen, dense, solid, eta or vapor. Compressed carbon crystal, diamond, nada or, the inner core, door of Adama, the diamond door, the atomic door. So these are all of the states that actually occur within the first part of key and also are replicated within every small Shalaya light unit that is built on the same structure of the Taran with the three Partiki unit, Partikai units and the one Partiki photogenerator at the center. That is the difference between living light cells and dead light cells that do not have the Triveca construction, that have only a Biveca construction or a Vesica Pisces, where there are only two light spheres that rub against each other until eventually they will burn out whatever quantum is at their core unless they can feed energy off other things and that takes us into metatronic science. Next one please. Mm. <laughs> Maybe. Yep. All right, I'll do that one. <laughs> yeah, we're going to do it right after this one. Okay, so the next graph is that. This is just, you know, looking at the same thing. The egg of eternal life, particle photogenerator of the tar and living light seed. The Ekasha God seed is another way of describing that. And remember, the tar and living light seed is down here, and the particle is that central sphere. And that is the central sphere there in large to show it when it had, that has its expansion cycle to show its proportions of expansion on the cathargrids. And that takes those away just to show you where the geolysic states are. I'm not going to read all of this right now. This I already read to you. It just gives you an idea of when we talk about all the things that manifest from here. Here is where the first things that later become all sorts of things. You've seen the word neuro, you've seen the word proto, you've seen the word ecto. All of these words that have to do with these eter states, their first geolysic states, later become things like um, neurons, protons, neutrons. All of these words are connected to those units, but there's a lot of process that happens between this first space of the Taran and the starborn cycle through which eventually the rosettas are born, and it's through the rosettas that those smaller spark currents are perpetually generated and circulated, and that is where we get our elements and our elemental command stations. So, okay, we're gonna go? Yes, okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> put that one up. Alrighty, we're gonna take a, a short detour to the end of our workshop. <laughs> We'll be back, though, <laughs> to the beginning. Now, I apologize for the rough color. All I had to work with was colored pencils in very short time. <laughs> right? I usually can do pretty good with colored pencils, but I just had to just whip the colors in as quick as I could, so we had time to do it. Plus, they're grayer because the little um, portable photocopier thing that we have that we take with us everywhere, um, it grays out the colors a bit. But it's enough to hold the frequencies. Hmm? Yeah, we were afraid they'd be invisible, you know, or you wouldn't see it because the thing doesn't print very, you know, very well. And we didn't have time for a Kinko's run, so, but it'll hold the frequencies enough. Now, this is called the encryption, it's called encryption code one. It is the core flame Rashala wind song encryption. Now, as we get through the starborn cycle, when we go back to our workshop, <laughs> you'll find out that the wind song refers to these specific currents. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, and fifteen. There are fifteen, well, you could say you could say petals or leaves in this configuration. But what this is is actually a set of um, it, it is a circuit of energy circulation, and you'll see where that comes from later. So I just want you to know that this particular encryption is the encryption of the core flame, Rashala. It's also nicknamed the rainbow flame because there's another one that is the outer flame 
the, or not the outer, but the inner flame. This is the core flame. Then there is something called the inner flame. These are all part of the structures that build up to form the rosettas, all right, the, the, the elemental cells. Now let's see what we're going to do with this. Um, on this one, I just want to see something. Okay. The inner side. Okay, they just want us to do an activation of this flame in the wind song circuit. Okay, alrighty, that's why we've got the wind song circuitry is opening in uh, the Earth uh, uh, Umshadi seed atom. That's what we're, they're going to have us catch. That's why they're having us do optical pineal on this now. These are not too hard, these three that go together. I don't know if they're going to have us do both of them now or if they're going to stop me again somewhere through and do the next one when it activates in the Earth shield. But we're just going to activate the wind song encryption and the inner core flame of Rashala. Now, later we'll be doing what's called the flame of Rashala, which is the inner flame. You have core flame, then you have the next one out, which would be the inner flame that goes with the inner domains. So this is the core one, also, aka the rainbow flame that carries the wind song. So what do you want us to do? And, okay. Okay, that seems easy enough. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to sit down for a minute and uh, let my Azara space come through for this one. This is a short one. If you would, focus your attention, please, on the center point right here. Just for a moment, focus your attention there. And then move your eyes upward the tip, slowly scanning the image, and then downward to the bottom, and then pull back a bit in focus, We you just see the whole flame sitting there for a moment, and then bring your attention in to what looks like this double heart configuration. This is the core sacred heart encryption that becomes something else later, but you have the two hearts, you have the atomic heart or the physical heart later, and to have the etheric heart, or the spiritual heart. I'm going to focus again on that point there, the center point. And now, if you will, try to imagine that this image part you are not seeing now, it is going away, and this is getting bigger, bigger in your mind's eye as you look at it, and you are seeing the sacred heart encryption. And now do the eye cross to get one current coming with your third eye current and focus on that point and try to see what this image does when you do that, when you look at it with cross eyes. Try to see from, from I will try to get out of your way if I'm in your way. Just for a moment and then inhale into the pineal.